The Man Who Cast No Shadow 1. But no, my friend. Jules de Grandin shook his sleek blonde head decidedly and grinned across the breakfast table at me. We will go to this so kind Madame Norman's tea of a certainty, yes. But hang it all, I replied, giving Mrs. Norman's note an irritable shove with my coffee spoon. I don't want to go to a confounded tea party. I'm too old and too sensible to dress up in a tall hat and a long coat and listen to the vaporings of a flock of silly flappers. I— Mon Dieu, hear the savage! De Grandin chuckled delightedly. Always does he find excuses for not giving pleasure to others, and always does he frame those excuses to make him more important in his own eyes. Enough of this, friend Trowbridge. Let us go to the kind Madame Norman's party. Always there is something of interest to be seen if one but knows where to look for it. Hmm, maybe, I replied grudgingly. But you've better sight than I think you have if you can find anything worth seeing at an afternoon reception. The reception was in full blast when we arrived at the Norman Mansion in Tuscarora Avenue that afternoon in the 1920s. The air was heavy with the commingled odors of half a hundred different perfumes and the scent of hot poured jasmine tea, while the clatter of cup on saucer, laughter and buzzing conversation filled the wide hall and dining room. In the long double parlors the rugs had been rolled back, and young men in frock-coats glided over the polished parquetry in company with girls in provocatively short skirts, to the belching melody of a saxophone and the drumming rhythm of a piano. Pardieu, de Grandin murmured as he viewed the dancers a moment. "'Your American youth take their pleasures with seriousness, friend Trowbridge. Behold their faces! Never a smile, never a laugh!' They might be recruits on their first parade for all the joy they show. Ah! He broke off abruptly, gazing with startled, almost horrified eyes, after a couple whirling in the mazes of a foxtrot at the farther end of the room. Nom d'un fromage, he murmured softly to himself. This matter will bear investigating, I think. Eh, what's that? I asked, piloting him toward our hostess. Nothing, nothing, I do assure you he answered, as we greeted Mrs. Norman and passed toward the dining-room. But I noticed his round blue eyes strayed more than once toward the parlors, as we drank our tea and exchanged amiable nothings with a pair of elderly ladies. Pardon. De Grandin bowed stiffly from the hips to his conversational partner, and turned toward the rear drawing-room. There is a gentleman here I desire to meet, if you do not mind. That tall, distinguished one with the young girl in pink. Oh, I guess you mean Count Cherney. A young man laden with an ice in one hand and a glass of non-volsted punch in the other paused on his way from the dining room. He's a rare bird, all right. I knew him back in thirteen when the Balkan allies were polishing off the Turks. Queer-looking duck, ain't he? First-class fighting man, though. Why, I saw him lead a bayonet charge right into the Turkish lines one day, and when he'd shot his pistol empty, he went at the enemy with his teeth. Yes, sir, he grabbed a Turk with both hands and bit his throat out. Hanged if he didn't. Cherny, de Grandin repeated musingly. He is a Pole, perhaps. His informant laughed a bit shamefacedly. Can't say, he confessed. The Serbs weren't asking embarrassing questions about our volunteers' nationalities those days, and it wasn't considered healthful for any of us to do so either. I got the impression he was a Hungarian refugee from Austrian vengeance, but that's only hearsay. Come along, I'll introduce you, if you wish. I saw de Grandin clasp hands with the foreigner and stand talking with him for a time, and in spite of myself I could not forbear a smile at the contrast they made. The Frenchman was a bear five feet four inches in height, slender as a girl, and like a girl possessed of almost laughably small hands and feet. His light hair and fair skin, coupled with his trimly waxed diminutive blonde mustache and round, unwinking blue eyes, gave him a curiously misleading appearance of mildness. His companion was at least six feet tall. "'swarthy-skinned and black-haired, with bristling black moustaches "'and fierce slate-gray eyes set beneath beetling black brows. 
His large nose was like the predatory beak of some bird of prey, and the tilt of his long pointed jaw bore out the uncompromising ferocity of the rest of his visage. Across his left cheek, extending upward over the temple and into his hair, was a knife or saber scar, a streak of white showing the trail of the steel in his scalp and shining like silver inlaid in onyx against the blue-black of his smoothly pomaded locks. What they said was, of course, beyond reach of my ears, but I saw de Grandin's quick, impish smile flicker across his keen face more than once, to be answered by a slow, languorous smile on the other's dark countenance. At length the Count bowed formally to my friend and whirled away with a wisp of a girl, while de Grandin returned to me. At the door he paused a moment, inclining his shoulders in a salute as a couple of debutantes brushed past him. Something, I know not what, drew my attention to the tall foreigner a moment, and a sudden chill rippled up my spine at what I saw. Above the Georgette-clad shoulder of his dancing partner, the Count's slate-gray eyes were fixed on de Grandin's trim back, and in them I read all the cold, malevolent fury— with which a caged tiger regards its keeper as he passes the bars. "'What on earth did you say to that fellow?' I asked, as the little Frenchman rejoined me. "'He looked as if he would like to murder you.' "'Ha!' <laughs> he gave a questioning single-syllabled laugh. "'Did he so? Obey the noble Washington's injunction, and avoid foreign entanglements, friend Trowbridge. It is better so, I think. But look here!' I began, nettled by his manner. What? No, no, he interrupted. You must be advised by me, my friend. I think it would be better if we dismissed the incident from our minds. But stay. Perhaps you had better meet that gentleman after all. I will have the good Madame Norman introduce you. More puzzled than ever, I followed him to our hostess and waited while he requested her to present me to the Count. In a lull in the dancing, she complied with his request, and the foreigner acknowledged the introduction with a brief hand-clasp and an almost churlish nod, then turned his back on me, continuing an animated conversation with the large-eyed young woman in an abbreviated party frock. "'And did you shake his hand?' de Grandin asked, as we descended the Norman's steps to my waiting car. "'Yes, of course,' I replied. "'Huh?' "'Tell me, my friend, did you notice anything uh, peculiar in his grip?' "'Hm.' I wrinkled my brow a moment in concentrated thought. "'Yes, I believe I did. So what was it?' "'Hanged if I can say exactly,' I admitted. "'But, well, it seemed—' uh, "'This sounds absurd, I know. "'But it seems as though his hand had two backs, no palm at all, if that means anything to you. It means much, my friend. It means a very great deal. He answered with such a solemn nod that I burst into a fit of laughter. Believe me, it means much more than you suspect. It must have been some two weeks later that I chanced to remark to de Grandin, I saw your friend, Count Cherny, in New York yesterday. Indeed? he answered, with what seemed like more than necessary interest. And how did he impress you at the time? Oh, I just happened to pass him on Fifth Avenue, I replied. I'd been up to see an acquaintance in Fifty-Ninth Street, and was turning into the avenue when I saw him driving away from the plaza. He was with some ladies. No doubt, de Grandin responded dryly. Did you notice him particularly? Can't say that I did especially, I answered. "'But it seems to me he looked older than the day we met him at Mrs. Norman's.' "'Yes?' The Frenchman leaned forward eagerly. "'Older, do you say? "'Parbleu, this is of interest. I suspected as much.' "'Why?' I began, but he turned away with an impatient shrug. "'Bah!' he exclaimed petulantly. "'French Robridge, I fear Jules de Grandin is a fool. "'He entertains all sorts of strange notions.' I had known the little Frenchman long enough to realize that he was as full of moods as a prima donna, but his erratic, unrelated remarks were getting on my nerves. "'See here, de Grandin,' I began testily. "'What's all this nonsense?' 
The sudden shrill clatter of my office telephone bell cut me short. Dr. Trowbridge, an agitated voice asked over the wire. Can you come right over, please? This is Mrs. Norman speaking. Yes, of course, I answered, reaching for my medicine case. What is it? Who's ill? It's, uh, it's Guy Eckhart. He's been taken with a fainting fit, and we don't seem to be able to rouse him. Very well, I promised. Dr. de Grandin and I will be right over. Come on, de Grandin, I called as I shoved my hat down over my ears and shrugged into my overcoat. One of Mrs. Norman's house guests has been taken ill. I told her we were coming. Mais oui, he agreed, hurrying into his outdoors clothes. Is it a man or a woman, this sick one? It's a man, I replied. Guy Eckhart. A man, he echoed incredulously. A man, do you say? No, no, my friend, that is not likely. Likely or not, I rejoined sharply. Mrs. Norman says he's been seized with a fainting fit, and I give the lady credit for knowing what she's talking about. Eh bien. He drummed nervously on the cushions of the automobile seat. Perhaps Jules de Grandin really is a fool. After all, it is not impossible. It certainly isn't, I agreed fervently to myself as I set the car in motion. Young Eckhart had recovered consciousness when we arrived, but looked like a man just emerging from a lingering fever. Attempts to get a statement from him met with no response, for he replied slowly, almost incoherently, and seemed to have no idea concerning the cause of his illness. Mrs. Norman was a little more specific. My son Ferdinand found him lying on the floor of his bath with the shower going and the window wide open, just before dinner, she explained. He was totally unconscious, and remained so till just a few minutes ago. Ah, is it so? de Grandin murmured half heedlessly as he made a rapid inspection of the patient. Friend Trowbridge, he called me to the window. What do you make of these objective symptoms? A soft, frequent pulse, a fluttering heart, suffused eyes, a hot, dry skin, and a flushed, hectic face. Sounds like an arterial hemorrhage, I answered promptly. But there's been no trace of blood on the boy's floor, nor any evidence of a stain on his clothing. Sure you've checked the signs over? Absolutely, he replied with a vigorous double nod. Then to the young man, Now, mon enfant, we shall inspect you, if you please. Quickly he examined the boy's face, scalp, throat, wrists, and calves, finding no evidence of even a pinprick, let alone a wound capable of causing syncope. Mon Dieu, this is strange, he muttered. Of a surety it has the queerness of the devil. Perhaps the bleeding is internal, but— Ah! Regardez-vous, friend Trowbridge. He had turned down the collar of the youngster's pajama jacket, more in idle routine than in hope of discovering anything tangible, but the livid spot to which he pointed seemed the key to our mystery's outer door. Against the smooth white flesh of the young man's left breast there showed a red, angry patch, such as might have resulted from a vacuum cup being held some time against the skin, and in the centre of the discoloration was a double row of tiny punctures, scarcely larger than needle pricks, arranged in horizontal divergent arcs, like a pair of parentheses laid sidewise. You see? he asked simply, as though the queer blood-infused spot explained everything. But he couldn't have bled much through that, I protested. Why, the man seems almost drained dry, and these wounds wouldn't have yielded more than a cubic centimeter of blood, at most. He nodded gravely. Blood is not entirely colloidal, my friend, he responded. It will penetrate the tissues to some extent, especially if sufficient force is applied. But it would have required a powerful suction, I replied, when his rejoinder cut me short. <laughs> you have said it, my friend. Suction, that is the word. But what could have sucked a man's blood like this? I was in a near stupor of mystification. What indeed, he replied gravely. That is for us to find out. Meantime we are here as physicians. A quarter-grain morphine injection is indicated here, I think. You will administer the dose. I have no license in America.
When I returned from my round of afternoon calls next day, I found de Grandin seated on my front steps in close conference with Indian John. Indian John was a town character of doubtful lineage who performed odd jobs of snow-shoveling, furnace-tending, and grass-cutting, according to season, and interspersed his manual labors with brief incursions into the mercantile field when he peddled fresh vegetables from door to door. He also peddled neighborhood gossip and retailed local lore to all who would listen, his claim to being a hundred years old giving him the standing of an indisputable authority in all matters antedating living memory. Pardieu, you have told me much, mon vieux, de Grandin declared as I came up the porch steps. He handed the old rascal a handful of silver and rose to accompany me into the house. Friend Trowbridge, he accused as we finished dinner that night, you had not told me that this town grew up on the site of an early Swedish settlement. Never knew you wanted to know, I defended with a grin. You know the ancient Swedish church, perhaps, he persisted. Yes, that's old Christ Church, I answered. It's down in the east end of town. Don't suppose it has a hundred communicants today. Our population has made some big changes, both in complexion and creed, since the days when the Dutch and Swedes fought for possession of New Jersey. You will drive me to that church, right away, at once, immediately? he demanded eagerly. I guess so, I agreed. What's the matter now? Indian John been telling you a lot of fairy tales? Perhaps, he replied, regarding me with one of his steady, unwinking stares. Not all fairy tales are pleasant, you know. Do you recall those of Chaperon Rouge, uh, how do you say it, Red Riding Hood, and Bluebeard? Ha! <laughs> I scoffed. They're both as true as any of John's stories, I'll bet. Undoubtlessly, he agreed with a quick nod. The story of Bluebeard, for instance, is unfortunately a very true tale indeed. But come, let us hasten. I would see that church to-night, if I may. Christ Church, the old Swedish place of worship, was a combined demonstration of how firmly adz-hewn pine and walnut can resist the ravages of time, and how nearly three hundred years of weather can demolish any structure erected by man. Its rough painted walls and short, firm-based spire shone ghostly and pallid in the early spring moonlight and the cluster of broken and weather-worn tombstones which staggered up from its unkempt burying-ground were like soiled white chicks seeking shelter from a soiled white hen. Dismounting from a car at the wicket gate of the churchyard, we made our way over the level graves, I in a maze of wonderment, de Grandin with an eagerness almost childish. Occasionally he flashed the beam from his electric torch on some monument of an early settler bent to decipher the worn inscription, then turned away with a sigh of disappointment. I paused to light a cigar, but dropped my half-burned match in astonishment as my companion gave vent to a cry of excited pleasure. Triomphe! he exclaimed delightedly. Come and behold, friend Trowbridge. Thus far your lying friend, the Indian man, has told the truth. Regarde! He was standing beside an old, weather-gnawed tombstone, once marble, perhaps, but appearing more like brown sandstone under the ray of his flashlight. Across its upper end was deeply cut the one word, Sarah, while below the name appeared a verse of half-obliterated doggerel. Let none disturb her deathless sleep, abote ye tomb wild garlic keep. For if she wake, much woe will boast. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Did you bring me out here to study the orthographical eccentricities of the early settlers? I demanded in disgust. Ah, bah! he returned. Let us consult the ecclesiastic. He perhaps will ask no fool's questions. No, you'll do that. I answered tartly as we knocked at the rectory door. Pardon, monsieur, de Grandin apologized, as the white-haired old minister appeared in answer to our summons. We do not wish to disturb you thus, but there is a matter of great import on which we would consult you. I would that you tell us what you can, if anything, 
concerning a certain grave in your churchyard, a grave marked Sarah, if you please. Why, the elderly cleric was plainly taken aback, I don't think there is anything I can tell you about it, sir. There is some mention in the early parish records, I believe, of a woman believed to have been a murderess being buried in that grave, but it seems the poor creature was more sinned against than sinning. Several children in the neighborhood died mysteriously, some epidemic the ignorant physicians failed to understand, no doubt, and Sarah, or whatever the poor woman's surname may have been, was accused of killing them by witchcraft. At any rate, one of the bereft mothers took vengeance into her own hands and strangled poor Sarah with a noose of well-rope. The witchcraft belief must have been quite prevalent, too, for there is some nonsense verse on the tombstone concerning her deathless sleep and an allusion to her waking from it. Also some mention of wild garlic being planted about her. He laughed somewhat ruefully. I wish they hadn't said that, he added. For, do you know, there are garlic shoots growing about that grave to this very day. Old Christian, our sexton, declares that he can't get rid of it, no matter how much he grubs it up. It spreads to the surrounding lawn, too, he added sadly. Cordieu, de Grandin gasped. This is of the importance, sir. The old man smiled gently at the little Frenchman's impetuosity. It's an odd thing, he commented. There was another gentleman asking about that same tomb a few weeks ago. A, uh, pardon the expression, a foreigner. So, de Grandin's little waxed mustache twitched like the whiskers of a nervous tomcat. A foreigner, do you say? A tall, raw-boned, fleshless, living skeleton of a man with a scar on his face and a white streak in his hair? I wouldn't be quite so severe in my description the other answered with a smile. He certainly was a thin gentleman, and I believe he had a scar on his face, too, though I can't be certain of that. He was so very wrinkled. No, his hair was entirely white. There was no white streak in it, sir. In fact, I should have said he was very advanced in age, judging from his hair and face and the manner in which he walked. He seemed very weak and feeble. It was really quite pitiable. Sacre nom de fromage vert! De Grandin almost snarled. Pitiable, do you say, monsieur? Pardieu, it is damnable, nothing less. He bowed to the clergyman and turned to me. Come, friend Trowbridge, come away, he cried. We must go to Madame Norman's at once, right away, immediately. What's behind all this mystery? I demanded as we left the parsonage door. He elevated his slender shoulders in an eloquent shrug. I only wish I knew, he replied. Someone is working the devil's business, of that I am sure. But what the game is, or what the next move will be, only the good God can tell, my friend. I turned the car through Tunlaw Street to effect a shortcut, and as we drove past an Italian greengrocer's, de Grandin seized my arm. Stop a moment, friend Trowbridge, he said. I would make a purchase at this shop. We desire some fresh garlic, he informed the proprietor as we entered the little store. A considerable amount, if you have it. The Italian spread his hands in a deprecating gesture. We have it not, signor, he declared. It was only yesterday morning that we sold our entire supply. His little black eyes snapped happily at the memory of an unexpected bargain. Eh, what is this? de Grandin demanded. Do you say you sold your supply? How is that? I know not, the other replied. Yesterday morning a rich gentleman came to my shop in an automobile and called me from my store. He desired all the garlic I had in stock at my own price, signor, and at once I was to deliver it to his address in Ruplisville the same day. Ah! De Grandin's face assumed the expression of a crossword fiend as he begins to see the solution of his puzzle. And this liberal purchaser, what did he look like? The Italian showed his white, even teeth in a wide grin. It was funny, he confessed. He did not look like one of our people, nor like one who had eat much garlic. He was old, very old and thin, with a much wrinkled face and white hair, he... 
Nom d'un chat! the Frenchman cried, then burst into a flood of torrential Italian. The shopkeeper listened at first with suspicion, then incredulity, finally in abject terror. No, no! he exclaimed. No, Signor! Santissima Madonna, you do make the joke! Do I so? de Grandin replied. Wait and see, foolish one! Santo Dio forbid! The other crossed himself piously, then bent his thumb across his palm, circling it with his second and third fingers and extending the fore and little fingers in the form of a pair of horns. The Frenchman turned toward the waiting car with a grunt of inarticulate disgust. What now? I asked as we got under way once more. What did that man make the sign of the evil eye for, de Grandin? Later, my friend, I will tell you later, he answered. You would but laugh if I tell you what I suspect. He is of the Latin blood, and can appreciate my fears. Nor would he utter another word till we reached the Norman house. Dr. Trowbridge, Dr. de Grandin, Mrs. Norman met us in the hall. You must have heard my prayers. I've been phoning your office for the last hour, and they said you were out and couldn't be reached. What's up? I asked. It's Mr. Eckhart again. He's been seized with another fainting fit. He seemed so well this afternoon, and I sent a big dinner up to him at eight o'clock. But when the maid went in, she found him unconscious, and she declares she saw something in his room. Ah? de Grandin interrupted. Where is she, this servant? I would speak with her. Wait a moment, Mrs. Norman answered. I'll send for her. The girl, an ungainly young southern negress, came into the front hall, sullen dissatisfaction written large upon her black face. Now then, de Grandin bent his steady, unwinking gaze on her. What is it you say about seeing someone in the young Monsieur Eckhart's room, eh? I did see something, too, the girl replied stubbornly. I don't care who says I didn't see nothing. I says I did. I just towed her a tray of vittles up to Mr. Eckert's room, and when I opened the door, there was a woman. There was a woman, yes, sir, a skinny, black-eyed white woman, bending over him, and, and, and what, if you please, de Grandin asked breathlessly. A biting him, the girl replied defiantly. I don't care what Miss Norman says, she was a-biting him. I seen her. I knows what she was. I done hear tell about that old Sarah woman, what come up out of the grave, with a long rope about her neck and go round biting folks. Yes, sir. And she was a-biting him, too. I seen her. Nonsense, Mrs. Norman commented in an annoyed whisper over de Grandin's shoulder. Grand Dieu, is it so? de Grandin exclaimed, and turning abruptly leaped up the stairs toward the sick man's room, two steps at a time. See, see, friend Trowbridge, he ordered fiercely when I joined him at the patient's bedside. Behold, it is the mark. Turning back Eckhart's pajama collar, he displayed two incised horizontal arcs on the young man's flesh. There was no room for dispute. They were undoubtedly the marks of human teeth, and from the fresh wounds, the blood was flowing freely. As quickly as possible we staunched the flow and applied restoratives to the patient, both of us working in silence, for my brain was too much in a whirl to permit the formation of intelligent questions, while de Grandin remained dumb as an oyster. Now, he ordered as we completed our ministrations, we must get back to that cemetery, friend Trowbridge, and once there we must do the thing which must be done. What the devil's that? I asked as we left the sick room. No, no, you shall see, he promised, as we entered my car and drove down the street. Quick, the crank handle, he demanded as we descended from the car at the cemetery gate. It will make a serviceable hammer. He was prying a hemlock paling from the graveyard fence as he spoke. We crossed the unkempt cemetery lawn again, and finally paused beside the tombstone of the unknown Sarah. Attend me, friend Trowbridge, de Grandin commanded. Hold the searchlight, if you please. He pressed his pocket flash into my hand. Now, he knelt beside the grave 
pointing the stick he had wrenched from the fence straight downward into the turf. With the crank of my motor he began hammering the wood into the earth. Farther and farther the rough stake sank into the sod, de Grandin's blows falling faster and faster as the wood drove home. Finally, when there was less than six inches of the wicket projecting from the grave's top, he raised the iron high over his head and drove downward with all his might. The short hair at the back of my neck suddenly started upward, and little thrills of horripilation chased each other up my spine as the wood sank suddenly as though driven from clay into sand, and a low, hopeless moan like the wailing of a frozen wind through an ice cave, wafted up to us from the depths of the grave. "'Good God! What's that?' I asked, aghast. For answer he leaned forward, seized the stake in both hands, and drew suddenly up on it. At his second tug the wood came away. "'See?' he ordered curtly, flashing the pocket-lamp on the tip of the stave. For the distance of a foot or so from its pointed end, the wood was stained a deep, dull red. It was wet with blood. "'And now forever!' he hissed between his teeth, driving the wood into the grave once more, and sinking it a full foot below the surface of the grass by thrusting the crank-handle into the earth. "'Come, friend Trowbridge, we have done a good work this night.' I doubt not the young Eckhart will soon recover from his malady. His assumption was justified. Eckhart's condition improved steadily. Within a week, save for a slight pallor, he was to all appearances as well as ever. The pressure of the usual early crop of influenza and pneumonia kept me busily on my rounds, and I gradually gave up hope of getting any information from de Grandin, for a shrug of the shoulders was all the answer he vouchsafed to my questions. I relegated Eckhart's inexplicable hemorrhages and the blood-stained stake to the limbo of never-to-be-solved mysteries. But... 2. Good morning, gentlemen, Detective Sergeant Costello greeted as he followed Nora, my household factotum, into the breakfast-room. It's sorry I am to be disturbing your meal, but there is a little case puzzle in the department that I'd like to talk over with Dr. de Grandin, if you don't mind. He looked expectantly at the little Frenchman as he finished speaking. His lips parted to launch open a detailed description of the case. Parbleu, de Grandin laughed. It is fortunate for me that I have completed my breakfast, cher sergent, for a riddle of crime detection is to me like a red rag to a bullfrog. I must needs snap at it, whether I have been fed or no. Speak on, my friend, I beseech you. I am like Balaam's ass, all ears. The big Irishman seated himself on the extreme edge of one of my heppelwhite chairs and gazed deprecatingly at the derby he held firmly between his knees. It's like this, he began. Tis one of them mysterious disappearance cases, gentlemen. "'and whilst I'm thinking the young lady knows exactly where she's at and why she's there, "'I hate to tell her folks about it. "'All the high-hat folks ain't like you two gentlemen, asking your pardon, sirs. "'They mostly seems to think that a harness bull's uniform is something like a livery, "'like a chauffeur's or a footman's or something, "'and that a plain-clothes man is just a sort of inferior servant. "'They don't give the police credit for no brains, you see.' and when one of their daughters gets skiddy and runs off the reservation, if we tells them the girl's run away of her own free will and accord, they say we're a lot of lazy, good-for-nothing bums who are trying to dodge our legitimate duties by casting mud on the young lady's characters, you see. So when this Miss Esther Norman disappears in broad daylight, leastwise in the twilight, or the day before her dance we suspects right away that the girl's gone her own ways into the best o' intentions, you see. But we doesn't tell her folks as much, or they'll be hollering to the commissioner for to get a brand new set of detectives down to headquarters, so they will. Now, mind you, I'm not saying the young lady mightn't have been kidnapped, you understand, gentlemen? But I do be saying tis most unlikely. I've been on the force, man and boy, in uniform and in plain clothes, for the last twenty-five years and the number of legitimate kidnappings of young women over ten years of age I've seen can be counted on the little finger of my left hand. 
and I ain't got none there at all, at all. He held the member up for our inspection, revealing the fact that the little finger had been amputated close to the knuckle. De Grandin, elbows on the table, pointed chin cupped in his hands, was puffing furiously at a vile-smelling French cigarette, alternately sucking down great draughts of its acrid smoke and expelling clouds of fumes in double jets from his narrow, aristocratic nostrils. "'What is it you say?' he demanded, removing the cigarette from his lips. "'Is it the so lovely Mademoiselle Esther?' "'daughter of that kind Madame Toscarora Avenue Norman, who is missing.' "'Yes, sir,' Costello answered. "'Tis the same young ladies flew the coop, according to my way of thinking. "'Mon Dieu!' The Frenchman gave the ends of his blonde moustache a savage twist. "'You intrigue me, my friend. Say on, how did it happen, and when?' "'Twas about midnight last night the alarm came into headquarters,' the detective replied. According to the facts as we have them, the young lady went downtown in the Norman car to do some errands. We've checked her movements up, and here they are. He drew a black leather memorandum book from his pocket and consulted it. At 2.45 or thereabouts, she left the house, arriving at the Ocean Trust Company at 2.55, five minutes before the institution closed for the day. She drew out $330.65 and left the bank going to Madame Gerard's, where she tried on a party dress for the dance which was being given at her house that night. She left Madame Gerard's at 4.02, leaving orders for the dress to be delivered to her house immediately, and dismissed her chauffeur at the corner of Dean and Tunlaw Streets, saying she was going to deliver some vegetables and what not to a poor family she and some of her friends was keeping till their old man gets lit out to jail. "'Twas myself and Clancy, me buddy, that put him there, when we caught him red-handed in a job of housebreaking too. "'Well, to return to the young lady, she stopped at Pete Bachigalupo's store in Tunlaw Street and bought a basket of fruit and canned things at four-thirty, and—' "'He clamped his long-suffering derby between his knees and spread his hands emptily before us. "'Yes, and—' de Grandin prompted, dropping the glowing end of his cigarette into his coffee cup. "'And that's all,' responded the Irishman. "'She just walked off, and no one ain't seen her since, sir. "'But, uh, God, dear, such things do not occur, my friend,' de Grandin protested. "'Somewhere you have overlooked a factor in this puzzle. "'You say no one saw her later. "'Have you nothing whatever to add to the tale?' "'Well,' the detective grinned at him, there are one or two little incidents, but they ain't of any importance in the case as far as I can see. Just as she left Pete's store, an old gink tried to make her, but she gave him the air, and he went off and didn't bother her no more. I'd a like to seen the old boy at that. Day before yesterday there was an old felly hanging round by the silt mills, annoying the girls as they come off from work. Clancy, me mate, saw him and started to take him up, and darned if the old rummy wasn't strong as a bull. "'Do you know he broke clean away from Clancy "'and darn near broke his arm in the bargain? "'Belike t'was the same man accosted Miss Norman "'outside Pete's store.' "'Ah?' Uh? "'De Grandin's slender white fingers "'began beating a devil's tattoo on the tablecloth. "'And who was it saw this old man annoy the lady, eh?' "'Costello grinned widely. "'Twas Pete Bacigalupo himself, sir,' he answered. Pete swore he recognized the old geezer as having come to his store a month or so ago in an automobile and bought up all his entire stock of garlic. <laughs> the fool said he wouldn't have gone after the filly for a hundred dollars. Said he had the pink eye or the evil eye or some such thing. That sure do burn me up. Dieu est le diable! De Grandin leaped up, oversetting his chair in his mad haste. And we sit here like three poissons d'avril. "'Like poor fish, while he works his devilish will on her. "'Quick, sergeant, quick, friend Trowbridge. "'Your hats, your coats, the motor. "'Now oh, make haste, my friends, fly, fly, I implore you. "'Even now it may be too late.' "'As though all the fiends of pandemonium were at his heels, "'he raced from the breakfast-room up the stairs, three steps at a stride, "'and down the upper hall toward his bedroom. 
nor did he cease his shouted demands for haste throughout his wild flight. Cuckoo! The sergeant tapped his forehead significantly. I shook my head as I hastened to the hall for my driving clothes. No, I answered, shrugging into my topcoat. He's got a reason for everything he does, but you and I can't always see it, sergeant. You said a mouthful that time, Doc, he agreed, pulling his hat down over his ears. He's the darndest, craziest frog I ever seen, but at that he's got more sense than nine men out of ten. To Ropleysville, friend Trowbridge, de Grandin shouted as he leaped into the seat beside me. Make haste, I do implore you. Oh, Jules de Grandin, your grandfather was an imbecile and all your ancestors were idiots, but you are the greatest zany in the family. Why, why do you require a sunstroke before you can see the light, foolish one? I swung the machine down the pike at the highest legal speed, but the little Frenchman kept urging greater haste. Son de Dieu, son de Saint Denis, son du diable, he wailed despairingly. Can you not make this abominable car go faster, friend Trowbridge? Oh, ah, alas, if we are too late. I shall hate myself, I shall loathe myself. Par Dieu, I shall become a Carmelite friar, and eat fish, and abstain from swearing. We took scarcely twenty minutes to cover the ten-mile stretch to the aggregation of tumble-down houses which was Rupleysville, but my companion was almost frothing at the mouth when I drew up before the local apology for a hotel. "'Tell me, monsieur,' de Grandin cried as he thrust the hostelry's door open with his foot and brandished his slender ebony cane before the astonished proprietor's eyes. "'Tell me of a vieillard. An old, old man with snow-white hair and an evil face, who has lately come to this so detestable place. I would know where to find him right away, immediately at once. Say, the Boniface demanded truculently, where do you get that stuff? Who are you to be asked? That'll do. Costello shouldered his way past de Grandin and displayed his badge. You answer this gentleman's questions, and answer em quick and accurate or I'll run you in, see. The innkeeper's defiant attitude melted before the detective's show of authority, like frost before the sunrise. Guess you must mean Mr. Zerny, he replied sullenly. He come here about a month ago and rented the Hazeltown house down the road about a mile, comes up to town for provisions every day or two, and stops in here sometimes for, uh... He halted abruptly his face suffused with a dull flush. Yeah? Costello replied. Go on and say it. We all know what he stops here for. Now listen, buddy. He stabbed the air two inches before the man's face with a blunt forefinger. I don't know whether this here Zerny felly's got a telephone or not, but if he has, you just lay off telling him we're coming. Get me? If anyone's tipped him off when we get to his place... I'm coming back here and plaster more padlocks on this place of yours than Sousa's got medals on his blouse, savvy? Come away, Sergeant, come away, friend Trowbridge, de Grandin besought, almost tearfully. Bandy not words with the conquer, we have work to do. Down the road we raced in the direction indicated by the hotel keeper, till the picket fence and broken shutters of the Hazelton house showed among a rank copse of second-growth pines at the bend of the highway. The shrewd wind of early spring was moaning and soughing among the black boughs of the pine trees as we ran toward the house, and though it was bright with sunshine on the road, there was chill and shadow about us as we climbed the sagging steps of the old building's ruined piazza and paused breathlessly before the paintless front door. "'Shall I knock?' Costello asked dubiously, involuntarily sinking his voice to a whisper. But no, de Grandin answered in a low voice. What we have to do here must be done quietly, my friends. He leaned forward and tried the doorknob with a light, tentative touch. The door gave under his hand, swinging inward on protesting hinges, and we tiptoed into a dark, dust-carpeted hall. A shaft of sunlight, slanting downward from a chink in one of the window shutters, showed innumerable dust motes flying lazily in the air, 
and laid a bright oval of light against the warped floorboards. Huh. Empty as a pork butcher's in Jerusalem, Costello commented disgustedly, looking about the unfurnished rooms. But de Grandin seized him by the elbow with one hand, while he pointed toward the floor with the ferrule of his slender ebony walking stick. Empty, perhaps, he conceded in a low, vibrant whisper. But not recently, mon ami. Where the sunbeams splashed on the uneven floor, there showed distinctly the mark of a booted foot, two marks, a trail of them leading toward the rear of the house. Right yar, the detective agreed. Someone's left his track here, and no mistake. Ah! De Grandin bent forward till it seemed the tip of his high-bridged nose would impinge on the tracks. Gentlemen, he rose and pointed forward into the gloom with a dramatic flourish of his cane. They are here. Let us go. Through the gloomy hall we followed the trail by the aid of Costello's flashlight, stepping carefully to avoid creaking boards as much as possible. At length the marks stopped abruptly in the center of what had formerly been the kitchen. A disturbance in the dust told where the walker had doubled on his tracks in a short circle, and a ring-bolt in the floor gave notice that we stood above a trap-door of some sort. "'Careful, friend Costello,' de Grandin warned. "'Have ready your flashlight when I fling back the trap. Ready? Un, deux, trois. He bent, seized the rusty ring-bolt, and heaved the trap-door back so violently that it flew back with a thundering crash on the floor beyond. The cavern had originally been a cellar for the storage of food, it seemed, and was brick-walled and earth-floored, without window or ventilation opening of any sort. A dank, musty odor assaulted our nostrils as we leaned forward, but further impressions were blotted out by the sight directly beneath us. White as a figurine of carven alabaster, the slender, bare body of a girl lay in sharp reverse silhouette against the darkness of the cavern floor. Her ankles crossed and firmly lashed to a stake in the earth, one hand doubled behind her back in the position of a wrestler's hammerlock grip, and made firm to a peg in the floor, while the left arm was extended straight outward, its wrist pinioned to another stake. Her luxuriant fair hair had been knotted together at the ends, then staked to the ground, so that her head was drawn far back, exposing her rounded throat to its fullest extent, and on the earth beneath her left breast and beside her throat stood two porcelain bowls. Crouched over her was the relic of a man, an old, old hideously wrinkled witch-husband, with matted white hair and beard. In one hand he held a long, gleaming, double-edged dirk, while with the other he caressed the girl's smooth throat with gloating strokes of his skeleton fingers. "'Holy mother!' Costello's County Galway brogue broke through his American accent at the horrid sight below us. "'My God!' I exclaimed all the breath in my lungs suddenly seeming to freeze in my throat. "'Bonjour, monsieur le vampire,' Jules de Grandin greeted nonchalantly, leaping to the earth beside the pinioned girl and waving his walking-stick airily. "'By the horns of the devil, but you have led us a merry chase, Baron Lajos Chutron of Transylvania.' The crouching creature emitted a bellow of fury and leaped toward de Grandin, brandishing his knife. The Frenchman gave ground with a quick cat-like leap, and grasped his slender cane in both hands near the top. Next instant he had ripped the lower part of the stick away, displaying a fine three-edged blade set in the cane's handle, and swung his point toward the frothing-mouthed thing, which mouthed and gibbered like a beast at bay. Ah! he cried with a mocking, upward-lilting accent. You did not expect this, eh, friend blood-drinker? I give you the party of surprise, n'est-ce pas? The centuries have been long, mon vieux, but the reckoning has come at last. Say now, will you die by the steel or by starvation? The aged monster fairly champed his gleaming teeth in fury. His eyes seemed larger, rounder, 
to gleam like the eyes of a dog in the firelight as he launched himself toward the little Frenchman. Saha! The Frenchman sank backward on one foot, then straightened suddenly forward, stiffening his sword arm and plunging his point directly into the charging beastman's distended red mouth. A scream of mingled rage and pain filled the cavern with deafening shrillness, and the monster half turned, as though on an invisible pivot, clawed with horrid impotence at the wire-fine blade of de Grandin's rapier, then sank slowly to the earth, his death cry stilled to a sickening gurgle as his throat filled with blood. Fini, de Grandin commented laconically, drawing on his handkerchief and wiping his blade with meticulous care, then cutting the unconscious girl's bonds with his pocket knife. Drop down your overcoat, friend Trowbridge, he added, that we may cover the poor child's nudity until we can piece out a wardrobe for her. Now then, as he raised her to meet the hands Costello and I extended into the pit, if we clothe her in the motor rug, your jacket, sergeant, friend Trowbridge's top coat, and my shoes, she will be safe from the chill. Parbleu, I have seen women refugees from the bush who could not boast so complete a toilette. With Esther Norman, hastily clothed in her patchwork assortment of garments, wedged in the front seat between de Grandin and me, we began our triumphant journey home. And would you mind telling me how you knew where to look for the young lady, Dr. de Grandin, sir? Detective Sergeant Costello asked respectfully, leaning forward from the rear seat of the car. Wait, wait, my friend, de Grandin replied with a smile. When our duties are all performed, I shall tell you such a tale as shall make your two eyes to pop outward like a snail's. First, however, you must go with us to restore this pauvre enfant to her mother's arms. Then to the headquarters to report the death of that sale bête. Friend Trowbridge will stay with the young lady for so long as he deems necessary, and I shall remain with him to help. Then, this evening, with your consent, friend Trowbridge, you will dine with us, sergeant and I shall tell you all, everything in total. Death of my life, what a tale it is! Pablo, but you shall call me a liar many times before it is finished. Jules de Grandin placed his demitasse on the tabouret and refilled his liqueur glass. My friends, he began, turning his quick elfish smile first on Costello, then on me, I have promised you a remarkable tale. Very well, then, to begin. He flicked a wholly imaginary fleck of dust from his dinner jacket sleeve and crossed his slender, womanishly small feet on the hearth rug. Do you recall, friend Trowbridge, how we went, you and I, to the tea given by the good Madame Norman? Yes? Perhaps then you will recall how at the entrance of the ballroom I stopped with a look of astonishment on my face. Very good. At that moment I saw that which made me disbelieve the evidence of my own two eyes. As the gentleman we later met, as Count Cherny, danced past a mirror on the wall, I beheld, parbleu, what do you suppose, the reflection only of his dancing partner. It was as if the man had been non-existent, and the young lady had danced past the mirror by herself. Now, such a thing was not likely, I admit— you, Sergeant, and you too, friend Trowbridge, will say it was not possible. But such is not the case. In certain circumstances it is possible for that which we see with our eyes to cast no shadow in a mirror. Let that point wait a moment. We have other evidence to consider first. When the young man told us of the Count's prowess in battle, of his incomparable ferocity, I began to believe that which I had at first disbelieved, and when he told us the Count was a Hungarian, I began to believe more than ever. I met the Count, as you will remember, and I took his hand in mine. Parbleu, it was like a hand with no palm. It had hairs on both sides of it. You too, friend Trowbridge, remarked on that phenomenon. While I talked with him, I managed to maneuver him before a mirror. Parbleu, the man was as if he had not been. I could see my own face smiling at me where I knew I should have seen the reflection of his shoulder. Now attend me. 
The Sûreté Générale, what you call the police headquarters of Paris, is not like your English and American bureaus. All facts, no matter however seemingly absurd, which come to that office are carefully noted down for future reference. Among other histories I have read in the archives of that office was that of one Baron Lajos Chutron of Transylvania, whose actions had once been watched by our secret agents. This man was rich and favoured beyond the common run of Hungarian petty nobles, but he was far from beloved by his peasantry. He was known as cruel, wicked, and implacable, and no one could be found who had ever one kind word to say for him. Half the countryside suspected him of being a loup-garou, or werewolf. The others credited a local legend that a woman of his family had once in the olden days taken a demon to husband, and that he was the offspring of that unholy union. According to the story, the progeny of this wicked woman lived like an ordinary man for one hundred years, then died on the stroke of the century, unless his vitality was renewed by drinking the blood of a slaughtered virgin. Absurd? Possibly. An English intelligence office would have said, Bawly nonsense, if one of its agents had sent in such a report. An American bureau would have labelled the report as being the sauce of the apple. But consider this fact. In six hundred years there was no single record of a Baron Chuchron having died. Barons grew old, old to the point of death, but always there came along a new baron, a man in the prime of life, not a youth, to take the old baron's place, nor could any say when the old baron had died or where his body had been laid. Now I had been told that a man under a curse, the werewolf, the vampire, or any other thing in man's shape, who lives more than his allotted time by virtue of wickedness, cannot cast a shadow in a mirror. Also that those accursed ones have hair in the palms of their hands. Eh bien, with this foreknowledge, I engaged this man, who called himself Count Cherny, in conversation concerning Transylvania. Parbleu! The fellow denied all knowledge of the country. He denied it with more force than was necessary. You are a liar, Monsieur le Comte, I tell him, but I say it to myself. Even yet, however, I do not think what I think later. Then came the case of the young Eckhart. He loses blood, he cannot say how or why, but friend Trowbridge and I find a queer mark on his body. I think to me, if perhaps a vampire, a member of that accursed tribe who leave their graves by night and suck the blood of the living, were here, that would account for this young man's condition. But where would such a being come from? It is not likely. Then I meet that old man. "'the one you call Indian John. "'He tells me much of the history of this town in the early days, "'and he tells me something more. "'He tells of a man, an old, old man, "'who has paid him much money to go to a certain grave, "'the grave of a reputed witch in the old cemetery, "'and dig from about it a growth of wild garlic.' Garlic, I know, is a plant intolerable to the vampire. He cannot abide it. If it is planted on his grave, he cannot pass it. I ask myself, who would want such a thing to be, and why? But I have no answer. Only I know if a vampire have been confined to that grave by planted garlic, then liberated when that garlic is taken away, it would account for the young Eckhart's strange sickness. Tiens, friend Trowbridge and I visit that grave, and on its tombstone we read a verse which makes me believe the tenant of that grave may be a vampire. We interview the good minister of the church and learn that another man, an old, old man, have also inquired about that strange grave. Who have done this? I ask me, but even yet I have no definite answer to my question. As we rush to the Norman house to see young Eckhart, I stop at an Italian greengrocer's and ask for fresh garlic, for I think perhaps we can use it to protect the young Eckhart, if it really is a vampire which is troubling him. Parbleu! Some man, an old, old man, have what you Americans call cornered the available supply of garlic. Cor Dieu, I tell me. This old man, he constantly crosses our trail. Also, he is a very great nuisance. 
The Italian tell me the garlic was sent to a house in Ropleysville, so I have an idea where this interfering old rascal may abide. But at that moment I have greater need to see our friend Eckhart than to ask further question of the Italian. Before I go, however, I tell that shopkeeper that his garlic customer has the evil eye. Parbleu, Monsieur Garlic Buyer, you will have no more dealings with that Italian. He knows what he knows. When we arrive at the Norman house, we find young Eckhart in great trouble, and a black serving-maid tells of a strange-looking woman who bit him. Also we find tooth-marks on his breast. The vampire woman, Sarah, is, in very truth, at large, I tell me, and so I hasten to the cemetery to make her fast to her grave with a wooden stake, for once he is staked down, the vampire can no longer roam, he is finished. Friend Trowbridge will testify. He saw blood on this stake driven into a grave dug nearly three hundred years ago. Is it not so, mon ami? I nodded assent, and he took up his narrative. Why this old man should wish to liberate the vampire woman I know not. Certain it is, one of that grisly guild or closely associated with it, as this Count Cherney undoubtedly was, can tell when another of the company is in the vicinity. And I doubt not he did this deed for pure malice and deviltry. However that may be, friend Trowbridge tells me he have seen the Count, and that he seems to have aged greatly. The man who visited the clergyman, and the man who bought the garlic, was also much older than the Count as we knew him. Aha! He is coming to the end of his century, I tell me. Now look out for devilment, Jules de Grandin. Certainly it is sure to come. And then, my sergeant, come you with your tale of Mademoiselle Norman's disappearance, and I too think perhaps she has run away from home voluntarily, of her own free will, until, you say, the Italian shopkeeper recognized the old man who accosted her as one who has the evil eye. Now, what old man? save the one who bought the garlic and who lives at Ropleysville, would that Italian accuse of the evil eye? Pardieu! Has he not already told you the same man once bought his garlic? But yes, the case is complete. The girl has disappeared, an old, old man has accosted her, an old, old man who was so strong he could overcome a policeman. The Count is nearing his century mark when he must die like other men, unless he can secure the blood of a virgin to revivify him. I am more than certain that the Count and Baron are one and the same, and that they both dwell at Ropleysville. Voila, we go to Ropleysville, and we arrive there not one little minute too soon. N'est-ce pas, mes amis? Sure, Costello agreed rising and holding out his hand in farewell. "'You've got the goods, Doc, no mistake about it.' To me, as I helped him with his coat in the hall, the detective confided, "'And he only had one shot of liquor all evening. Gosh, Doc, if one drink could fix me up like that, I wouldn't care how much prohibition we had.' THE BLOOD FLOWER "'Hello?' Jules de Grandin seized the receiver from the office telephone before the echo of the tinkling bell had ceased. "'Who is it, please? But of course, mademoiselle, you may speak with Dr. Trowbridge.' He passed the instrument to me, and busied himself with a third unsuccessful attempt to ignite the evil-smelling French cigarette with which he insisted on fumigating the room. "'Yes,' I queried, placing the receiver to my ear. "'This is Miss Ostrander.' Dr. Trowbridge, a well-modulated voice, informed me. Mrs. Evander's nurse, you know. Yes, I repeated, a little sharply, annoyed at being called by an ordinary case after an onerous day. What is it? I, I don't quite know, sir. She laughed the short, semi-hysterical laugh of an embarrassed woman. She's acting very queerly. She, uh, she's, oh my, there it goes again, sir. Please come over right away. I'm afraid she's becoming delirious. And with that she hung up, leaving me in a state of astounded impatience. Confound the woman, I scolded, as I prepared to slip into my overcoat. 
Why couldn't she have hung on thirty seconds more and told me what the matter was? Eh, what is it, my friend? De Grandin gave up his attempt to make the cigarette burn and regarded me with one of his fixed, unwinking stares. You are puzzled. You are in trouble. Can I assist you? Perhaps, I replied. There's a patient of mine, a Mrs. Evander, who's been suffering from a threatened leukemia. I have administered Fowler's solution and arsenic trioxide and given her a bed-rest treatment for the past week. It looked as if we had the situation pretty well in hand, but— I repeated Miss Ostrander's message. Ah? Huh? he murmured musingly. There it goes again, did she say? What, I wonder, was it? A cough, a convulsion, or who can say? Let us hasten, my friend. Parbleu, she does intrigue me, that Mademoiselle Ostrander, with her so cryptic, there it goes again. Lights were gleaming through the storm from the windows of the Evander house as we came to a stop before its wide veranda. A servant, half clothed and badly frightened, let us in and ushered us on tiptoe to the upper story chamber where the mistress of the establishment lay sick. "'What's wrong?' I demanded as I entered the sick-room, de Grandin at my heels. A glance at the patient reassured me. She lay back on a little pile of infant pillows, her pretty blonde hair trickling in stray rivulets of gold from the confines of her lace sleeping cap. Her hand, almost as white as the linen itself, spread restfully on the Madeira counterpane. "'Huh!' I exclaimed, turning angrily to Miss Ostrander. Is this what you called me out in the rain to see? The nurse raised a forefinger quickly to her lips and motioned toward the hall with her eyes. Doctor, she said in a whisper when we stood outside the sick-room door. I know you'll think me silly, but, but it was positively ghastly. Tiens, mademoiselle, de Grandin cut in. I pray you, be more explicit. First you tell friend Trowbridge that something, we know not what, goes again. Now you do inform us that something is ghastly. Pardieu, you have my sheep. No, no, how do you say? My goat. In spite of herself, the girl laughed at the tragic face he turned to her, but she recovered her gravity quickly. Last night, she went on, still in a whisper, and the night before, just at twelve, a dog howled somewhere in the neighborhood, I couldn't place the sound, but it was one of those long, quavering howls, almost human. Positively, you might have mistaken it for the cry of a little child in pain at first. De Grandin tweaked first one, then the other end of his trimly waxed blonde moustache. And it was this sleepless dog's lament which went again, and which was so ghastly, mademoiselle, he inquired solicitously. No! The nurse exploded with suppressed vehemence and heightened color. "'It was Mrs. Evander, sir. "'Night before last, when the beast began baying, "'she stirred in her sleep, "'turned restlessly for a moment, then went back to sleep. "'When it howled the second time, "'a little nearer the house, she half sat up "'and made a queer little growling noise in her throat. "'Then she slept. "'Last night the animal was howling louder and longer, "'and Mrs. Evander seemed more restless "'and made odd noises more distinctly.' I thought the dog was annoying her, or that she might be having a nightmare, so I got her a drink of water. But when I tried to give it to her, she snarled at me. Eh bien, but this is of interest, de Grandin commented. She did snarl at you, you say? Yes, sir. She didn't wake up when I touched her on the shoulder, just turned her head toward me, and showed her teeth and growled, growled, like a bad-tempered dog. Yes, and then? Tonight the dog began howling a few minutes earlier, five or ten minutes before midnight, perhaps, and it seemed to me his voice was much stronger. Mrs. Evander had the same reaction she had the other two nights at first, but suddenly she sat bolt upright in bed, rolled her head from side to side, and drew back her lips and growled. Then she began snapping at the air, like a dog annoyed by a fly. I did my best to quiet her but I didn't like to go too near. I was afraid, really. And all at once the dog began howling again, right in the next yard, it seemed, and Mrs. Evander threw back her bedclothes, knelt up in bed, and answered him. Answered him? I echoed in stupefaction. 
Yes, doctor. She threw back her head and howled. Long, quavering howls, just like his. At first they were low, but they grew louder and higher till the servants heard them, and James the butler came to the door to see what the matter was. Poor fellow, he was nearly scared out of his wits when he saw her. And then I began. Then I called you. Right while I was talking to you, the dog began baying again, and Mrs. Evander answered him. That was what I meant. She turned to de Grandin. When I said, there it goes again. I had to hang up before I could explain to you, Dr. Trowbridge, for she had started to crawl out of bed toward the window, and I had to run and stop her. But why didn't you tell me this yesterday, or this afternoon when I was here? I demanded. I didn't like to, sir. It all seemed so crazy, so utterly impossible, especially in the daytime, that I was afraid you'd think I'd been asleep on duty and dreamed it all. But now that James has seen it too... Outside in the rain-drenched night, there suddenly rose a wail, long-drawn, pulsating, doleful as the cry of an abandoned soul. Ooh! It rose and fell quavered and almost died away, then resurged with increased force. Ooh! Hear it? the nurse cried, her voice thin-edged with excitement and fear. Again. Ooh! Like the echo of the howls outside came an answering cry from the sick-room beyond the door. Miss Ostrander dashed into the room. De Grandin and I close behind her. The dainty white counterpane had been thrown back. Mrs. Evander, clad only in her Georgette nightrobe and bedcap, had crossed the floor to the window and flung up the sash. Already the wind-whipped rain was beating in upon her as she leaned across the sill, one pink sole toward us, one little white foot on the window ledge, preparatory to jumping. Mon Dieu sees her! De Grandin shrieked, and, matching command with performance, leaped across the room, grasped her shoulders in his small, strong hands, and bore her backward as she flexed the muscles of her legs to hurl herself into the yard below. For a moment she fought like a tigress, snarling, scratching, even snapping at us with her teeth. But Miss Ostrander and I overbore her and thrust her into bed, drawing the covers over her and holding them down like a straitjacket against her furious struggles. De Grandin leaned across the window sill, peering out into the stormy darkness. Aroint thee, accursed of God! I heard him shout into the wind as he drew the sash down, snapped the catch fast, and turned again to the room. Huh? He approached the struggling patient and bent over her, staring intently. A grain and a half of morphine in her arm, if you please, friend Trowbridge. The dose is heavy for a non addict, but. He shrugged his shoulders. It is necessaire that she sleep this poor one, so that is better. Mademoiselle, he regarded Miss Ostrander with his wide-eyed stare. I do not think she will be thus disturbed in the day, but I most strongly urge that hereafter you administer a dose of one half grain of codeine dissolved in eighty parts of water each night, not later than half past ten. Dr. Trowbridge will write the prescription. Friend Trowbridge, he interrupted himself. Where, if at all, is Madame's husband, Monsieur Evander? He's gone to Atlanta on a business trip, Miss Ostrander supplied. We expect him back tomorrow. Tomorrow, zut, that is too bad, de Grandin exclaimed. Eh bien, with you Americans, it is always the business, business before happiness, called the business before the safety of those you love. Mademoiselle, you will please keep in touch with Dr. Trowbridge and me at all times, and when that Monsieur Evander does return from his business trip, please tell him that we desire to see him soon, at once, right away, immediately. Come, friend Trowbridge. Bonne nuit, mademoiselle. I say, Dr. Trowbridge, Niles Evander flung angrily into my consulting room. What's the idea of keeping my wife doped like this? Here I just got back from a trip to the south last night, and rushed out to the house to see her before she went to sleep. And that damn nurse said she'd given her a sleeping powder and couldn't waken her. I don't like it, I tell you, and I won't have it. I told the nurse that if she gave her any dope tonight she was through. 
and that goes for you too. He glared defiantly at me. De Grandin, sunk in the depths of a great chair with a copy of de Gobineau's melancholy Lovers of Kandahar, glanced up sharply, then consulted the watch strapped to his wrist. It is a quarter of eleven, he announced apropos of nothing, laying down the elegant blue and gold volume and rising from his seat. Evander turned on him, eyes ablaze. You're Dr. de Grandin, he accused. I've heard of you from the nurse. It was you who persuaded Trowbridge to dope my wife, button in on a case that didn't concern you. I know all about you, he went on furiously, as the Frenchman gave him a cold stare. You're some sort of charlatan from Paris, a dabbler in criminology and spiritualism and that sort of rot. Well, sir, I want to warn you to keep your hands off my wife. American doctors and American methods are good enough for me. Your patriotism is most admirable, monsieur, de Grandin murmured with a suspicious mildness. If you... The jangle of the telephone bell cut through his words. Yes? he asked sharply, raising the receiver but keeping his cold eyes fixed on Evander's face. Yes, Mademoiselle Ostrander, this is... Grand Dieu, what? How long? Eh, do you say so? Dix millions, diable. But of course we come, we hasten. More blue, but we shall fly. Gentlemen? He hung up the receiver, then turned to us, inclining his shoulders ceremoniously to each of us in turn his gaze as expressionless as the eyes of a graven image. That was Mademoiselle Ostrander on the phone. Madame Evander is gone, disappeared. Gone? Disappeared? Evander echoed stupidly, looking helplessly from de Grandin to me and back again. He slumped down in the nearest chair, gazing straight before him unseeing. Great God, he murmured. Precisely, monsieur, de Grandin agreed in an even emotionless voice. That is exactly what I said. Meantime, he gave me a significant glance. Let us go, cher Trowbridge. I doubt not that Mademoiselle Ostrander will have much of interest to relate. Monsieur, his eyes and voice again became cold, hard, stonily expressionless. If you can so far discommode yourself as to travel in the company of one whose nationality and methods you disapprove, I suggest you accompany us. Niles Evander rose like a sleepwalker and followed us to my waiting car. The previous day's rain had turned to snow with a shifting of the wind to the northeast, and we made slow progress through the suburban roads. It was nearly midnight when we trooped up the steps to the Evander porch and pushed vigorously at the bell button. Yes, sir, Miss Ostrander replied to my question. Mr. Evander came home last night and positively forbade my giving Mrs. Evander any more coding. I told him you wanted to see him right away and that Dr. de Grandin had ordered the narcotic, but he said, Forbear, if you please, mademoiselle, de Grandin interrupted. Monsieur Evander has already been at pain to say as much, and more, to us in person. Now, when did Madame disappear, if you please? I had already given her her medicine last night. The nurse took up her story at the point of interruption. So there was no need of calling you to tell you of Mr. Evander's orders. I thought perhaps I could avoid any unpleasantness by pretending to obey him and giving her the codeine on the sly this evening. But about nine o'clock he came into the sick-room and snatched up the box of powders and put them in his pocket. Then he said he was going to drive over to have it out with you. I tried to telephone you about it, but the storm had put the wires out of commission, and I've been trying to get a message through ever since. And the dog, mademoiselle, the animal who did howl outside the window, has he been active? Yes. Last night he screamed and howled, so I was frightened. Positively, it seemed as though he were trying to jump up from the ground to the window. Mrs. Evander slept through it all, though, thanks to the drug. And tonight? De Grandin prompted. Tonight? The nurse shuddered. The howling began about half past nine, just a few minutes after Mr. Evander left for the city. Mrs. Evander was terrible. She seemed like a woman possessed. 
I fought and struggled with her, but nothing I could do had the slightest effect. She was savage as a maniac. I called James to help me hold her in bed once, and then for a while she lay quietly, for the thing outside seemed to have left. Sometime later, the howling began again, louder and more furious, and Mrs. Evander was twice as hard to manage. She fought and bit so that I was beginning to lose control of her, and I screamed for James again. He must have been somewhere downstairs, though, for he didn't hear my call. I ran out into the hall and leaned over the balustrade to call again, and when I ran back, I wasn't out there more than a minute, the window was up and Mrs. Evander was gone. "'And didn't you do anything? Didn't you look for her?' Evander cut in passionately. "'Yes, sir. James and I ran outside and called and searched all through the grounds, but we couldn't find a trace of her. The wind is blowing so and the snow falling so rapidly. Any tracks she might have made would have been wiped out almost immediately.' De Grandin took his little pointed chin between the thumb and forefinger of his right hand and bowed his head in silent meditation. "'Horns of the devil,' I heard him mutter to himself. "'This is queer. "'Those cries, that delirium, that attempted flight. "'Now this disappearance. "'Pardieu, the trail seems clear, but why? "'Mille cochons, why?' "'See here,' Evander broke in frantically. "'Can't you do something? "'Call the police, call the neighbors, call—' "'Monsieur!' de Grandin interrupted in a frigid voice. "'May I inquire your vocation?' "'Eh?' Evander was taken aback. "'Why, uh, I'm an engineer.' "'Precisely, exactly. "'Dr. Trowbridge and I are medical men. "'We do not attempt to build bridges or sink tunnels. "'We should make sorry work of it. "'You, monsieur, have already once tried your hand at medicine "'by forbidding the administration of a drug we considered necessary. "'Your results were most deplorable.' kindly permit us to follow our profession in our own way. The thing we most of all do not desire in this case is the police force. Later, perhaps. Now it would be more than ruinous. But there are no buts, monsieur. It is my belief that your wife, Madame Evander, is in no immediate danger. However, Dr. Trowbridge and I shall institute such search as may be practicable. And do you meantime keep in such communication with us as the storm will permit? He bowed formally. A very good night to you, monsieur. Miss Ostrander looked at him questioningly. Shall I go with you, doctor? she asked. Mais non, he replied. You will please remain here, ma nourrice, and attend the homecoming of Madame Evander. Then you think she will return? Most doubtlessly. "'Unless I am more badly mistaken than I think I am, "'she will be back to you before another day.' "'Say,' Evander, almost beside himself, burst out, "'what makes you so cocksure she'll be back? "'Good Lord, man, do you realize she's out in this howling blizzard "'with only her nightclothes on?' "'Perfectly, but I do declare she will return. "'But you've nothing to base your absurd monsieur!' "'De Grandin's sharp, whip-like reply cut in. "'Me?' I am Jules de Grandin. When I say she will return, I mean she will return. I do not make mistakes. Where shall we begin the search? I asked as we entered my car. He settled himself snugly in the cushions and lighted a cigarette. We need not search, cher ami, he replied. She will return of her own free will and accord. But man, I argued, Evander was right. She's out in this storm with nothing but a Georgette nightdress on. I doubt it, he answered casually. You doubt it? Why, unless the almost unmistakable signs fail, my friend, this Madame Evander, thanks to her husband's pig ignorance, is this moment clothed in fur. Fur? I echoed. Perfectly. Come, my friend, tread upon the gas. Let us snatch what sleep we can tonight. Eh bien, tomorrow is another day. He was up and waiting for me as I entered the office next morning. Tell me, friend Trowbridge, he demanded, this Madame Evander's leukemia, upon what did you base your diagnosis? 
Well, I replied, referring to my clinical cards, a physical examination showed the axillary glands slightly enlarged, the red corpuscles reduced to little more than a million to the count, the white cells stood at about four hundred thousand, and the patient complained of weakness, drowsiness, and a general feeling of malaise. Hmm? he commented noncommittally. That could easily be so. Yes, such signs would undoubtedly be shown. Now— the telephone bell broke off his remarks half-uttered. Ah! Huh? His little blue eyes snapped triumphantly as he listened to the voice on the wire. I did think so. But yes, right away, at once, immediately. Trowbridge, my old one, she has returned. That was Mademoiselle Ostrander informing me of Madame Evander's reappearance. Let us hasten, there is much I would do this day. After you went last night, Miss Ostrander told us, I lay down on the chaise long in the bedroom and tried to sleep. I suppose I must have napped by fits and starts, but it seemed to me I could hear the faint howling of dogs, sometimes mingled with yelps and cries, all through the night. This morning, just after six o'clock, I got up to prepare myself a piece of toast and a cup of tea before the servants were stirring, and as I came downstairs, I found Mrs. Evander lying on the rug in the front hall. She paused a moment, and her color mounted slightly as she went on. She was lying on that gray wolfskin rug before the fireplace, sir, and was quite nude. Her sleeping cap and nightgown were crumpled up on the floor beside her. Ah? Uh? de Grandin commented. And? I got her to her feet and helped her upstairs, where I dressed her for bed and tucked her in. She didn't seem to show any evil effects from being out in the storm. Indeed, she seems much better this morning, and is sleeping so soundly I could hardly wake her for breakfast. And when I did, she wouldn't eat. Just went back to sleep. Ah? Uh? de Grandin repeated. And you bathed her, mademoiselle, before she was put to bed? The girl looked slightly startled. No, sir, not entirely, but I did wash her hands. They were discolored, especially about the fingertips, with some red substance, almost as if she had been scratching something and gotten blood under her nails. Parbleu! the Frenchman exploded. I did know it, friend Trowbridge. Jules de Gondin, he is never mistaken. Mademoiselle, he turned feverishly to the nurse. Did you by any happy chance save the water in which you laved Madame Evander's hands? Why, no, I didn't. But, oh, I see. Yes, I think perhaps some of the stain may be on the washcloth and the orange stick I cleaned her nails with. I really had quite a time cleaning them, too. Bien, très bien, he ejaculated. Let us have these cloths, these sticks at once, please. Trowbridge, do you withdraw some blood from madame's arm for a test? Then we must hasten to the laboratory. Could you I burn with impatience? An hour later we faced each other in the office. I can't understand it, I confessed. By all the canons of the profession, Mrs. Evander ought to be dead after last night's experience. But there's no doubt she's better. Her pulse was firmer, her temperature right, and her blood count practically normal today. Me, I understand perfectly up to a point, he replied. Beyond that all is dark as the cave of Erebus. Behold, I have tested the stains from Madame's fingers. They are, what do you think? Blood, I hazarded. Pablo, yes, but not of humanity. Menon, they are blood of a dog, my friend. Of a dog? Perfectly. I myself did greatly fear they might prove human, but grâce à Dieu they are not. Now, if you will excuse, I go to make certain investigations, and will meet you at the Maison Evander this evening. Come prepared to be surprised, my friend. Parbleu, I shall be surprised, if I do not astonish myself. Four of us, de Gronda, Miss Ostrander, Niles Evander, and I, sat in the dimly lighted room looking alternately toward the bed where the mistress of the house lay in a drugged sleep, into the still-burning fire of coals in the fireplace grate, and at each other's faces. 
three of us were puzzled almost to the point of hysteria, and de Grandin seemed on pins and needles with excitement and expectation. Occasionally he would rise and walk to the bed, with that quick soundless tread of his which always made me think of a cat. Again he would dart into the hall, nervously light a cigarette, draw a few quick puffs from it, then glide noiselessly into the sick-room once more. None of us spoke above a whisper, and our conversation was limited to inconsequential things. Throughout our group there was the tense expectancy and solemn, taut-nerved air of medical witnesses in the prison death-chamber awaiting the advent of the condemned. Subconsciously, I think, we all realized what we waited for, but my nerves nearly snapped when it came. With the suddenness of a shot, unheralded by any preliminary, the wild, vibrating howl of a beast sounded beneath the sick-room window, its sharp, poignant wail seeming to split the frigid, moonlit air of the night. It rose against the winter stillness, diminished to a moan of heart-rending melancholy, then suddenly crescendoed upward from a moan to a wail from a wail to a howl, despairing, passionate, longing as the lament of a damned spirit, wild and fierce as the rallying call of the fiends of hell. Oh! Miss Ostrander exclaimed involuntarily. Let be! Jules de Grandin ordered tensely, his whisper seeming to carry more because of its sharpness than from any actual sound it made. <coughs> Again the cry shuddered through the air, again it rose to a pitch of intolerable shrillness and evil, then died away, and as we sat stone still in the shadowy chamber, a new sound, a sinister scraping sound, intensified by the ice-hard coldness of the night, came to us. Someone, some thing, was swarming up the rose trellis outside the house. Scrape! Scratch! Scrape, the alternate hand and foothold sounded on the crossbars of the lattice. A pair of hands, long slender corded hands like hands of a cadaver long dead, and armed with talons, blood-stained and hooked, grasped the window-ledge, and a face, God of mercy, such a face, was silhouetted against the background of the night. Not human nor yet wholly bestial it was, but partook grotesquely of both, so that it was at once a foul caricature of each. The forehead was low and narrow, and sloped back to a thatch of short, nondescript colored hair resembling an animal's fur. The nose was elongated out of all semblance to a human feature, and resembled the pointed snout of some animal of the canine tribe except that it curved sharply down at the tip like the beak of some unclean bird of prey. Thin, cruel lips were drawn sneeringly back from a double row of tusk-like teeth, which gleamed horridly in the dim reflection of the open fire. And a pair of round, baleful eyes, green as the luminescence from a rotting carcass in a midnight swamp, glared at us across the window-sill. On each of us in turn, the basilisk glance dwelt momentarily, then fastened itself on the sleeping, sick woman, like a falcon's talons on a dove. Miss Ostrander gave a single choking sob and slid forward from her chair, unconscious. Evander and I sat stupefied with horror, unable to do more than gaze in terror-stricken silence at the apparition. But Jules de Grandin was out of his seat and across the room with a single bound of feline grace and ferocity. "'Aroint thee, accursed of God!' he screamed, showering a barrage of blows from a slender wand on the creature's face. "'Back, spawn of Satan! To thy kennel, hound of hell! I, Jules de Grandin, command it!' The suddenness of his attack took the thing by surprise. For a moment it snarled and cowered under the hailstorm of blows from de Grandin's stick. Then, as suddenly as it had come into view— it loosed its hold on the window-sill and dropped from sight. Son de Dieu! Son du diable! Son de tous les saints des ciels! De Grandin roared, hurling himself out the window in the wake of the fleeing monster. I have you, vile wretch! Pardieu, monsieur Lougarou, but I shall surely crush you! 
Rushing to the window, I saw the tall, skeleton-thin form of the enormity leaping across the moonlit snow with great space-devouring bounds. And after it, brandishing his wand, ran Jules de Grandin, shouting triumphant invectives in mingled French and English. By the shadow of a copse of evergreens the thing made a stand. Wheeling in its tracks it bent nearly double, extending its cadaverous claws like a wrestler searching for a hold, and bearing its glistening tusks in a snarl of fury. De Grandin never slackened pace. Charging full tilt upon the waiting monstrosity, he reached his free hand into his jacket pocket. There was a gleam of blue metal in the moonlight. Then eight quick, pitiless spurts of flame stabbed through the shadow where the monster lurked. Eight whip-like, crackling reports echoed and re-echoed in the midnight stillness, and the voice of Jules de Grandin. Trowbridge! Mon vieux! Oe, friend Trowbridge! Bring a light, quickly! I would that you see what I see! Weltering in a patch of blood-stained snow at de Grandin's feet, we found an elderly man, ruddy-faced, grey-haired, and doubtless in life, of a dignified, even benign aspect. Now, however, he lay in the snow as naked as the day his mother first saw him, and eight gaping gunshot wounds told where de Grandin's missiles had found their mark. The winter cold was already stiffening his limbs, and setting his face in a mask of death. "'Good heavens!' Evander ejaculated as he bent over the lifeless form. "'It's Uncle Friedrich, my wife's uncle. He disappeared just before I went south.' "'Eh bien.' De Grandin regarded the body with no more emotion than if it had been an effigy moulded in snow. "'We shall know where to find your uncle henceforth, monsieur. Will some of you pick him up? Me? Pardieu, I would no more touch him than I would handle a hyena.' Now, monsieur, de Grandin faced Evander across the living-room table. Your statement that the gentleman at whose happy dispatch I so fortunately officiated was your wife's uncle, and that he disappeared before your southern trip, does interest me. Say on, tell me all concerning this Uncle Friedrich of your wife's. When did he disappear, and what led up to his disappearance? Omit nothing, I pray you, for trifles which you may consider of no account may be of the greatest importance. Proceed, monsieur, I listen. Evander squirmed uncomfortably in his chair like a small boy undergoing catechism. He wasn't really her uncle, he responded. Her father and he were schoolmates in Germany, Heidelberg, years ago. Mr. Hoffmeister, Uncle Friedrich, immigrated to this country shortly after my father-in-law came back, and they were in business together for years. Mr. Hoffmeister lived with my wife's people. All the children called him Uncle Friedrich, and was just like one of the family. My mother-in-law died a few years ago, and her husband died shortly after, and Mr. Hoffmeister disposed of his share of the business and went to Germany on a long visit. He was caught there in the war, and didn't return to America until twenty-one. Since that time he lived with us. Evander paused a moment, as though debating mentally whether he should proceed, then smiled in a half-shamefaced manner. To tell you the truth, he continued, I wasn't very keen on having him here. There were times when I didn't like the way he looked at my wife a damn bit. Eh? de Grandin asked. How was that, monsieur? Well... I can't quite put a handle to it in words, but more than once I'd glance up and see him with his eyes fastened on Edith in a most peculiar way. It would have angered me in a young man, but in an old man it both angered and disgusted me. I was on the point of asking him to leave when he disappeared and saved me the trouble. Yes, de Grandin encouraged. And his disappearance, what of that? The old fellow was always an enthusiastic amateur botanist, Evander replied, and he brought a great many specimens for his herbarium back from Europe with him. Off and on he's been messing around with plants since his return, and about a month ago he received a tin of dried flowers from Karovich, Romania, and they seemed to set him almost wild. Karovich, 
Mon Dieu! De Grandin exclaimed. Say on, monsieur, I burn with curiosity. Describe these flowers in detail, if you please. Hm. Evander took his chin in his hand and studied in silence a moment. There wasn't anything especially remarkable about them that I could see. There were a dozen of them, all told, perhaps, and they resembled our oxide daisies a good deal, except that their petals were red instead of yellow. Had a queer sort of odor, too. Even though they were dried, they exuded a sort of sickly, sweet smell, yet not quite sweet, either. It was a sort of mixture of perfume and stench, if that means anything to you. Pardieu, it means much, de Grandin assured him. And their sap, where it had dried, did it not resemble that of the milkweed plant? Yes, how did you know? No matter. Proceed, if you please. Your Uncle Friedrich did take these so accursed flowers out and— And tried an experiment with them, Evander supplied. He put them in a bowl of water, and they freshened up as though they had not been plucked an hour. Yes, and his disappearance. Name of a little green man, his disappearance. That happened just before I went south. All three of us went to the theater one evening, and Uncle Friedrich wore one of the red flowers in his buttonhole. My wife wore a spray of them in her corsage. He tried to get me to put one of the things in my coat, too, but I hated their smell so much I wouldn't do it. Lucky you, de Grandin murmured, so low the narrator failed to hear him. Uncle Friedrich was very restless and queer all evening, Evander proceeded. But the old fellow had been getting rather childish lately, so we didn't pay any particular attention to his actions. Next morning... He was gone. And did you make inquiry? No. He often went away on little trips without warning us beforehand. And besides, I was glad enough to see him get out. I didn't try to find him. It was just after this that my wife's health became bad. But I had to make this trip for our firm. So I called in Dr. Trowbridge, and there you are. Yes. Pablo, here we are indeed. De Grandin nodded emphatically. Listen carefully, my friends. What I am about to say is the truth. When I first came to visit Madame Evander with Fred Trowbridge, and heard the strange story Mademoiselle Ostrander told, I was amazed. Why, I ask me, does this lady answer the howling of a dog beneath her window? Pablo, it was most curious. Then, while we three, Fred Trowbridge, Mademoiselle Ostrander, and I, did talk of madame's so strange malady i did hear the call of that dog beneath the window with my own two ears and did observe madame evander's reaction to it out the window i put my head and in the storm i saw no dog at all but what i thought might be a human man a tall thin man yet a dog had howled beneath that window and had been answered by madame but a moment before me i do not like that I call upon that man, if such he be, to be gone. Also I do request Mademoiselle Ostrander to place her patient under an opiate each night, that the howls beneath her window may not awaken Madame Evander. Eh bien, thus far, thus good. But you do come along, monsieur, and countermand my order. While Madame is not under the drug, that unholy thing beneath her window does howl once more, and Madame disappears. Yes. Now, there was no ordinary medical diagnosis for such a case as this, so I search my memory and my knowledge for an extraordinary one. What do I find in that storehouse of my mind? In parts of Europe, my friends, believe me, I know whereof I speak, there are known such things as werewolves or wolf-men. In France we know them as les loups-garous, in Wales they call them the bug-wolves or bogey-wolves. In the days of old the Greeks did know them under the style of Lucanthropos. Yes. What he is, no one knows well. Sometimes he is said to be a wolf, a magical wolf who can become a man. Sometimes more often he is said to be a man who can or must become a wolf. No one knows accurately. But this we know 
the man who is also a wolf is ten times more terrible than the wolf who is only a wolf. At night he quests and kills his prey, which is most often his fellow man, but sometimes his ancient enemy, the dog. By day he hides his villainy under the guise of a man's form. Sometimes he changes entirely to a wolf's shape. Sometimes he becomes a fearful mixture of man and beast. But always he is devil incarnate. If he be killed while in the wolf shape, he at once reverts to human form, so by that sign we know we have slain a werewolf and not a true wolf, certainly. Now, some werewolves become such by the aid of Satan, some become so as the result of a curse, a few are so through accident. In Transylvania, that devil-ridden land, the very soil does seem to favor the transformation of man into beast. There are springs from which the water, once drunk, will make its drinker into a savage beast. And there are flowers, God, do have I not seen them, which, if worn by a man at night, during the full of the moon, will do the same. Among the most potent of these blooms of hell is la fleur du sang, or blood flower, which is exactly the accursed weed you have described to us, Monsieur Evander, the flower your uncle Friedrich and your lady did wear to the theatre that night of the full moon. When you mentioned the village of Karovich, I did see it all at once immediately, for that place is on the Romanian side of the Transylvanian Alps, and there the blood flowers are found in greater numbers than anywhere else in the world. The very mountain soil does seem cursed with lycanthropy. Very well, I did not know of the flower when first I came into this case, but I did suspect something evil had cast a spell on Madame. She did exhibit all the symptoms of a lycanthrope about to be transformed, and beneath her window there did howl what was undoubtedly a wolf thing. He has put his cursed sign upon her, and does even now seek her for his mate, I tell me, after I order him away in the name of the good God. When Madame disappeared I was not surprised. When she returned after a night in the snow, I was less surprised. But the blood on her hands did perturb me. Was it human? Was she an all-unconscious murderess? Or was it happily the blood of animals? I did not know. I analyzed it and discovered it were a dog's blood. Very well, I tell me. Let us see where a dog has been mauled in that vicinity. This afternoon I made guarded inquiries— I find many dogs have been strangely killed in this neighborhood of late. No dog, no matter how big, was safe out of doors after nightfall. Also, I meet a man, an ivrogne, what you call a drunkard, one who patronizes the leggers of the boot not with wisdom but with too great frequency. He is no more so. He hath made the oath to remain sober. Pourquoi? "'because three nights ago, as he passed through the park, "'he was set upon by a horror so terrible "'that he thought he was an alcoholic delirium. "'It were like a man, yet not like a man. "'It had a long nose and terrible eyes "'and great flashing teeth, "'and it did seek to kill and devour him. "'My friends, in his way, that former drunkard "'did describe the thing which tried to enter this house tonight. "'It were the same. "'Fortunately for the poor drunken man, he were carrying a walking cane of ash wood, and when he raised it to defend himself, the terror did shrink from him. Ah! I tell me when I hear that. Now we know it were truly le loup-garou, for it is notorious that the wood of the ash tree is as intolerable to the werewolf as the bloom of the garlic is unpleasant to the vampire. What do I do? I go to the woods and cut a bundle of ash switches. Then I come here. Tonight the wolf thing come crying for the mate who ranged the snows with him last night. He is lonely, he is mad for another of his kind. Tonight, perhaps, they will attack nobler game than dogs. Very well, I am ready. When Madame Evander, being drugged, did not answer his call, he was emboldened to enter the house. Pardieu, he did not know Jules de Grandin awaited him. Had I not been here, it might well have gone hard with Mademoiselle Ostrander. As it was, 
he spread his slender hands, there is one less man-monster in the world this night. Evander stared at him in round-eyed wonder. I can't believe it, he muttered. But you've proved your case. Poor Uncle Friedrich, the curse of the blood flower. He broke off, an expression of mingled horror and despair on his face. My wife, he gasped. Will she become a thing like that? Will— Monsieur, de Grandin interrupted gently. She has become one. Only the drug holds her bound in human form at this minute. Oh! Evander cried, tears of grief streaming down his face. Save her! For the love of heaven, save her! Can't you do anything to bring her back to me? You do not approve my methods, de Grandin reminded him. Evander was like a pleading child. I apologize, he whimpered. I'll give you anything you ask if you'll only save her. I'm not rich, but I think I can raise fifty thousand dollars. I'll give it to you if you'll cure her. The Frenchman twisted his little blonde mustache furiously. The fee you name is attractive, monsieur, he remarked. I'll pay it, I'll pay it, Evander burst out hysterically. Then, unable to control himself, he put his folded arms on the table, sank his head upon them, and shook with sobs. Very well, de Grandin agreed, casting me the flicker of a wink. Tomorrow night I shall undertake your lady's case. Tomorrow night we attempt the cure. Au revoir, monsieur. Come away, friend Trowbridge. We must rest well before tomorrow night. De Grandin was silent to the point of moodiness all next morning. Toward noon he put on his outdoor clothing and left without luncheon, saying he would meet me at Evander's that night. He was there when I arrived and greeted me, saying that the main business would start soon. Meantime, Trowbridge, mon vieux, I beg you will assist me in the kitchen. There is much to do and little time in which to do it. Opening a large valise, he produced a bundle of slender sticks, which he began splitting into strips like basket withs, explaining that they were from a mountain ash tree. When some twenty-five of these had been prepared, he selected a number of bottles from the bottom of the satchel, and taking a large aluminum kettle began scouring it with a clean cloth. "'Attend me carefully, friend Trowbridge,' he commanded. Do you keep close tally as I compound the draft, for much depends on the formula being correct. To begin. Arranging a pair of apothecary's scales and a graduate glass before him on the table, he handed me this memorandum. Rx. Three pints pure spring water, two drams sulphur, one half ounce castorium, six drams opium, three drams asafetida, one half ounce hypericum, three quarter ounce aromatic ammonia, one half ounce gum camphor. As he busied himself with scales and graduate, I checked the amounts he poured into the kettle. Voila, he announced. We are prepared. Quickly he thrust the ash withs into a pail full of boiling water and proceeded to bind together a three stranded hyssop of ash, poplar, and birch twigs. And now, my friend, if you will assist me, we shall proceed, he asserted, thrusting a large wash-pan into my hands and preparing to follow me into the dining-room with the kettle of liquor he had prepared, his little brush-broom thrust under his arm. We moved the dining-room furniture against the walls, and de Grandin put the kettle of liquid in the dish-pan I had brought in, piling a number of light wood chips about it and starting a small fire. As the liquid in the kettle began bubbling and seething over the flame, he knelt and began tracing a circle about seven feet in diameter with a bit of white chalk. Inside the first circle he drew a second ring some three feet in diameter, and within this traced a star composed of two interlaced triangles. At the very center he marked down an odd-looking figure composed of a circle surmounted by a crescent and supported by a cross. This is the druid's foot, or pentagram, he explained, indicating the star. The powers of evil are powerless to pass it, either from without or within. This 
he pointed to the central figure, is the sign of Mercury. It is also the sign of the holy angels, my friend, and the bon Dieu knows we shall need their kind offices this night. Compare, friend Trowbridge, if you please, the chart I have drawn with the exemplar which I did most carefully prepare from the occult books to-day. I would have the testimony of both of us that I have left nothing undone. Into my hand he thrust the aforementioned chart. Quickly, working like one possessed, he arranged seven small silver lamps about the outer circle, where the seven little rings on the chart indicated, ignited their wicks, snapped off the electric light, and rushing into the kitchen returned with the boiled ash withes dangling from his hand. Fast as he had worked, there was not a moment to spare for Miss Ostrander's hysterical call. Dr. de Grandin! Oh, Dr. de Grandin! came down the stairs as he returned from the kitchen. On the bed, Mrs. Evander lay writhing like a person in convulsions. As we approached, she turned her face toward us, and I stopped in my tracks, speechless with the spectacle before me. It was as if the young woman's pretty face were twisted into a grimace. Only the muscles, instead of resuming their wonted positions again, seemed to stretch steadily out of place. Her mouth widened gradually till it was nearly twice its normal size. Her nose seemed lengthening, becoming more pointed and crooking sharply at the end. Her eyes, of sweet cornflower blue, were widening, becoming at once round and prominent, and changing to a wicked phosphorescent green. I stared and stared, unable to believe the evidence of my eyes, and as I looked she raised her hands from beneath the covers, and I went sick with the horror of it. The dainty flower-like pink and white hands, with their well-manicured nails, were transformed into a pair of withered corded talons, armed with long horn-like curved claws, saber-sharp and hooked like the nails of some predatory bird. Before my eyes, a sweet, gently-bred woman was being transfigured into a foul hell-hag, a loathsome, hideous parody of herself. Quickly, friend Trowbridge! Seize her! Bind her! de Grandin called, thrusting a handful of the limber withes into my grasp, and hurling himself upon the monstrous thing which lay in Edith Evander's place. The hag fought like a true member of the wolf-pack. Howling, clawing, growling, and snarling, she opposed tooth and nail to our efforts. But at last we lashed her wrists and ankles firmly with the wooden cords, and bore her struggling frantically down the stairs, and placed her within the mystic circle de Gronda had drawn on the dining-room floor. "'Inside, friend Trowbridge, quickly!' the Frenchman ordered as he dipped the hyssop into the boiling liquid in the kettle and leaped over the chalk-marks. "'Mademoiselle Ostrander, Monsieur Evander, for your lives, leave the house!' Reluctantly, the husband and nurse left us, and de Grandin began showering the contorting, howling thing on the floor with liquid from the boiling kettle. Swinging his hiss up in the form of a cross above the hideous changeling's head, he uttered some invocation so rapidly that I failed to catch the words. Then, striking the wolf-woman's feet, hands, heart, and head in turn with his bundle of twigs, he drew forth a small black book and began reading in a firm, clear voice. Out of the deep have I called unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. And at the end he finished with a great shout. I know that my Redeemer liveth. I am the resurrection and the life, saith the Lord. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. As the words sounded through the room, it seemed to me that a great cloud of shadow, like a billow of black vapor, rose from the dark corners of the apartment, eddied toward the circle of lamps, swaying their flames lambently, then suddenly gave back, evaporated, and disappeared, with a noise like steam escaping from a boiling kettle. Behold, Trowbridge, my friend, de Grandin ordered pointing to the still figure which lay over the sign of Mercury at his feet. I bent forward, stifling my repugnance, then sighed with mingled relief and surprise. Calm as a sleeping child, 
Edith Evander, freed from all the hideous stigmata of the wolf people, lay before us, her slender hands still bound in the wooden ropes, crossed on her breast, her sweet delicate features as though they had never been disfigured by the curse of the blood flower. Loosing the bonds from her wrists and feet, the Frenchman picked the sleeping woman up in his arms and bore her to her bedroom above stairs. Do you summon her husband and the nurse, my friend? he called from the turn in the stairway. She will have need of both anon. Why, why she's herself again! Evander exclaimed joyfully as he leaned solicitously above his wife's bed. But of course, de Grandin agreed. The spell of evil was strong upon her, monsieur, but the charm of good was mightier. She is released from her bondage for all time. I'll have your fee ready tomorrow, Evander promised diffidently. I could not arrange the mortgages today. It was rather short notice, you know. Laughter twinkled in de Grandin's little blue eyes like the reflection of moonlight on flowing water. My friend, he replied, I did make the good joke on you last night. Parbleu, to hear you agree to anything, and to announce that you did trust my methods as well, was payment enough for me. I want not your money. If you would repay Jules de Grandin for his services, continue to love and cherish your wife as you did last night, when you feared you were about to lose her. Me, morbleu, but I shall make the eyes of my confrere pop with jealousy when I tell them what I have accomplished this night. Song d'un poisson! I am one very clever man, monsieur. It's all a mystery to me, de Grandin, I confessed as we drove home. But I'm hanged if I can understand how it was that the man was transformed into a monster almost as soon as he wore those flowers, and the woman resisted the influence of the things for a week or more. Yes, he agreed. That is strange. Myself, I think it was because werewolfism is an outward and visible sign of the power of evil, and the man was already steeped in sin, while the woman was pure in heart. She had what we might call a higher immunity from the virus of the blood flower. And wasn't there some old legend to the effect that a werewolf could only be killed with a silver bullet? Ah, bah! he replied with a laugh. What did those old legend mongers know of the power of modern firearms? Parbleu, had the good St. George possessed a military rifle of today, he might have slain the dragon without approaching nearer than a mile. When I did shoot that wolf-man, my friend, I had something more powerful than superstition in my hand. More bleu, but I did shoot a hole in him large enough for him to have walked through. That reminds me, I added. How are we going to explain his body to the police? Explain? he echoed with a chuckle. Non d'un bouc, we shall not explain. I myself did dispose of him this very afternoon. He lies buried beneath the roots of an ash-tree, with a stake of ash through his heart to hold him to the earth. His sinful body will rise no more to plague us, I do assure you. He was known to have a habit of disappearing. Very good. This time there will be no reappearance. We are through. Finished. Done with him for good. We drove another mile or so in silence. Then my companion nudged me sharply in the ribs. "'The curing of werewolf ladies, my friend,' he confided. "'It is dry work. Are you sure there is a full bottle of brandy in the cellar?' THE VEILED PROPHETESS "'But, madame, what you say is incredible.' Jules de Grandin was saying to a fashionably dressed young woman as I returned to the consulting room from my morning round of calls. It may be incredible, the visitor admitted, but it's so just the same. I tell you she was there. Ah, Trowbridge, mon cher. De Grandin leaped up as he beheld me in the doorway. This is Madame Penniman. She has a remarkable story to tell. Madame? He bowed ceremoniously to our caller. Will you have the goodness to relate your case to Dr. Trowbridge? He will be interested. The young lady crossed her slender, grey-silk-clad legs, 
adjusted her abbreviated black satin dress in a manner to cover at least a portion of her patelli, and regarded me with the fixed, dreamy stare of a pupil reciting a lesson learned by rote. "'My name is Naomi Penniman,' she began. "'My husband is Benjamin Penniman of the chocolate importing firm of Penniman and Brixton. We have been married six months, and came to live in Harrisonville when we returned from our honeymoon trip three months ago.' "'We have the Barton Place in Tunlaw Street.' "'Yes,' I murmured. "'I heard of Dr. de Grandin through Mrs. Norman. "'She said he did a wonderful piece of work in rescuing her daughter Esther from some horrible old man. "'So I brought my case to you. "'I wouldn't dare go to the police with it.' "'Hm?' I murmured. "'Just what? "'It's about my husband,' she went on, without giving me time to form my query. "'There's a woman.' or something, trying to take him away from me. Well, uh, my dear young lady, don't you think you would better have consulted a lawyer? I objected. Physicians sometimes undertake to patch up leaky hearts, but they're scarcely in the business of repairing outraged affections, you know. Mais non, friend Trowbridge, de Grandin denied, with a delighted chuckle. You do misapprehend madame's statement. Me, I think perhaps she speaks advisedly when she does say a woman or something designs to alienate her husband. Proceed, madame, if you please. I graduated from Barnard in twenty-four. Mrs. Penniman took up her statement. And married Ben last year. We went on a ninety-day cruise for our wedding tour and moved here as soon as we came back. Our class had a reunion at the Allenton Thursday of Christmas week, and some of the girls were crazy about Madame Naira, the veiled prophetess, a fortune-teller up in East 82nd Street. They talked about her so much the rest of us decided to pay her a call. I was afraid to go by myself, so I teased Ben, my husband, into going with me, and—and and he's been acting queer ever since. Queer? I echoed. How? Well— she made a vague sort of gesture with one of her small, well-manicured hands, and flushed slightly. "'You know, Doctor, when two people have been married only six months, the stardust oughtn't to be rubbed off the wings of romance, ought it? Yet Ben's been cooler and cooler to me, commencing almost immediately after we went to see that horrid woman.' "'You mean—oh, uh, it's hard to put into words. Just little things, you know.' None of them important in themselves, but pretty big in the aggregate. He forgets to kiss me good-bye in the morning, stays over in New York late at night, sometimes without calling me up to let me know he won't be home, and breaks engagements to take me places without warning. Then, when I expostulate, he pleads business. But, my dear madame, I protested, this is certainly no case for us. Not every man has the capacity for retaining romance after marriage. Mighty few of them have, I imagine. And it may easily be exactly as your husband says. His business may require his presence in New York at nights. Be reasonable, my dear. When you were first married, he might have strained a point to be home while dinner was hot, and let his partners handle matters. But you're really old married folks now, you know, and he has to make a living for you both. You'd best let me give you a bromide. This thing may have gotten on your nerves. And go home and forget your silly suspicions. And will the bromide keep her, or it, out of my house, out of my bedroom at night? Mrs. Penniman asked. Eh, uh, what's that? I demanded. That's what made me call on Dr. de Grandin, she replied. It was bad enough when Ben took to neglecting me, but on the second of last month— while we were in bed, I saw a woman in our room. A woman in your bedroom? I asked. The story seemed more sordid than I had at first supposed. Well, if it wasn't a woman, it was something in the shape of one, she replied. I'd been pretty much upset by Ben's actions, and had reproached him pretty severely the Sunday before, when he didn't show up to take me from the Amberson's reception, and he'd promised to reform. He did, too. For four nights, from Monday to Thursday, he'd been home to dinner on time. And Thursday night, the second, we'd been to the theatre over in New York. We went to a nightclub after the play and came back on the owl train. 
It must have been one o'clock before we got home. I was awfully tired and went to bed just as soon as I could get my clothes off. But Ben was in bed first and was sound asleep when I got into mine. I was just dropping off when I happened to remember he hadn't kissed me good night. We'd rather gotten out of the habit during the last few weeks. I turned my covers back and was in the act of getting out of bed to lean over Ben and kiss him when I noticed he was moaning or talking in his sleep. Just as I put my feet to the floor, I heard him say, Second! Second! Twice! just like that, and put his hands out, as if he were pushing something away from him. Then I saw her. All at once she was standing by the door of our room, smiling at him like like a, a cat smiling at a bird, if you can imagine such a thing, and walking toward him with her arms outstretched. I thought I was dreaming, but I wasn't. I tell you, I saw her. She walked across the rug and stood beside him, looking down with that queer, catty smile of hers, and took both his hands in hers. He sat up in bed and looked at her like, as he used to look at me when we were first married. I was spellbound for a moment. Then I said, dream or no dream, she shan't have him, and leaped to my feet. The woman loosed one of her hands from Ben's and pointed her finger at me, smiling that same awful, calm smile all the time. Woman, she said, get you gone. This man is mine, bound to me forever. He has put you away and wedded me. Be off. That's just what she said, speaking in a sort of throaty voice. And then she went away. How do you mean went away? I asked. Did she vanish? I don't know, Mrs. Peniman answered. I couldn't say whether she actually vanished or faded out like a motion picture or went through the door. She just wasn't there when I looked again. And your husband? He fell right back on the pillows and went to sleep. I had to shake him in order to wake him up. Shamming? No, I don't think so. He really seemed asleep, and he didn't seem to know anything about the woman when I asked him. Mmm. I gave de Grandin a quick look but there was no gleam of agreement in his round blue eyes as they encountered mine. "'Proceed, madame, if you please,' he urged with a nod at our caller. "'She's been back three times since then,' Mrs. Peniman said, "'and each time she has warned me to leave. The last time, night before last, she threatened me, said she would wither me if I did not go.' "'Tell me, madame,' de Grandin broke in, is there any condition precedent to this strange visitant's appearance? I, uh, I don't believe I understand, the girl replied. Any particular conduct on your husband's part which would seem to herald her approach? Does he show any signs, or perhaps do you have any feelings of apprehension or presentiment before she comes? No, Mrs. Peniman answered thoughtfully. No, I can't say that. Wait a moment. Yes. Every time she's come, it's been after a period of reformation on Ben's part, after he's been attentive to me for several days. As long as he's indifferent to me, she stays away. But each time he begins to be his old dear self, she makes her appearance, always very late at night or early in the morning, and always with the same command for me to leave. One thing more, doctor. The last time she told me to go— the time she threatened me, I noticed Ben's seal ring on her finger. "'Eh, what is that?' de Grandin snapped. "'His ring, how?' "'He lost his ring when we went to visit Madame Naira. I'm sure he did, though he declares he didn't. It was a class ring with the seal of the university on it, and his class numerals imposed on the seal. "'And how came he to lose it, if you please?' "'He was clowning,' the girl answered. Ben was always acting like a comedian in the old days, and he was showing off when we went to the veiled prophetesses that day. Really, I think the place rather impressed him, and he was like a little boy, whistling his way past the graveyard when he acted like a buffoon. The place was awfully weird, with a lot of eastern bric-a-brac in the reception room, where we waited for the prophetess to see us. 
Ben went all around examining everything, and seemed especially taken with the statue of a woman with a cat's head. The thing was almost life-size, and shaped something like a mummy. It gave me the creeps, really. Ben put his hat, he was wearing a derby that day, on its head, and then slipped his seal ring on its finger. Just then the door to the prophetess's consulting room opened, and Ben snatched his hat off the thing's head in a hurry, but I'm sure he didn't get his ring back. We were ushered into the fortune-teller's place immediately, and went out by another door, and we were so full of the stuff she'd told us that neither of us missed the ring till we were on the train coming home. Ben phoned her place next day, but they said no such ring had been found. He didn't like to confess he'd put it on the statue's finger, so he told them he must have dropped it on the floor. Ah? Uh? De Grandin drew a pad of paper and a pencil toward him and scribbled a note. And what did she tell you, this Madame Veiled Prophetess Naira, if you please, Madame? Oh, the girl spread her hands. The usual patter the fortune tellers have, recited my history fairly accurately, told me I'd been to Egypt, nothing wonderful in that. I was wearing a scarab Ben bought me in Cairo and ended up with some nonsense about my having to make a big sacrifice in the near future, that others might have happiness and destiny be fulfilled. She paused, a rosy flush suffusing her face. That frightened us a little, she confessed, because when she said that, we both thought maybe she meant I was going to die when, well, you see. Perfectly, madame, de Grandin nodded with quick understanding. Mankind is perpetuated by woman's going into the valley of the shadow of death to fetch up new lives. Fear not, dear lady. I do assure you the prophetess meant something quite otherwise. And you will help me, she begged. Dr. de Grandin, I, I am going to do what you said about the valley of the shadow this spring, and I want my husband. He is my man, my mate, and no one, no thing— shall take him from me. Can you make her go away, please? I shall try, madame, the little Frenchman answered gently. I cannot say I quite understand everything, yet, but I shall make your case my study. Parbleu, but I shall sleep not until I have reached a working hypothesis. Oh, thank you, thank you, the young matron exclaimed. I feel ever so much easier already. But of course, de Grandin acquiesced, bending a smile of singular sweetness on her. That is as it should be, ma chère. He raised her fingers to his lips before escorting her from the room. And now, friend Trowbridge, what do you think of our case? He demanded when the front door had closed behind our caller. Since you ask me, I answered with brutal frankness, I don't know who's the crazier. Mrs. Penniman or you? But I think you are, for you should know better. You know as well as I that illusions and hallucinations are apt to occur at any time during the puerperal period. This is a clear case of mild manic depressive insanity. Because of her condition, this poor child has construed her husband's absorption in his business as neglect. She's a psychic type, reacting readily to external stimuli, and in her state of depression... She thinks his love has failed. That's preyed on her mind till she's on the borderline of insanity, and you were very unkind to humor her in her delusions. He rested his elbows on the desk, cupping his little pointed chin in his hands, and puffed furiously on his cigarette till its acrid, unpleasant smoke surrounded his sleek, blonde head in a gray nimbus. Oh, la, la, hear him, he chuckled. Suppose, Trowbridge, mon vieux, I were to say I do not consider la belle Penniman mad at all, not even one little bit. What then? Huh, I returned. I dare say you'd have agreed with her if she'd said that statue her husband put his ring on had come to life. Perhaps, he returned with an irritating grin. Before we are through with this case, my friend, we may see stranger things than that. Two days later, he announced matter-of-factly, "'Today, friend Trowbridge, we go to interview this Madame Naira, the prophetess of the Vale.' 
We, I responded. Perhaps you do, but I'll have nothing to do with the matter. Pardieu, but you will, he replied with a laugh. This case, my friend, promises as much adventure as any you and I have had together. Come, a spice of the unusual will be a tonic for you, after an uneventful season of house-to-house -house calls. Oh, all right, I agreed grudgingly. I'll go along, but I want you to know I don't countenance any of this foolishness. What Mrs. Penniman needs is a nerve specialist, not this clowning we're going through. Madame Naira's atelier in East 82nd Street spoke volumes for the public's credulity. It was one of the old-fashioned brownstone front residences of two generations ago, located within a pebble's toss of Central Park, and worth its square footage in gold coin. Outside it was as like its neighbors in the block as one pea is like its fellows in the pod. Within it was a perfect example of good taste and expensive furnishings. A butler bearing all the hallmarks of having served in at least a duke's household, staidly resplendent in correct cutaway coat and striped trousers, admitted us and took the cards de Grandin handed him, inspecting them with minute care, accepted the prophetess's fee, payable strictly in advance, and ushered us into a large and luxuriously furnished parlor. See here. I began, as we seated ourselves in a pair of richly upholstered chairs. If you expect to— A violent grimace on the Frenchman's face warned me to silence. Next moment he rose, remarking, What a beautiful room we have here, my friend! And sauntered about, admiring the handsome pictures on the walls. Passing my chair, he seated himself on its arm and slapped me jovially on the back then bent close and whispered fiercely in my ear. No talk, friend Trowbridge. Already I have discovered dictographs concealed behind nearly every picture, and I know not if they have periscope peepholes to enable them to watch us as well. Caution! I had a friend at the French consulate make the appointment for us in his name, and I am Alphonse Char, while you have assumed the role of William Tyndale, an attorney. Remember. Humming a snatch of tune, he began a second circuit of the room. Before he had completed his trip, a slender, dark-skinned young man in flowing blue linen robes and a huge turban of red and yellow silk appeared almost as if by magic in the drawing-room doorway, beckoning us with a thin bamboo cane which he bore like a badge of office. Casting me the flicker of a wink, de Grandin fell in step behind him and followed up the stairs. The ground-floor drawing-room, where we had first cooled our heels, was a perfect example of occidental elegance in furniture and appointments. The room into which we were now shown was a riot of oriental extravagance. Rugs of hues and patterns as gorgeous as the plumage of paradise birds were strewn over the floor, in some cases three deep. The plaster walls were painted in glaring reproductions of Egyptian temple scenes, and fitted here and there with niches in which stood statues of plaster, stone, or metal, many of them enameled in brilliant colors. The only article of furniture in the apartment was a long crescent-shaped bench or settee of some dark wood thickly encrusted with mother-of-pearl inlays, which stood almost in the center of the room and faced what appeared to be the entrance to another chamber. This entrance was constructed in the form of a temple gateway, or, it seemed to me, the door to a mausoleum. Plaster blocks made to imitate stone had been laid like a wall about it, and on each side of the opening there rose straight, thick columns topped with lotus capitals, while a slab of flat stone reached between them, forming the pediment of the doorway. On this was engraved the Egyptian symbol of the solar disk, vulture wings spreading from right and left of it. To the left of the door crouched a terracotta androsphinx, while on the right stood a queer-looking statue representing a woman swathed in mummy bands about her lower body, naked from the waist upward, and having the head of a lioness set upon her shoulders. One hand she held against her rather prominent bosom, grasping an instrument something like an undersized tennis racket, only instead of strings, the open oval of the racket was fitted with transverse horizontal bars, on which rows of little bells hung. 
The other hand was extended as though bestowing a blessing, the long tapering fingers widely separated. I did not like the thing's looks. Involuntarily, even though I knew it to be only a lifeless piece of plaster and papier-mâché, I shuddered as I looked at it and felt easier when my gaze rested elsewhere. Straight before us the entrance to the next room opened between the pillars of the temple door. The doorway was fitted with two gates of iron grillwork heavily gilded. Behind the arabesqued iron hung curtains of royal purple silk. At a sign from the usher we seated ourselves on the inlaid bench and faced the closed iron lattice. "'I say!' de Grandin exclaimed in an irritable voice. "'When you have done inspecting us, madame, kindly have the goodness to admit us. We have urgent business elsewhere.' To me, he whispered, "'They do peer at us through the meshes of the curtain. Mordieu, are we beasts at the menagerie to be stared at thus?' As though in answer to his protest, the lights in the room began to grow dimmer. A deep-toned gong sounded somewhere beyond the iron gates, and the grilled doors swung back, disclosing a darkened room beyond. "'Enter!' a deep, sepulchral voice bade us, and we stepped across the threshold of Madame Naira's consultation room. The place was pitch dark for the purple curtain fell behind us, shutting out all light from the room we had left. I stood stock still, attempting vainly to pierce the enveloping darkness with my gaze, and it seemed as though an icy wind were blowing on my face, a chilling wind like the draft from a long disused tunnel. Subtly, too, the odor of sandalwood and acrid tang of frankincense was wafted to my nostrils, and in the darkness before me the faint, phosphorescent glow of a cold, green-blue light became visible. Slowly the luminosity spread, gradually taking form. Through the dark it shone, cold and hard as a far-distant star viewed on a frosty night, assuming the shape of an ancient coffin. Now the effulgence gained in strength till we could make out an upright figure in the mummy case, the figure of a woman garbed in a straight-hanging robe of silk tissue thickly sewn with silver sequins. Her hands were crossed above her breast, and her face was bowed upon them, so that all we could observe at first was the whiteness of her arms and shoulders and the blackness of her hair, piled coil on coil in a high coronal. As the light increased we saw her bare feet rested on the center of a horizontal crescent moon, the horns of which extended upward on each side of her. The breeze which blew through the dark increased its force. We could hear the flutter of the silken curtain behind us as the prophetess raised her head and stepped majestically from her coffin, advancing toward us with a lithe, silent movement, which somehow reminded me of the tread of a great graceful leopardess. By now the increasing light enabled us to see the woman's face was hidden in a sequin-spangled veil of the same material as her robe, and that her brows were bound with a diadem of blue-green enamel, fashioned in the form of a pair of backward-bent hawk-wings, and bearing the circular symbol of the sun at its centre. "'Morbleu!' I heard de Grandin murmur. "'Are we at this circus, perhaps?' Seemingly unaware of our presence, the veiled woman glided noiselessly across the room, till she stood a scant two yards from us extended one of her white jewel-decked arms, and motioned us to be seated. Simultaneously a crystal sphere suddenly appeared in the dark before her, glowing with cold inward fire like a monster opal, and she sank to rest in a carved chair, her long sinuous hands hovering and darting in fantastic gestures about and above the crystal. On each fore and little finger there gleamed a green jeweled ring, so that her writhing hands looked, for all the world, like a pair of green-eyed serpents weaving a saraband in the purple dark. "'I see,' she intoned in a rich contralto voice, "'I see a man who vaunts his learning, a man who dares pit his puny strength against the powers which were old when Cronos himself was young.' I warn that man to meddle not 
with what does not concern him. I warn him not to interfere in behalf of the wife who has been put away, or cross the path of one who draws her strength from the ancient goddess of Bubastis. Away with you, rash upstart! One of her long jewelled hands suddenly rose and pointed through the shadows at de Grandin. Back to your test tubes and your retorts, your puny science and punier learning. Go give your aid to the sick and the ailing, but espouse not the cause of the woman who has been cursed by Bast, or your life shall pay the forfeit. Like the closing of an eyelid, the light in the crystal and the paler light about the mummy case went out, leaving the room in total blackness. There came a greater gust of air than any we had yet felt, and with it an overpowering, cloying sweetness, which stifled our breath and made our eyes smart like fumes from burning pepper. Caesar, friend Trowbridge! I heard de Grandin cry, then fall to coughing and gasping as the sharp, penetrating fumes attacked his mucous membranes. Something more potent than the darkness blotted out my sight, bringing hot tears to my eyes and smothering the answering hail I would have given. About me the gloom seemed filled with tiny shimmering star points of wicked, dancing light. I reached blindly for the spot where the veiled woman had sat, encountered only empty space, and fell forward on my face, wrenched and racked with a fit of uncontrollable coughing. Somewhere, far, far away, a light was shining, and in the greater distance a voice was calling my name, thinly, ineffectually, like a voice heard dimly in a dream. I sat up, rubbing my stinging eyes, and stared about me. The light which danced and flickered overhead was a city street lamp, and the voice ringing faintly in my ears was the voice of Jules de Grandin. We were sitting, the pair of us, on the curb of East 82nd Street the arc-light laughing down at us through the cold, frosty air of the winter evening. Neither of us had hat or overcoat, and de Grandin's thin white face was already pinched with cold. Nom d'un colimaçon, nom d'un coq, nom de Dieu de nom de Dieu, he chattered through rattling teeth. They have made of us one pair of fools, friend Trowbridge. They have taken us as the fisherman takes the fish of April. Jules de Grandin, you are no more worthy to regard yourself in the mirror. Whew! I breathed, clearing my lungs of the fumes which still hung in them. That was as sharp a trick as I ever saw, de Grandin. There must have been enough chloroform mixed with that incense to have put a dozen men away. I got unsteadily to my feet and looked about me. We were a good two blocks from the house where Madame Naira had hoodwinked us so neatly, though how we came there was more than I knew. Parbleu, yes, he agreed, rising and buttoning his jacket over his breast. We were unconscious before we could so much as call the name of that Monsieur Jacques Robinson. Meantime, I famish with the cold. Can we not obtain suitable clothing? Hm, I answered. It is too late for any of the regular shops to be open, but we might get something to tide us over at one of the second-hand places in Third Avenue. Ah, is it so? he replied. By all means, then, let us do so at once, right away, immediately. Mon Dieu me, I am likely to become a snowman at any minute, allons! A Hebrew gentleman who dealt in cast-off garments eyed us suspiciously, when we entered his musty emporium of relics, but the sight of our money quickly quieted any misgivings he might have entertained, and within half an hour, togged out in garments which almost sent their vendor into fits at their beauty and general excellence, we were seated in a taxicab proceeding toward the railway station. Well, I teased as we concluded our dinner that night. You saw your veiled prophetess. Are you satisfied? Satisfied! He gave me a glare, beside which the fabled basilisk's worst would have been a melting love glance. Par Dieu, we shall see who shall make un sacré singe out of whom before we are through. That woman, that adventuress, she did warn me not to meddle in what was not my affair. Nom d'un veau noir, 
and is not a five hundred franc overcoat, to say nothing whatever of a hundred franc hat, which she stole from me. Are they perhaps not my affair? Morbleu, I shall say they are, my friend. May we, I shall make that fortune teller of the veil eat her words. Cordieu, but she shall eat them to the last crumb, nor will they prove a palatable meal for her either. You've got to admit she drew first blood, anyhow, I replied with a laugh. That is true, he agreed, nodding gravely. But attend me, my friend, he bleeds best who bleeds last, I do assure you. He was moody as a bear with a sore head all evening, and morose to the point of surliness the next day. Toward noon he took his hat and coat and left the house abruptly. "'I shall return when I come back,' he told me as he hastened down the steps. It was long after dinner-time when he put in an appearance, but his face wore its usual complacent expression, and though his eyes twinkled now and then with elfish laughter— I could not get him to tell me of his adventures during the day. Early next morning he left the house on another mysterious errand, and the same thing occurred each day during the week. The following Monday he suddenly insisted on my accompanying him to New York, and at his direction we took a taxicab from the Hudson Terminal and drove northward to Columbus Circle, turning in at the entrance of Central Park. Aha, my friend! he replied when I urged him to explain our errand. You shall see what you shall see, and it shall be worth seeing. Presently, as we proceeded toward Cleopatra's needle, he gave me a sharp nudge in the ribs. Observe that moteur yonder, my friend, he commanded, that one of the color of pea soup. Regard the driver and his companion, if you please. Our taxi leaped ahead at his sudden command to the driver, and we passed a long, low, sport-model roadster driven by a young man in a heavy raccoon ulster. There was nothing remarkable about the fellow, except that he seemed more than commonly pleased with himself, but I was forced to admit that it was worth our trip to the city to view his companion. She was dark, dark with that mysterious, compelling beauty not possessed by one woman in a thousand. Despite the chill of the winter wind, her cheeks showed not a touch of color, but were pale with the rich, creamy tint of old parchment, which made her vivid red lips seem all the more brilliant. Her head was small and finely poised, and fitted with a cap of some tawny-hued fur, which nestled snugly to her blue-black hair with the tightness of a turban. Her eyes were long and narrow, and of that peculiar shade of hazel which defies exact classification, being sometimes topaz brown, sometimes sea green. Her lips were full, passionate, and brightly rouged, and her long oval face and prominent cheekbones gave her a decidedly oriental appearance. Patrician she looked, even royal, and mysterious as night-veiled Isis herself. A collar of tawny fur frothed about her slender bare throat, and her shoulders were covered by a coat of some smooth mustard-colored pellage which glistened in the morning sunlight like the back of a seal just emerged from the water. "'By George, she's a beauty,' I admitted. "'But—' "'Yes,' de Grandin elevated his brows interrogatively. "'You did say, but, my friend?' "'I was thinking—' I wouldn't care to have her enmity, I replied. Her claws seem a bit too near the surface, and I'll warrant they're sharp, too. Eh bien, you should know, mon vieux, he replied with a chuckle. You have felt them. What? You mean? Nothing less. The lady is none other than our friend, Madame Naira, the veiled prophetess. And the man? Is Benjamin Penniman, the husband of our client, Madame Penniman. Oh, so he is running about with Madame Naira, I replied. His poor little wife. We'll have him back and on his knees to boot, or Jules de Grandin is a greater fool than Madame Naira made of him the other night, he cut in. Attend me, friend Trowbridge. After our so humiliating fiasco at the house of the prophetess that night, I was like a caged beast who sees her young slain before her eyes. Only desire for revenge actuated me, and I could not think clearly for my madness. Then I calmed myself. Jules de Grandin, 
you great zany, I said to me. If you are to overcome the enemy, you must think, and to think you must have the clear brain. Control yourself. And so I did. I went to New York and proceeded to play detective on the trail of this unfaithful husband. Where he went, I went. When he stopped, I stopped. Parbleu, but he led me a merry chase. He is active, that one. At last, however, my patience reaped its deserved reward. I did see him go to that accursed house in 82nd Street and come out with that woman. Again and again I did follow him, and always my trail led to the same burrow. Triomphe, I told me. We have at last established this lady's identity. Today I did but bring you to see her, that you might recognize her face without its veil. Tonight we begin our work of turning her temporary victory into crushing defeat. How are you going to pay her off? I asked. Name her as correspondent in a divorce suit? No, 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 he grinned at me. All in good time, my friend. I have first planned my work. You shall now observe me as I work my plan. This very night I do begin. Nor could I get any further information from him. For three consecutive nights de Grandin watched our telephone as a cat mounts vigil over a rat hole. On the fourth night, as we were preparing to go upstairs to bed, the bell rang, and he snatched the receiver from the hook before the little clapper had ceased to vibrate against the gongs. Hello, hello, he called excitedly through the mouthpiece. But yes, most certainly, immediately, at once, right away. Trowbridge, my friend, come with me. Come and see the game we have caught in our trap. Death of my life, but that Madame Penniman is one clever woman. Waving away my questions, he hustled me into hat and coat and fairly dragged me to the automobile, urging more and more speed as we bowled along the road to the Penniman house. Disdaining to knock, he burst the front door open and hurried up the stairs, turning unerringly down the upper hall and pushing open the first door to the right. An amazing scene greeted us. The room was a tastefully furnished bedchamber, pieces of mahogany, well-chosen rugs and shaded lamps giving it the air of intimacy such apartments have at their best. Against the farther wall, opposite the dressing-table, stood a pair of twin beds, and on the nearer one lay the pajama-clad form of the young man we had seen driving in the park a few days before. Obviously he was asleep, and quite as obviously his sleep was troubled, for he tossed and moaned restlessly, turning his head from side to side on the pillow, and once or twice attempting to rise to a sitting posture. In the niche beside the windows, beside the telephone table, crouched Mrs. Penniman, clad in a negligee of orchid silk, her frightened eyes turning now on her sleeping husband, now on something which occupied the center of the room. I followed her gaze as it swerved from the man on the bed and gasped in astonishment, then rubbed my eyes in wonder and gasped again. A circle of holly leaves, some six feet in diameter, lay upon the rug, and within it, half nebulous like a ghost, but plainly visible, cowered the form of Madame Naira, the veiled prophetess. She was clad as we had first seen her, in a diaphanous one-piece garment of midnight blue silk, encrusted with tiny bright metal plates, and on her head was the crown of Egypt's royalty. But the veil was gone from her face, and if ever I beheld loathsome inhuman hatred on human countenance, it sat upon the beautiful features of the fortune-teller. Her green eyes were no longer narrow, but opened to their greatest compass, round and flashing with fury, and her red mouth was squared like the grimacing of an old Greek tragic mask, or those hideous carved heads made by the natives of Fiji. Now she extended her hands, long, slender, and red-nailed, and now she beat her breasts with clenched fists. Again she opened her vivid lips, and emitted gurgling sounds, like the moanings of an enraged cat, or hissed with a sibilant spitting noise, as though she were in very truth a cat and no woman at all. Très bien, madame, de Grandin bowed to Mrs. Penniman. I see you have caught the marauder. He turned nonchalantly to the hissing fury inside the circle of holly-leaves. 
I believe you did warn me not to pit my strength, my puny strength, against one who drew her power from the goddess of Bubastis, he asked mockingly. You have some further warnings to give, n'est-ce pas, madame? Let me go, let me go, she begged, stretching her hands out to him supplicatingly. Eh, what is this? You do beg deliverance of me? he replied in mock misunderstanding. Were you not about to forfeit my so worthless life if I continued to espouse the cause of the wife who had been put away? Eh bien, madame Cat, you purr a different tune tonight, it would seem. Benjamin, Benjamin, the prisoned woman screamed. Help me, my husband, my lover. See by the ring I hold you with, I implore your aid. The man on the bed stirred uneasily and moaned in his sleep, but did not wake or rise. I fear my puny science has bested you, Madame Cat, de Grandin put in. Your husband lover is bound in a spell which I did conjure up from a bottle, and not all your magic can overcome it. Seek no help from him. I, Jules de Grandin, rule here. With that his cloak of sarcasm fell from him, and he faced her with a visage as savage and implacable as her own. You, you would come into honest women's houses and take their men. He fairly spat at her. You would thrust your unclean magic between a man and the mother-to-be of his child. You, mon Dieu, you would steal the hat and coat of Jules de Grandin. Look not for mercy from me. Till cock-crow I shall hold you here, and then... He elevated his shoulders in an expressive shrug. No, not that, she begged, and her voice sank from a wail to a whimper. See, I will give back his ring. I will release him from my charm. Only let me go. Let me go. I make no promises to such as you, he responded. But the self-satisfied twinkle in his little blue eyes, and the half-checked gesture of his right hand as it rose to caress his trimly waxed blonde moustache, betrayed him. The woman redoubled her entreaties. She sank to her knees and lowered her forehead to the floor. Master! she exclaimed. I am your slave, your conquest. You have won. Show me mercy, and I will swear by the head of Bast, my mother, never to trouble this man or this woman again. Tiens. This time his hand would not be denied. It rose automatically to his mustache and tweaked the waxed end viciously. Give back the ring, then, and go in peace. "'and make sure that you send us those hats and those overcoats "'which you did so unwisely steal from us.' "'She tossed a heavy gold seal ring across the intervening hedge of holly, "'and de Grandin bent forward, retrieving the trinket, "'before he displaced one of the green twigs with the toe of his boot. "'There was a noise like steam escaping from an overheated tea-kettle.' and the woman on the floor seemed suddenly to elongate, to draw out into a vapory nothingness, and vanish like a puff of smoke before a freshening breeze. Here, madame, de Grandin bowed gallantly, French fashion, from the hips, as he extended the seal to Mrs. Penniman. Do you place this upon your husband's finger, and bid him be more careful in future? He will wake anon and have no memory of the thraldom in which he has been held. Blame him not. He signed himself into slavery to a thing which was old and very wicked, when time was still a youth. Mrs. Penniman bent above her husband and slipped the golden circlet on the little finger of his left hand, then leaned forward and kissed him on the mouth. My boy, my poor sweet boy, she murmured as gently as a mother might croon above her babe. "'Isn't he wonderful?' she asked de Grandin. "'Undoubtlessly, madame,' the Frenchman agreed with a quick bow. "'Did he not have the rare judgment to pick you for a helpmeet? "'But me, I think I am a little wonderful, too.' He twisted first one, then the other end of his moustache, till the waxed points stood out from his lips, like the whiskers of a belligerent tomcat. Of course you are. You're a darling. 
she agreed enthusiastically, and before he was aware of her intention, she put her hands upon his shoulders and kissed him soundly first on one cheek, then the other, finally upon the lips. Pardieu, friend Trowbridge, I think it is high time we did leave these reunited lovers together, he exclaimed, his little eyes dancing like sunlight reflected on running water. Come, my friend, let us go. Allez-vous-en. Bonne nuit, madame. For the love of heaven, de Grandin, I demanded as we drove home. What have I been seeing, or have I dreamed at all? Was that really Madame Naira in the Penniman's bedroom, and if it were— Ha! He gave a short, delighted laugh. Did I not tell you you should see what you should see, and that it would be worth seeing? Never mind the showmanship, I cut in. Just explain all this crazy business, if you can. Eh bien, that can also be arranged, he replied. Listen, my friend, the average man will tell you there are no such things as witches, and he will perhaps be right in the main, but he will also be wrong. From the very birth of time there have been forces, evil forces, parbleu, which the generality of men wisely forbore to understand or to know, but which a few sought out and allied themselves with for their own wicked advantage. These gods of ancient times, now, what were they but such forces? Nothing. Zeus, Apollo, Osiris, Ta, Isis, Bast— such things are but names. They describe certain vaguely understood, but none the less potent forces. Pardieu, there is no God but God, my friend. The rest are who knows what. Now, when your countrymen hanged each other in Salem Town in the winter of 1692, they undoubtedly killed many innocent persons. But their basic idea was right. There were then, there have always been, and there still are certain servants of that evil entity, or combination of entities, which we call Satan. This Madame Naira, she was one. Cordieu, she was a very great one indeed. In some way, I know not how, she had become adept in using certain principles of evil for her ends, and set up in business as a fortune-teller in the world's richest city. Before our time there were thousands such in Thebes, Babylon, Ilium, and Rome. Always these evil ones follow the course of the river of gold. And you mean to tell me Penniman actually married her when he put his ring on that statue's hand? I asked incredulously. Mais non, he did not wed her, for true marriage is a spiritual linking of the souls, my friend. But he did put himself in her power. For when he had gone, she took the ring he left and kept it, and having such an intimately personal possession of his, she also acquired a powerful hold on its owner. The first clue I had to the true state of affairs was when Madame Penniman related the incident of this strange woman's appearance in her chamber. Already she had told of the incident of the missing ring, and when she declared her husband exclaimed, Second! Second! In his sleep, as the sorceress bent over him, at once I knew that what he said was not second, but Sechet, which is another name for Bast, the cat-headed goddess. Very good, I tell me. We have here a votary of that cruel half-woman, half-cat, which reigned in olden times along the banks of the Nile. We shall see how we can defeat her. I then undertook to ascertain what the young Penniman did while he neglected his wife. Parbleu, his time and money were lavished like water on that veiled woman, for whose smile he forsook her he had sworn to love and cherish. Then there really was a liaison between him and Madame Naira? I asked. Yes, yes and no, he replied ambiguously. For the touch of her lower lip he would have walked barefoot over miles of broken glass, yet he knew not what he did while doing it. His state was something akin to that of one under hypnosis, conscious of his acts and deeds while doing them, entirely unaware of them afterward. A sort of externally induced amnesia it was. These things puzzled me much, but still I was unwilling to concede the woman possessed more than ordinary powers. We shall see this veiled prophetess, I tell me. Friend Trowbridge and I shall interview her under assumed names, 
and prove to ourselves that she is but a charlatan. Eh bien, we did see much. We did see the loss of our hats and overcoats. But if Madame Naira knew at once who you were and that you were fighting her, how was it she could not avoid the trap? And by the way, what was that trap? I demanded. I cannot say, he responded. Perhaps there are limitations on her powers of divination. It may well be that she could read my thoughts even to my name, when we were face to face, yet could not project herself through space to observe what I planned while away from her. Were not those other witches of olden times unable to say when the officers of the law were descending on them, and so were taken to perish at the stake? As for the trap we set, my friend, it was simple. That was not the veiled prophetess herself you did behold in Madame Penniman's room, but her simulacrum, her projection. It is possible for those people, by taking thought, to project their likenesses at great distances, but always they must be where there is sympathetic atmosphere. This the witch-woman already had, because she had bound Benjamin Penniman in her spell. At will she could assume the likeness of herself in his room, or anywhere he happened to be, while her living body lay as though locked in sleep miles away. That explains how it is she vanished so mysteriously, after warning Madame Penniman on her previous visits. But, grâce à Dieu, for all ill there is a remedy, if we can but find it, I bethought me. Is it not likely, I ask me? that the things which charm away those other evil people, the werewolves and the vampires, will also prevent the free movement of the projection of a witch. More bleu, but it is most probable, I reply to me, and so I set about my work. First I did give to Madame Penniman a harmless drug, a hypnotic, to mix with the food and drink of her husband. That will induce a seemingly natural sleep and hold him fast away from the wicked Madame Naira. Very good. The first night the plan did work well, the second and third also. Heretofore this woman have come in her spiritual likeness to charm her lover back when he have returned to his wife. I make sure she will do so again, and I have prepared a barrier which I think she cannot pass. It is made of the wicks of blessed candles— and on it are strung many leaves and twigs of holly, holly, the Christmas bloom, the touch of which is intolerable to evil spirits, and over which they cannot pass. When the projection of Madame Naira comes to Penniman's house tonight, Madame Penniman does surround it suddenly with the ring of holly. Then she calls me. Had it been the real Naira in the flesh, she could have stepped over the holly, but her projection, being spirit and evil spirit at that, was powerless to move. Also, my friend, I well knew that if I did but keep that spiritual seeming of the real Naira away from her body until the crowing of the cock, it might have great difficulty in returning to its habitation, and would, perhaps, be forced to wander forever through space. The flesh of Madame Naira would, as we say, die, for there would be no spirit to animate it. Therefore I was in position to bargain with her, to force her to give back the ring she stole by trick from the young Penniman, and to quit the house and the lives of those young people forevermore. But why didn't you keep her in the holly circle if what you say is true? I asked. Surely she would be better dead. What? he demanded. And leave her evil spirit, freed from the bonds of flesh, to walk the earth by night? Not I, my friend. In the flesh she had certain restrictions. Dying a natural death, she shall probably return to that unpleasant place from whence she came. But had I torn her from her body by force, she would have still held the young Penniman beneath her spell, and that would have meant death or worse for him. No, my friend, I did act for the best, I assure you. Brr! He shivered and pulled a comic face as I brought the car to a stop before my door. I do still shake like a little wet dog from that experience when she stole my coat, friend Trowbridge, he announced. Come, a long drink of your so excellent sherry before we go to bed. It will start the blood to flowing through my frozen veins once more. The Curse of Everard Maundy
Mordon Shah, I do not like this. Jules de Grandin slammed the evening paper down upon the table and stared ferociously at me through the lamplight. What's up now? I asked, wondering vaguely what the cause of his latest grievance was. Some reporters say something personal about you? Pableau, non. He would better try, the little Frenchman replied, his round blue eyes flashing ominously. Me, I would pull his nose and tweak his ears. But it is not of the reporter's insolence I speak, my friend. I do not like these suicides. There are too many of them. Of course there are, I conceded soothingly. One suicide is that much too many. People have no right to— Ah, bah! he cut in. You do misapprehend me, mon vieux. Excuse me one moment, if you please. He rose hurriedly from his chair and left the room. A moment later I heard him rummaging about in the cellar. In a few minutes he returned, the week's supply of discarded newspapers salvaged from the dustbin in his arms. "'Now attend me,' he ordered as he spread the sheets out before him and began scanning the columns hastily. "'Here is an item from Monday's journal. Two motorists die while driving cars.' The impulse to end their lives apparently attacked two automobile drivers on the Albemarle Turnpike near Lonesome Swamp, two miles out of Harrisonville, last night. Carl Plants, thirty-one years old, of Martins Falls, took his own life by shooting himself in the head with a shotgun while seated in his automobile, which he had parked at the roadside where the pike passes nearest the swamp. His remains were identified by two letters— one addressed to his wife, the other to his father, Joseph Plants, with whom he was associated in the real estate business at Martin's Falls. A check for three hundred dollars and several other papers found in his pockets completed identification. The letters, which merely declared his intention to kill himself, failed to establish any motive for the act. Almost at the same time, and within a hundred yards of the spot where Plants's body was found by State Trooper Henry Anderson this morning, the body of Henry William Nixon of New Rochelle, New York, was discovered partly sitting, partly lying on the rear seat of his automobile, an empty bottle of windshield cleaner lying on the floor beside him. It is thought this liquid, which contained a small amount of cyanide of potassium, was used to inflict death. Police Surgeon Stevens, who examined both bodies, declared that the men had been dead approximately the same length of time when brought to the station house. "'What think you of that, my friend, eh?' de Grandin demanded, looking up from the paper with one of his direct challenging stares. "'Why, uh,' I began, but he interrupted. "'Hear this,' he commanded, taking up a second paper. "'This is from the news of Tuesday.' Mother and daughters die in death pact. Police and heartbroken relatives are today trying to trace a motive for the triple suicide of Mrs. Ruby Westerfelt and her daughters, Joan and Elizabeth, who perished by leaping from the eighth floor of the Hotel Dolores, Newark, late yesterday afternoon. The women registered at the hotel under assumed names, went immediately to the room assigned them, and ten minutes later Miss Gladys Walsh, who occupied a room on the fourth floor, was startled to see a dark form hurtle past her window. A moment later a second body flashed past on its downward flight, and as Miss Walsh, horrified, rushed toward the window, a loud crash sounded outside. Looking out, Miss Walsh saw the body of a third woman, partly impaled on the spikes of a balcony rail. Miss Walsh sought to aid the woman. As she leaned from her window and reached out with a trembling arm, she was greeted by a scream. Don't try. I won't be saved. I must go with mother and sister. A moment later the woman had managed to free herself from the restraining iron spikes and fell to the cement areaway four floors below. And here is still another account, this one from tonight's paper, he continued, unfolding the sheet which had caused his original protest. High school co-ed takes life in attic. The family and friends of Edna May McCarty, fifteen-year-old co-ed of Harrisonville High School, are at a loss to assign a cause for her suicide early this morning. The girl had no love affairs, as far as is known, and had not failed in her examinations. 
On the contrary, she had passed the school's latest test with flying colors. Her mother told investigating police officials that overstudy might have temporarily unbalanced the child's mind. Miss McCarty's body was found suspended from the rafters of her father's attic by her mother this morning, when the young woman did not respond to a call for breakfast, and could not be found in her room on the second floor of her house. A clothesline, used to hang clothes which were dried inside the house in rainy weather, was used to form the fatal noose. "'Now then, my friend,' de Grandin reseated himself and lighted a vile-smelling French cigarette, puffing furiously, till the smoke surrounded his sleek blond head like a mephitic nimbus. "'What have you to say to those reports? Am I not right? Are there not too many, more due entirely too many, suicides in our city?' "'All of them weren't committed here,' I objected practically. "'And besides, there couldn't very well be any connection between them. "'Mrs. Westerfelt and her daughters carried out a suicide pact, it appears, "'but they certainly could have had no understanding with the two men and the young girl. "'Perhaps, maybe, possibly,' he agreed, "'nodding his head so vigorously that a little column of ash detached itself from his cigarette "'and dropped unnoticed on the bosom of his stiffly starched evening shirt. "'You may be right, friend Trowbridge.' But then, as is so often the case, you may be entirely wrong. One thing I know, I, Jules de Grandin, shall investigate these cases myself, personally. Cordieu, they do interest me. I shall ascertain what is the what here. Go ahead, I encouraged. The investigation will keep you out of mischief. And I return to the second chapter of Haggard's The Wanderer's Necklace, a book which I have read at least half a dozen times yet find as fascinating at each re-reading as when I first perused its pages. The matter of the six suicides still bothered him next morning. "'Trowbridge, my friend,' he asked abruptly as he disposed of his second helping of coffee and passed his cup for replenishment. "'Why is it that people destroy themselves?' "'Oh,' I answered evasively. "'Different reasons, I suppose.' Some are crossed in love, some meet financial reverses, and some do it while temporarily deranged. Yes, he agreed thoughtfully. Yet every self-murderer has a real or fancied reason for quitting the world, and there is apparently no reason why any of these six poor ones who hurled themselves into outer darkness during the past week should have done so. All, apparently, were well provided for. None of them, as far as is known, had any reason to regret the past or fear the future. Yet, he shrugged his narrow shoulders significantly, voila, they are gone. At the Faculté de Médecine Légale and the Sûreté in Paris, we keep most careful statistics not only on the number, but on the manner of suicides. I do not think your Frenchman differs radically from your American when it comes to taking his life, so the figures for one nation may well be a signpost for the other. These self-inflicted deaths, they are not right. They do not follow the rules. Men prefer to hang, slash, or shoot themselves. Women favor drowning, poison, or gas. Yet here we have one of the men taking poison, one of the women hanging herself, and three of them jumping to death. Non d'un canard, I am not satisfied with it. Hmm. Neither are the unfortunate parties who killed themselves, if the theologians are to be believed, I returned. You speak right, he returned, then muttered dreamily to himself. Destruction. Destruction of body and imperilment of a soul. Mon oh dear, it is strange. It is not righteous. He disposed of his coffee at a gulp and leaped from his chair. "'I go!' he declared dramatically, turning toward the door. "'Where?' "'Where? Where should I go, if not to secure the history of these so puzzling cases? I shall not rest, nor sleep, nor eat until I have the string of the mystery's skein in my hands.' He paused at the door, a quick elfin smile playing across his usually stern features. "'And should I return before my work is complete?' he suggested. "'I pray you have the excellent Nora prepare another of her so magnificent apple pies for dinner.' 
Forty seconds later the front door clicked shut, and from the dining-room's oriel window I saw his neat little figure, trimly encased in blue chinchilla and grey worsted, pass quickly down the sidewalk, his ebony cane hammering a rapid tattoo on the stones, as it kept time to the thoughts racing through his active brain. "'I am desolated that my capacity is exhausted,' he announced that evening, as he finished his third portion of deep-dish apple pie smothered in pungent rum sauce, and regarded his empty plate sadly. "'Eh bien, perhaps it is as well. Did I eat more, I might not be able to think clearly. And clear thought is what I shall need this night, my friend. Come, we must be going.' "'Going where?' I demanded. "'To hear the reverend and estimable Monsieur Mondi deliver his sermon.' "'Who?' "'Everard Mondy?' "'But, of course, who else?' "'But, uh, but,' I stammered, looking at him incredulously. "'Why should we go to the tabernacle to hear this man? "'I can't say I'm particularly impressed with his system. "'And aren't you a Catholic, de Grandin?' "'Who can say?' he replied as he lighted a cigarette "'and stared thoughtfully at his coffee cup. "'My father was a Huguenot of the Huguenots.' A several times great-grandsire of his cut his way to freedom through the Paris streets on the fateful night of August 24th, 1572. My mother was convent-bred and as pious as anyone with a sense of humour and the gift of thinking for herself could well be. One of my uncles, he for whom I was named, was like a blood-brother to Darwin the Magnificent and Huxley the scarcely less magnificent also. "'Me, I am—' He elevated his eyebrows and shoulders at once, and pursed his lips comically. "'What should a man with such a heritage be, my friend? "'But come, we delay, we tarry, we lose time. "'Let us hasten. "'I have a fancy to bear what this Monsieur Mondi has to say, and to observe him. "'See, I have here tickets for the fourth row of the hall.' "'Very much puzzled,' but never doubting that something more than the idle wish to hear a sensational evangelist urged the little Frenchman toward the tabernacle, I rose and accompanied him. Parbleu, what a day, he sighed, as I turned my car toward the downtown section. From coroner's office to undertakers I have run, and from undertakers to hospitals. I have interviewed everyone who could shed the smallest light on these strange deaths, yet— I seem no further advanced than when I began. What I have found out serves only to whet my curiosity. What I have not discovered. He spread his hands in a world-embracing gesture and lapsed into silence. The Yachin Tabernacle, where the Reverend Everard Mondy was holding his series of non-sectarian revival meetings, was crowded to overflowing when we arrived but our tickets passed us through the jostling crowd of half-skeptical, half-believing people who thronged the lobby, and we were soon ensconced in seats where every word the preacher uttered could be heard with ease. Before the introductory hymn had been finished, de Grandin mumbled a wholly unintelligible excuse in my ear and disappeared up the aisle, and I settled myself in my seat to enjoy the service as best I might. The Reverend Mr. Mondy was a tall, hatchet-faced man in early middle life, a little inclined to rant and make use of worked-over platitudes, but obviously sincere in the message he had for his congregation. From the half-cynical attitude of a regularly enrolled church member who looks on revivals with a certain disdain, I found myself taking keener and keener interest in the story of regeneration the preacher had to tell my attention compelled not so much by his words as by the earnestness of his manner and the wonderful stage presence the man possessed when the ushers had taken up the collection and the final hymn was sung i was surprised to find we had been two hours in the tabernacle if any one had asked me i should have said half an hour would have been nearer the time consumed by the service eh my friend did you find it interesting "'de Grandin asked, as he joined me in the lobby and linked his arm in mine. "'Yes, very,' I admitted, then somewhat sulkily. "'I thought you wanted to hear him, too. "'It was your idea that we came here. "'What made you run away?' 
I am sorry, he replied, with a chuckle which belied his words. But it was necessaire that I fry other fish while you listen to the reverend gentleman's discourse. Will you drive me home? The march wind cut shrewdly through my overcoat after the superheated atmosphere of the tabernacle, and I felt myself shivering involuntarily more than once as we drove through the quiet streets. Strangely, too, I felt rather sleepy and ill at ease. By the time we reached the wide, tree-bordered avenue before my house, I was conscious of a distinctly unpleasant sensation, a constantly growing feeling of malaise, a sort of baseless, irritating uneasiness. Thoughts of years long forgotten seemed summoned to my memory, without rhyme or reason. An incident of an unfair advantage I had taken of a younger boy while at public school. Recollections of petty, useless lies and bits of naughtiness committed, when I could not have been more than three, came flooding back on my consciousness. Finally, an episode of my early youth, which I had forgotten some forty years. My father had brought a little stray kitten into the house, and I, with the tiny lad's unconscious cruelty, had fallen to teasing the wretched bundle of bedraggled fur. Finally, tossing it nearly to the ceiling to test the tale I had so often heard, that a cat always lands on its feet. My experiment was the exception which demonstrated the rule, it seemed, for the poor half-starved feline hit the hardwood floor squarely on its back, struggled feebly a moment, then yielded up its entire ninefold expectancy of life. Long after the smart of the whipping I received in consequence had been forgotten, the memory of that unintentional murder had plagued my boyish conscience, and many were the times I had awakened at dead of night, weeping bitter repentance out upon my pillow. Now, some forty years later, the thought of that kitten's death came back as clearly as the night the unkempt little thing thrashed out its life upon our kitchen floor. Strive as I would, I could not drive the memory from me, and it seemed as though the unwitting crime of my childhood was assuming an enormity out of all proportion to its true importance. I shook my head and passed my hand across my brow, as a sleeper suddenly wakened does to drive away the lingering memory of an unpleasant dream. But the kitten's ghost, like Banquo's, would not down. What is it, friend Trowbridge? de Grandin asked as he eyed me shrewdly. "'Oh, nothing,' I replied as I parked the car before our door and leaped to the curb. "'I was just thinking.' "'Ah?' Huh? he responded on a rising accent. "'And of what do you think, my friend, something unpleasant?' "'Oh, no, nothing important enough to dignify by that term,' I answered shortly, and led the way to the house, keeping well ahead of him lest he push his inquiries farther. In this, however, I did him wrong. Tactful women and Jules de Grandin have the talent of feeling without being told when conversation is unwelcome, and besides wishing me a pleasant good night, he spoke not a word until we had gone upstairs to bed. As I was opening my door, he called down the hall, "'Should you want me, remember you have but to call.' Huh. I muttered ungraciously as I shut the door. Want him? What the devil should I want him for? And so I pulled off my clothes and climbed into bed, the thought of the murdered kitten still with me, and annoying me more by its persistence than by the faint sting of remorse it evoked. How long I had slept I do not know, but I do know I was wide awake in a single second, sitting up in bed and staring through the darkened chamber with eyes which strove desperately to pierce the gloom. Somewhere, whether far or near, I could not tell, a cat had raised its voice in a long-drawn, wailing cry, kept silence a moment, then given tongue again with increased volume. There are few sounds more eerie to hear in the dead of night than the cry of a prowling feline, and this one was of a particularly sad, almost reproachful tone. "'Confound the beast!' I exclaimed angrily, and lay back on my pillow, striving vainly to recapture my broken sleep. Again the wail sounded, indefinite as to location, 
but louder, more prolonged even it seemed, fiercer in its timbre than when I first heard it in my sleep. I glanced toward the window with the vague thought of hurling a book or boot or other handy missile at the disturber, then held my breath in sudden affright. Staring through the aperture between the scrim curtains was the biggest, most ferocious-looking tomcat I had ever seen. Its eyes, seemingly as large as butter dishes, glared at me with the green phosphorescence of its tribe, and with an added demoniacal glow the like of which I had never seen. Its red mouth, open to full compass in a venomous, soundless spit, seemed almost as large as that of a lion, and the wicked pointed ears above its rounded face were laid back against its head, as though it were crouching for combat. "'Get out! Scat!' I called feebly, but making no move toward the thing. <sharp inhale> A hiss of incomparable fury answered me, and the creature put one heavy padded paw tentatively over the window sill, still regarding me with its unchanging, hateful stare. "'Get!' I repeated and stopped abruptly. Before my eyes the great beast was growing— "'increasing in size till its chest and shoulders completely blocked the window. "'Should it attack me, I would be as helpless in its claws "'as a Hindu under the paws of a Bengal tiger. "'Slowly, stealthily, its cushioned feet making no sound "'as it set them down daintily, "'the monstrous creature advanced into the room, "'crouched on its haunches, and regarded me steadily, "'wickedly, malevolently.' I rose a little higher on my elbow. The great brute twitched the tip of its sable tail warningly, half lifted one of its forepaws from the floor, and set it down again, never shifting its sulphurous eyes from my face. Inch by inch I moved my farther foot from the bed, felt the floor beneath it, and pivoted slowly in a sitting position until my other foot was free of the bedclothes. Apparently the cat did not notice my strategy— for it made no menacing move till I flexed my muscles for a leap, suddenly flung myself from the bedstead and leaped toward the door. With a snarl, white teeth flashing, green eyes glaring, ears laid back, the beast moved between me and the exit and began slowly advancing on me, hate and menace in every line of its giant body. I gave ground before it, retreating step by step and striving desperately to hold its eyes with mine, as I had heard hunters sometimes do when suddenly confronted by wild animals. Back, back I crept, the ogreish visitant keeping pace with my retreat, never suffering me to increase the distance between us. I felt the cold draft of the window on my back, the pressure of the sill against me. Behind me, from the waist up, was the open night. Before me, the slowly advancing monster. It was a thirty-foot drop to a cemented roadway, but death on the pavement was preferable to the slashing claws and grinding teeth of the terrible thing creeping toward me. I threw one leg over the sill, watching constantly, lest the cat thing leap on me before I could cheat it by dashing myself to the ground. Trowbridge, mon Dieu! Trowbridge, my friend, what is it you would do? The frenzied hail of Jules de Grandin cut through the dark, and a flood of light from the hallway swept into the room as he flung the door violently open and raced across the room, seizing my arm in both hands and dragging me from the window. "'Look out to Grandin!' I screamed. "'The cat! It'll get you!' "'Cat?' he echoed, looking about him uncomprehendingly. "'Do you say cat, my friend? A cat will get me!' Mordanchou, the cat which can make a mouse of Jules de Grandin, is not yet whelped. Where is it, this cat of yours? There, the— I began, then stopped, rubbing my eyes. The room was empty. Save for de Grandin and me, there was nothing animate in the place. But it was here, I insisted. I tell you, I saw it. A great black cat, as big as a lion— it came in the window and crouched right over there, and was driving me to jump to the ground when you came. Non d'un do you say so? he exclaimed, seizing my arm again and shaking me. Tell me of this cat, my friend. 
I would learn more of this Puss Puss, who comes into friend Trowbridge's house, grows great as a lion, and drives him to his death on the stones below. I think maybe the trail of these mysterious deaths is not altogether lost. Tell me more, mon ami. I would know all, all. Of course it was just a bad dream, I concluded as I finished the recital of my midnight visitation. But it seemed terribly real to me while it lasted. I doubt it not, he agreed with a quick, nervous nod. And on our way from the tabernacle tonight, my friend, I noticed you were much distrait. Were you perhaps feeling ill at the time? Not at all, I replied. The truth is, I was remembering something which occurred when I was a lad four or five years old, something which had to do with the kitten I killed. And I told him the whole wretched business. Hm? he commented when I had done. You're a good man, Trowbridge, my friend. In all your life, since you attained to years of discretion, I do not believe you have done a wicked or ignoble act. Oh, I wouldn't say that, I returned. We all, parbleu, I have said it. That kitten incident now is probably the single tiny skeleton in the entire closet of your existence. Yet sustained thought upon it will magnify even as the cat of your dream grew from cat's to lion's size. Pardieu, my friend, I am not so sure you did dream of that abomination in the shape of a cat which visited you. Suppose— He broke off, staring intently before him, twisting first one, then the other end of his trimly waxed moustache. Suppose what? I prompted. No, we will suppose nothing tonight, he replied. You will please go to sleep once more, my friend and I shall remain in the room to frighten away any more dream demons which may come to plague you. Come, let us sleep. Here I do remain. He leaped into the wide bed beside me and pulled the down comforter snugly up about his pointed chin. And I'd like very much to have you come right over to see her, if you will, Mrs. Weaver finished. I can't imagine whatever made her attempt such a thing. She's never shown any signs of it before. I hung up the telephone receiver and turned to de Grandin. Here's another suicide, or almost suicide, for you, I told him half-teasingly. The daughter of one of my patients attempted her life by hanging in the bathroom this morning. Par la tête bleue, do you tell me so? he exclaimed eagerly. I go with you, cher ami. I see this young woman, I examine her. Perhaps I shall find some key to the riddle there. Pablo, me, I itch, I burn, I am all on fire with this mystery. Certainly there must be an answer to it, but it remains hidden, like a peasant's pig when the tax collector arrives. Well, young lady, what's this I hear about you? I demanded severely, as we entered Grace Weaver's bedroom a few minutes later. What on earth have you to die for? I I don't know what made me want to do it, doctor, the girl replied with a wan smile. I hadn't thought of it before, ever, but I just got to, oh, you know, sort of brooding over things last night, and when I went into the bathroom this morning, something, something inside my head like those ringing noises you hear when you have a head cold, you know, seemed to be whispering, go on, kill yourself, you've nothing to live for. Go on, do it. So I just stood on the scales and took the cord from my bathrobe and tied it over the transom, then knotted the other end about my neck. Then I kicked the scales away and... She gave another faint smile. I'm glad I hadn't locked the door before I did it, she admitted. De Gronda had been staring unwinkingly at her with his curiously level glance throughout her recital. As she concluded, he bent forward and asked, "'This voice which you heard bidding you commit an unpardonable sin, mademoiselle, did you perhaps recognize it?' The girl shuddered. "'No,' she replied, but a sudden paling of her face about the lips gave the lie to her word. "'Pardonnez-moi, mademoiselle,' the Frenchman returned. "'I think you do not tell the truth.' Now whose voice was it, if you please? 
A sullen, stubborn look spread over the girl's features, to be replaced a moment later by the muscular spasm which preludes weeping. It, it sounded like Fanny's, she cried, and turning her face to the pillow, fell to sobbing bitterly. And Fanny, who is she? de Grandin began, but Mrs. Weaver motioned him to silence with an imploring gesture. I prescribed a mild bromide and left the patient, wondering what mad impulse could have led a girl in the first flush of young womanhood, happily situated in the home of parents who idolized her, engaged to a fine young man, and without bodily or spiritual ill of any sort, to attempt her life. Outside, de Grandin seized the mother's arm and whispered fiercely, Who is this Fanny, Madame Weaver? Believe me, I ask not from idle curiosity, but because I seek vital information. Fanny Briggs was Grace's chum two years ago, Mrs. Weaver answered. My husband and I never quite approved of her, for she was several years older than Grace, and had such pronounced modern ideas that we didn't think her a suitable companion for our daughter. But you know how girls are with their crushes. The more we objected to her going with Fanny, the more she used to seek her company. And we were both at our wits' ends when the Briggs girl was drowned while swimming at Asbury Park. I hate to say it, but it was almost a positive relief to us when the news came. Grace was almost broken-hearted about it at first. But she met Charlie this summer, and I haven't heard her mention Fanny's name since her engagement until just now. Huh? De Grandin tweaked the tip of his moustache meditatively. And perhaps Mademoiselle Grace was somewhere to be reminded of Mademoiselle Fanny last night. No, Mrs. Weaver replied. She went with a crowd of young folks to hear Maundy preach. There was a big party of them at the tabernacle. I'm afraid they went more to make fun than in a religious frame of mind. But he made quite an impression on Grace, she told us. Feu de Dieu! de Grandin exploded, twisting his moustache furiously. Do you tell me so, madame? This is of the interest. Madame, I salute you. He bowed formally to Mrs. Weaver, then seized me by the arm and fairly dragged me away. Trowbridge, my friend, he informed me, as we descended the steps of the Weaver portico. This business, it has l'odeur du poisson. How is it you say, uh, the fishy smell? What do you mean? I asked. Pablo, what should I mean, except that we go to interview this Monsieur Everard Mondi immediately, right away at once? Mordieu, I damn think I have the tale of this mystery in my hand, and may the blight of prohibition fall upon France if I do not twist it. The Reverend Everard Mondi's rooms in the Tremont Hotel were not hard to locate, for a constant stream of visitors went to and from them. "'Have you an appointment with Mr. Mondy?' the secretary asked as we were ushered into the anteroom. "'Not we,' de Grandin denied. "'But if you will be so kind as to tell him that Dr. Jules de Grandin of the Paris Sûreté desires to speak with him for five small minutes, I shall be in your debt.' The young man looked doubtful, but de Grandin's steady cat-like stare never wavered, and he finally rose and took our message to his employer. In a few minutes he returned and admitted us to the big room, where the evangelist received his callers behind a wide, flat-topped desk. "'Ah, Mr. de Grandin,' the exhorter began with a professionally bland smile as we entered. "'You are from France, are you not, sir? What can I do to help you toward the light?' "'Cordieu, monsieur,' de Grandin barked, for once forgetting his courtesy and ignoring the preacher's outstretched hand. You can do much. You can explain these so unexplainable suicides which have taken place during the past week, the time you have preached here. That is the light we do desire to see. Mondi's face went mask-like and expressionless. Suicides! Suicides! he echoed. What should I know of— The Frenchman shrugged his narrow shoulders impatiently. We do fence with words, monsieur, he interrupted testily. Behold the facts. Messieurs Plantz and Nixon, young men with no reason for such desperate deeds, 
did kill themselves by violence. Madame Westerfeld and her two daughters, who were happy in their home, as everyone thought, did hurl themselves from an hotel window. A little schoolgirl hanged herself. Last night my good friend Trowbridge, who never understandingly harmed man or beast, and whose life is dedicated to the healing of the sick, did almost take his life. And this very morning a young girl, wealthy, beloved, with every reason to be happy, did almost succeed in dispatching herself. Now, Monsieur le Prédicateur, the only thing this miscellaneous assortment of persons had in common is the fact that each of them did hear you preach the night before, or this same night, he attempted self-destruction. That is the light we seek. Explain us the mystery, if you please. Mondi's lean, rugged face had undergone a strange transformation while the little Frenchman spoke. Gone was his smug, professional smirk, gone the forced and meaningless expression of benignity and in their place a look of such anguish and horror as might rest on the face of one who hears his sentence of damnation read. "'Don't! Don't!' he besought, covering his writhing face with his hands, and bowing his head upon his desk, while his shoulders shook with deep soul-racking sobs. "'Oh, miserable me! My sin has found me out!' For a moment he wrestled in spiritual anguish, then raised his stricken countenance and regarded us with tear-dimmed eyes. "'I am the greatest sinner in the world,' he announced sorrowfully. "'There is no hope for me on earth, or yet in heaven.' De Grandin tweaked the ends of his moustache alternately, as he gazed curiously at the man before us. "'Monsieur,' he replied at length, I think you do exaggerate. There are surely greater sinners than you. But if you would shrive you of the sin which gnaws your heart, I pray you shed what light you can upon these deaths, for there may be more to follow. And who knows that I shall not be able to stop them, if you will but tell me all. Mea culpa, Mondi exclaimed, and struck his chest with his clenched fists like a Hebrew prophet of old. In my younger days, gentlemen, before I dedicated myself to the salvaging of souls, I was a scoffer. What I could not feel or weigh or measure, I disbelieved. I mocked at all religion and sneered at all the things which others held sacred. One night I went to a spiritualistic seance, intent on scoffing, and forced my young wife to accompany me. The medium was an old colored woman, wrinkled, half-blind, and unbelievably ignorant, but she had something, some secret power, which was denied the rest of us. Even I, atheist and derider of the truth that I was, could see that. As the old woman called on the spirits of the departed, I laughed out loud and told her it was a fake. The negress came out of her trance and turned her deep-set, burning old eyes on me. White man, she said, you is going to feel mighty sorry for them words. I tells you, the spirits can hear what you says, and they will take their revenge on you and yours, yes, and on them as follow you, till you wishes your tongue had been cut out before you said them words dis here night. I tried to laugh at her, to curse her for a snivelling old faker but there was something so terrible in her wrinkled old face that the words froze on my lips, and I hurried away. The next night my wife, my young lovely bride, drowned herself in the river, and I have been a marked man ever since. Wherever I go it's the same. God has seen fit to open my eyes to the light of truth and give me words to place his message before his people, and many who come to sneer at me go away believers. But wherever throngs gather to hear me bear my testimony, there are always these tragedies. Tell me, gentlemen, he threw out his hands in a gesture of surrender, must I forever cease to preach the message of the Lord to his people? I have told myself that these self-murders would have occurred whether I came to town or not, but is this a judgment which pursues me forever? Jules de Grandin regarded him thoughtfully. 
monsieur, he murmured, I fear you make the mistakes we are all too prone to make. You do saddle le bon Dieu with all the sins with which the face of man is blackened. What if this were no judgment of heaven, but a curse of a very different sort, eh? You mean the devil might be driving to overthrow the effects of my work? The other asked, a light of hope breaking over his haggard face. Um, perhaps. Let us take that for our working hypothesis, de Grandin replied. At present we may not say whether it be devil or devilkin which dogs your footsteps, but at the least we are greatly indebted to you for what you have told. Go, my friend, continue to preach the truth, as you conceive the truth to be, and may the God of all peoples uphold your hands. Me, I have other work to do, but it may be scarcely less important. He bowed formally, and, turning on his heel, strode quickly from the room. "'That's the most fantastic story I ever heard,' I declared as we entered the hotel elevator. "'The idea! As if an ignorant old negress could put a curse on—' "'Zut!' de Grandin shut me off. "'You are a most excellent physician in the state of New Jersey, friend Trowbridge. But have you ever been in Martinique or Haiti, or in the jungles of the Congo-Belgique?' "'Of course not,' I admitted. "'But I have.' I have seen things so strange among the Vaudois people that you would wish to have me committed to a madhouse did I but relate them to you. However, as that Monsieur Kipling says, that is another story. At the present we are pledged to the solving of another mystery. Let us go to your house. I would think I would consider all this business of the monkey. Pardieu, it has as many angles as a diamond cut in Amsterdam. "'Tell me, friend Trowbridge,' he demanded as we concluded our evening meal, "'have you perhaps among your patients some young man who has met with a great sorrow recently, "'someone who has sustained a loss of wife or child or parents?' "'I looked at him in amazement, but the serious expression on his little heart-shaped face "'told me he was in earnest, not making some ill-timed jest at my expense.' "'Why, yes,' I responded. "'There is young Alvin Spence. "'His wife died in childbirth last June, "'and the poor chap has been half beside himself ever since. "'Thank God I was out of town at the time "'and didn't have the responsibility of the case.' "'Thank God, indeed,' de Grandin nodded gravely. "'It is not easy for us, "'though we do ply our trade among the dying, "'to tell those who remain behind of their bereavement. "'But this Monsieur Spence... Will you call on him this evening? Will you give him a ticket to the lecture of Monsieur Mondi? No! I blazed, half rising from my chair. I've known that boy since he was a little toddler, knew his dead wife from childhood, too, and if you're figuring on making him the subject of some experiment— Softly, my friend, he besought. There is a terrible thing loose among us. Remember the noble martyrs of science, those so magnificent men who risked their lives that yellow fever and malaria should be no more. Was not their work a holy one? Certainly. I do but wish that this young man may attend the lecture to-night, and on my honour I shall guard him until all danger of attempted self-murder is past. You will do what I say? He was so earnest in his plea that— though I felt like an accessory before the fact in a murder, I agreed. Meantime his little blue eyes, snapping and sparkling with the zest of the chase, de Grandin had busied himself with the telephone directory, looking up a number of addresses, culling through them, discarding some, adding others, until he had obtained a list of some five or six. Now, mon vieux, he begged as I made ready to visit Alvin Spence on my treacherous errand, I would that you convey me to the rectory of St. Benedict's Church. The priest in charge there is Irish, and the Irish have the gift of seeing things which you colder-blooded Saxons may not. I must have a confab with this good Father O'Brien before I can permit that you interview the young Monsieur Spence. Mon Dieu me, I am a scientist, no murderer. 
I drove him past the rectory and parked my motor at the curb, waiting impatiently while he thundered at the door with the handle of his ebony walking stick. His knock was answered by a little old man in clerical garb, and a face as round and ruddy as a winter apple. De Grandin spoke hurriedly to him in a low voice, waving his hands, shaking his head, shrugging his shoulders, as was his wont when the earnestness of his argument bore him before it. The priest's round face showed first incredulity, then mild skepticism, finally absorbed interest. In a moment the pair of them had vanished inside the house, leaving me to cool my heels in the bitter March air. "'You were long enough,' I grumbled as he emerged from the rectory. "'Pardieu, yes, just long enough,' he agreed. "'I did accomplish my purpose, and no visit is either too long or too short when you can say that. Now, to the house of the good Monsieur Spence, if you will. Mordieu, but we shall see what we shall see this night.' Six hours later de Grandin and I crouched, shivering at the roadside, where the winding, serpentine Albemarle Pike dips into the hollow beside the lonesome swamp. The wind, which had been trenchant as a shrew's tongue earlier in the evening, had died away, and a hard, dull bitterness of cold hung over the hills and hollows of the rolling countryside. From the wide salt marshes, where the bay's tide crept up to mingle with the swamp's brackish waters twice a day, there came great sheets of brumous, impenetrable vapor, which shrouded the landscape and distorted commonplace objects into hideous, gigantic monstrosities. More d'un petit bonhomme, my friend, de Grandin commented between chattering teeth. I do not like this place. It has an evil air. There are spots where the very earth does breathe of unholy deeds, and by the sacred name of a rooster, this is one such. Look you at this accursed fog. Is it not as if the spectres of those drowned at sea were marching up the shore this night? Hm, I replied, sinking my neck lower in the collar of my ulster, and silently cursing myself for a fool. A moment's silence, then— you are sure Monsieur Spence must come this way? There is no other road by which he can reach his home. Of course not, I answered shortly. He lives out in the new Weiss development with his mother and sister. You were there this evening, and this is the only direct motor route to the subdivision from the city. Ah, that is well, he replied, hitching the collar of his greatcoat higher about his ears. You will recognize his car, surely? I'll try to, I promised. But you can't be sure of anything on a night like this. I'd not guarantee to pick out my own. There's somebody pulling up beside the road now. I interrupted myself as a roadster came to an abrupt halt and stood panting, its headlights forming vague, luminous spots in the haze. May we, he agreed. And no one stops at this spot for any good until it has been conquered. Come, let us investigate. He started forward, body bent, head advanced, like a motion picture conception of an Indian on the warpath. Half a hundred stealthy steps brought us abreast of the parked car. Its occupant was sitting back on the driving seat, his hands resting listlessly on the steering wheel, his eyes upturned, as though he saw a vision in the trailing wisps of fog before him. I needed no second glance to recognize Alvin Spence, though the rapt look upon his white, set face transfigured it almost beyond recognition. He was like a poet beholding the beatific vision of his mistress, or a medieval Eremite gazing through the opened portals of paradise. <sighs> De Grandin's whisper cut like a wire-edged knife through the silence of the fog-bound air. Do you behold it, friend Trowbridge? What? I whispered back, but broke the syllable half uttered. Thin, tenuous, scarcely to be distinguished from the lazily drifting festoons of the fog itself, there was a something in mid-air before the car where Alvin Spence sat with his yearning soul looking from his eyes. I seemed to see clear through the thing, yet its outlines were plainly perceptible. And as I looked and looked again, 
I recognized the unmistakable features of Dorothy Spence, the young man's dead wife. Her body, if the tenuous, ethereal mass of static vapor could be called such, was bare of clothing, and seemed imbued with a voluptuous grace and allure the living woman had never possessed. But her face was that of the young woman who had lain in Rosedale Cemetery for three-quarters of a year. If ever living man beheld the simulacrum of the dead, we three gazed on the wraith of Dorothy Spence that moment. "'Dorothy! My beloved! My dear! My dear!' The man half whispered, half sobbed, stretching forth his hands to the spirit woman, then falling back on the seat as the vision seemed to elude his grasp when a sudden puff of breeze stirred the fog. We could not catch the answer he received, close as we stood, but we could see the pale, curving lips frame the single word, Come, and saw the transparent arms stretched out to beckon him forward. The man half rose from his seat, then sank back, set his face in sudden resolution, and plunged his hand into the pocket of his overcoat. Beside me de Grandin had been fumbling with something in his inside pocket. As Alvin Spence drew forth his hand, and the dull gleam of a polished revolver shone in the light from his dashboard lamp, the Frenchman leaped forward like a panther. "'Stop him, friend Trowbridge!' he called shrilly, and to the hovering vision, Avaunt, accursed one! Be gone, thou exile from heaven! Away, snake spawn! As he shouted, he drew a tiny pellet from his inner pocket and hurled it point blank through the vaporous body of the spectre. Even as I seized Spence's hand and fought with him for possession of the pistol, I saw the transformation from the tail of my eye. As de Grandin's missile tore through its unsubstantial substance, the vision woman seemed to shrink in upon herself, to become suddenly more compact, thinner, scrawny. Her rounded bosom, flattened to mere folds of leather-like skin, stretched drum-tight above her staring ribs. Her slender, graceful hands were horrid, claw-tipped talons, and the yearning, enticing face of Dorothy Spence became a mask of hideous, implacable hate, great-eyed, thin-lipped, beak-nosed, such a face as the demons of hell might show after a million million years of burning in the infernal fires. A screech like the keening of all the owls in the world together split the fog-wrapped stillness of the night, and the monstrous thing before us seemed suddenly to shrivel, shrink to a mere spot of baleful phosphorescent fire, and disappear like a snuffed-out candle's flame. Spence saw it, too. The pistol dropped from his nerveless fingers to the car's floor with a soft thud, and his arm went limp in my grasp as he fell forward in a dead faint. Pableu, de Grandin swore softly as he climbed into the unconscious lad's car. Let us drive forward, friend Trowbridge. We will take him home and administer a soporific. He must sleep, this poor one or the memory of what we have shown him will rob him of his reason. So we carried Alvin Spence to his home, administered a hypnotic, and left him in the care of his wandering mother, with instructions to repeat the dose if he should wake. It was a mile or more to the nearest bus station, and we set out at a brisk walk, our heels hitting sharply against the frosty concrete of the road. "'What in the world was it, de Grandin?' I asked, as we marched in step down the darkened highway. "'It was the most horrible—' "'Pableu,' he interrupted. "'Someone comes this way in a monstrous hurry.' His remark was no exaggeration. Driven as though pursued by all the furies from pandemonium, came a light motor-car with plain black sides and a curving top. "'Look out!' the driver warned as he recognized me and came to a bumping halt. Look out, Dr. Trowbridge, it's walking! It got out and walked! De Grandin regarded him with an expression of comic bewilderment. Now what is it that walks, mon brave? he demanded. Mon Dieu, you chatter like a monkey with a handful of hot chestnuts. What is it that walks, and why must we look out for it, eh? Sile Gregory, the young man answered. 
He died this morning, and Mr. Johnson took him to the parlors to fix him up and sent me and Joe Williams out with him this evening. I was just driving up to the house, and Joe hopped out to give me a lift with the casket, and old Silas got up and walked away, and Mr. Johnson embalmed him this morning, I tell you. Non d'un chou-fleur, de Grandin shot back. And where did this so remarkable demonstration take place, mon vieux? Also, what of the excellent Williams, your partner? I don't know, and I don't care, the other replied. When a dead corpse I saw embalmed this morning gets out of its casket and walks, I ain't going to wait for nobody. Jump up here if you want to go with me. I ain't going to stay here no longer. Bien, de Grandin acquiesced. Go your way, my excellent one. Should we encounter your truant corpse, we will direct him to his waiting bière. The young man waited no second invitation, but started his car down the road at a speed which would bring him into certain trouble if observed by a state trooper. Now what the devil do you make of that? I asked. I know Johnson, the funeral director, well, and I always thought he had a pretty level-headed crowd of boys about his place. But if that lad hasn't been drinking some powerful liquor, I'll be— Not necessarily, my friend, de Grandin interrupted. I think it not at all impossible that he tells but this sober truth. It may well be that the dead do walk this road to-night. I shivered with something other than the night's chill as he made the matter-of-fact assertion, but forbore pressing him for an explanation. There are times when ignorance is a happier portion than knowledge. We had marched perhaps another quarter-mile in silence when de Grandin suddenly plucked my sleeve. "'Have you noticed nothing, my friend?' he asked. "'What do you mean?' I demanded sharply, for my nerves were worn tender by the night's events. "'I am not certain, but it seems to me we are followed.' "'Followed nonsense! Who would be following us?' I returned, unconsciously stressing the personal pronoun, for I had almost said, "'What would follow us?' and the implication raised by the impersonal form sent tiny shivers racing along my back and neck. De Grandin cast me a quick appraising glance, and I saw the ends of his spiked moustache lift suddenly as his lips framed a sardonic smile. But instead of answering, he swung round on his heel and faced the shadows behind us. "'Hola, monsieur le cadavre,' he called sharply. "'Here we are, and son du diable.' Here we shall stand. I looked at him in open-mouthed amazement, but his gaze was turned steadfastly on something half seen in the mist which lay along the road. Next instant my heart seemed pounding through my ribs, and my breath came hot and choking in my throat, for a tall, gangling man suddenly emerged from the fog and made for us at a shambling gait. He was clothed in a long, old-fashioned, double-breasted frock-coat and stiffly starched shirt, topped by a standing collar and white ministerial tie. His hair was neatly, though somewhat unnaturally, arranged in a central part, above a face the color and smoothness of wax, and little flecks of talcum powder still clung here and there to his eyebrows. No mistaking it. Johnson, artist that he was, had arrayed the dead farmer in the manner of all his kind for their last public appearance before relatives and friends. One look told me the horrible, incredible truth. It was the body of old Silas Gregory which stumbled toward us through the fog. Dressed, greased and powdered for its last long rest, the thing came toward us with faltering, uncertain strides, and I noticed— with the sudden ability for minute inventory fear sometimes lends our senses, that his old sunburned skin showed more than one brand where the formaldehyde embalming fluid had burned it. In one long, thin hand the horrible thing grasped the helve of a farmyard axe. The other hand lay stiffly folded across the midriff, as the embalmer had placed it when his professional ministrations were finished that morning. "'My God!' I cried, shrinking back toward the roadside. But de Grandin ran forward to meet the charging horror, with a cry which was almost like a welcome. "'Stand clear, friend Trowbridge,' he warned. "'We will fight this to a finish, I and it.' 
His little round eyes were flashing with the zest of combat. His mouth was set in a straight, uncompromising line beneath the sharply waxed ends of his diminutive mustache, and his shoulders hunched forward like those of a practiced wrestler before he comes to grips with his opponent. With a quick whipping motion, he ripped the razor-sharp blade of his sword cane from its ebony sheath and swung the flashing steel in a whirring circle about his head, then sank to a defensive posture, one foot advanced, one retracted, the leg bent at the knee, the triple-edged sword dancing before him like the darting tongue of an angry serpent. The dead thing never faltered in its stride. Three feet or so from Jules de Grandin, it swung the heavy, rust-encrusted axe above its shoulder and brought it downward, its dull, lackluster eyes staring straight before it, with an impassivity more terrible than any glare of hate. Saha! De Grandin's blade flickered forward like a streak of storm lightning and fleshed itself to the hilt in the corpse's shoulder. He might as well have struck his steel into a bag of meal. The axe descended with a crushing, devastating blow. De Grandin leaped nimbly aside, disengaging his blade and swinging it again before him, but an expression of surprise, almost of consternation, was on his face. I felt my mouth go dry with excitement, and a queer, weak feeling hit me at the pit of the stomach. The Frenchman had driven his sword home with the skill of a practiced fencer and the precision of a skilled anatomist. His blade had pierced the dead man's body at the junction of the short head of the biceps and the great pectoral muscle, at the coracoid process, inflicting a wound which should have paralyzed the arm. Yet the terrible axe rose for a second blow, as though de Grandin's steel had struck wide of the mark. Huh? De Grandin nodded understandingly as he leaped backward, avoiding the axe blade by the breadth of a hair. Bien, à la fin. His defensive tactics changed instantly. Flickeringly, his sword lashed forward, then came down and back with a sharp whipping motion. The keen edge of the angular blade bit deeply into the corpse's wrist, laying bare the bone. Still the axe rose and fell and rose again. Slash after slash de Grandin gave, his slicing cuts falling with almost mathematical precision in the same spot, shearing deeper and deeper into his dreadful opponent's wrist. At last, with a short clucking exclamation, he drew his blade sharply back for the last time, severing the axe hand from the arm. The dead thing collapsed like a deflated balloon at his feet, as hand and axe fell together to the cement roadway. Quick as a mink, de Grandin thrust his left hand within his coat, drew forth a pellet, similar to that with which he had transformed the counterfeit of Dorothy Spence, and hurled it straight into the upturned, ghastly, calm face of the mutilated body before him. The dead lips did not part, for the embalmer's sutures had closed them forever that morning, but the body writhed upward from the road, and a groan which was a muted scream came from its flat chest. It twisted back and forth a moment, like a mortally stricken serpent in its death agony, then lay still. Seizing the corpse by its grave clothes, de Grandin dragged it through the line of roadside hazel bushes to the rim of the swamp, and busied himself cutting long, straight withes from the brushwood, then disappeared again behind the tangled branches. At last, "'It is finished,' he remarked, stepping back to the road. "'Let us go.' "'What did you do?' I faltered. "'I did the needful, my friend. Morbleu, we had an evil, a very evil thing imprisoned in that dead man, and I took such precautions as were necessary to fix it in its prison. A stake through the heart, a severed head, and the hole firmly thrust into the ooze of the swamp. Voilà!' It will be long before other innocent ones are induced to destroy themselves by that. But, I began. No, no, he replied, half laughing. En avant, mon ami. I would that we return home as quickly as possible. Much work creates much appetite, and I make small doubt that I shall consume the remainder of that so delicious apple pie which I could not eat at dinner.
Jules de Grandin regarded the empty plate before him with a look of comic tragedy. "'May endless benisons rest upon your amiable cook, friend Trowbridge,' he pronounced. "'But may the curse of heaven forever pursue the villain who manufactures the woefully inadequate pans in which she bakes her pies.' "'Hang the pies, and the plate-makers, too!' I burst out. "'You promised to explain all this hocus-pocus, and I've been patient long enough. Stop sitting there like a glutton, wailing for more pie, and tell me about it.' "'Oh, the mystery?' he replied, stifling a yawn and lighting a cigarette. "'That is simple, my friend, but these so delicious pies—' "'However, I do digress.' When first I saw the accounts of so many strange suicides within one little week, I was interested but not greatly puzzled. People have slain themselves since the beginning of time, and yet— He shrugged his shoulders deprecatingly. What is it that makes the hound scent his quarry, the war-horse sniff the battle afar off? Who can tell? I said to me— there is undoubtedly more to these deaths than the newspapers have said. I shall investigate. From the coroners to the undertakers, and from the undertakers to the physicians, yes, parbleu, and to the family residences as well, I did go, gleaning here a bit and there a bit of information which seemed to mean nothing, but which might mean much, did I but have other information to add to it. One thing I ascertained early— in each instance the suicides had been to hear this Reverend Mondi the night before, or the same night they did away with themselves. This was perhaps insignificant, perhaps it meant much. I determined to hear this Monsieur Mondi with my own two ears, but I would not hear him too close by. Forgive me, my friend, for I did make a few the guinea-pig for my laboratory experiment— you I left in a forward seat while the reverend gentleman preached. Me I stayed in the rear of the hall and used my eyes as well as my ears. What happened that night? Why, my good friend Trowbridge, who in all his life had done no greater wrong than thoughtlessly to kill a little so harmless kitten, did almost seemingly commit suicide. But I was not asleep by the switch, my friend. Not Jules de Grandin. All the way home I saw you were distrait and I did fear something would happen, and I did therefore watch beside your door with my eye and ear alternately glued to the keyhole. Parbleu, I entered the chamber not one little second too soon, either. This is truly strange, I tell me. My friend hears this preacher and nearly destroys himself. Six others have heard him and have quite killed themselves. If friend Trowbridge were haunted by the ghost of a dead kitten— why should not those others, who also undoubtedly possess distressing memories, have been hounded to their graves by them? There is no reason why they should not, I tell me. Next morning comes the summons to attend the young Mademoiselle Weaver. She too have heard the preacher, she too have attempted her life, and what does she tell us? That she fancied the voice of her dead friend urged her to kill herself. Aha! I say to me, this, whatever it is which causes so much suicide, may appeal by fear, or perhaps by love, or by whatever will most strongly affect the person who dies by his own hand. We must see this Monsieur Mondi. It is perhaps possible he can tell us much. As yet I can see no light, I am still in darkness, but far ahead I already see the gleam of a promise of information. When we see Monsieur Everard Mondi, and he tells us of his experience at that séance so many years ago, parbleu, I see it all, or almost all. Now, what was it acted as agent for that aged sorceress's curse? He elevated one shoulder and looked questioningly at me. How should I know? I answered. Correct, he nodded. How indeed! Beyond doubt it were a spirit of some sort, what sort we do not know. Perhaps it were the spirit of some unfortunate who had destroyed himself and was earth-bound as a consequence. There are such. And as misery loves company in the proverb, 
so do these wretched ones seek to lure others to join them in their unhappy state. Or maybe it were an elemental. A what? I demanded. An elemental, a neutrarian. What the deuce is that? For answer, he left the table and entered the library, returning with a small red leather bound volume in his hand. You have read the works of Monsieur Rossetti? he asked. Yes. You recall his poem, Eden Bowers, perhaps? Hmm, yes, I've read it, but I never could make anything of it. Quite likely, he agreed. Its meaning is most obscure, but I shall enlighten you. Attendez-moi. Thumbing through the thin pages, he began reading at random. It was Lilith, the wife of Adam. Not a drop of her blood was human, but she was made like a soft, sweet woman. Lilith stood on the skirts of Eden. She was the first that thence was driven. With her was hell, and with Eve was heaven. What bright babes had Lilith and Adam! Shapes that coiled in the woods and waters, glittering sons and radiant daughters. You see, my friend? No, I'm hanged if I do. Very well, then. According to the rabbinical law, before Eve was created, Adam, our first father, had a demon wife named Lilith, and by her he had many children, not human nor yet wholly demon. For her sins Lilith was expelled from Eden's bowers, and Adam was given Eve to wife. With Lilith was driven out all her progeny by Adam, and Lilith and her half-man, half-demon brood declared war on Adam and Eve and their descendants for ever. These descendants of Lilith and Adam have ever since roamed the earth and air, incorporeal, having no bodies like men, yet having always a hatred for flesh and blood. Because they were the first, or elder race, they are sometimes called elementals in the ancient lore. Sometimes they are called neutrarians, because they are neither holy men nor holy devils. Me, I do not take odds in the controversy. I care not what they are called, but I know what I have seen. I think it is highly possible those ancient Hebrews— misinterpreting the manifestations they observed, accounted for them by their so fantastic legends. We are told these neutrarians, or elementals, are immaterial beings. Absurd? Not necessarily. What is matter? Material. Electricity, perhaps. A great system of law and order throughout the universe, and all the millions of worlds extending throughout infinity. Very good, so far. But when we have said matter is electricity, what are we to say if asked, What is electricity? Me? I think it a modification of the ether. Very good, you say. But what is ether? Parbleu, I do not know. The matter or material of the universe is little if anything more than electrons flowing about in all directions. For here, now there... The electrons balance and form what we call solids, rocks and trees and men and women. But may they not coalesce at a different rate of speed or vibration to form beings which are real, with ambitions and loves and hates similar to ours, yet for the most part invisible to us, as is the air? Why not? No man can truthfully say I have seen the air. Yet no one is so great a fool as to doubt its existence for that reason. Yes, but we can see the effects of air, I objected. Air in motion, for instance, becomes wind, and— More than crapaud, he burst out. And have we not observed the effects of these elementals, these neutrarians, or whatsoever their name may be, how of the six suicides? How of that which tempted the young Mademoiselle Weaver and the young Monsieur Spence to self-murder? How of the cat which entered your room? Did we see no effects there, eh? But the thing we saw with young Spence and the cat were visible, I objected. But of course, when you fancied you saw the cat, you were influenced from within, even as Mademoiselle Weaver was when she heard the voice of her dead friend. 
What we saw with the young Spence was the shadow of his desire, the intensified love and longing for his dead wife, plus the evil entity which urged him to unpardonable sin. Oh, all right, I conceded. Go on with your theory. He stared thoughtfully at the glowing tip of his cigarette a moment, then... It has been observed, my friend, that he who goes to a spiritualistic séance may come away with some evil spirit attached to him. Whether it be a spirit which once inhabited human form or an elemental, it is no matter. The evil ones swarm about the lowered lights of the spiritualistic meeting, as flies congregate at the honey-pot in summer. It appears such a one fastened to Everard Mondi. His wife was its first victim. Afterward, those who heard him preach were attacked. Consider the scene at the tabernacle, when Monsieur Mondi preaches. Emotion, emotion, all is emotion. Reason is lulled to sleep by the power of his words, and the minds of his hearers are not on their guard against the entrance of evil spirits. They are too intent on what he is saying. Their consciousness is absent. Poof! The evil one fastens firmly on some unwary person, explores his innermost mind, finds out his weakest point of defense. With you it was the kitten, with young Mademoiselle Weaver, her dead friend, with Monsieur Spence, his lost wife. Even love can be turned to evil purposes by such an one. These things I did consider most carefully. And then... I did enlist the services of young Monsieur Spence. You saw what you saw on the lonely road this night. Appearing to him in the form of his dead beloved, this wicked one had all but persuaded him to destroy himself when we intervened. Très bien. We triumphed then. The night before, I had prevented your death. The evil one was angry with me. Also it was frightened. If I continued, I would rob it of much prey. So it sought to do me harm. Me, I am ever on guard, for knowledge is power. It could not lead me to my death, and being spirit, it could not directly attack me. It had to recourse to its last resort. While the young undertaker's assistant was about to deliver the body of the old Monsieur Gregory, the spirit seized the corpse and animated it, then pursued me. Ha! Almost, I thought, it had done for me at one time, for I forgot it was no living thing I fought, and attacked it as if it could be killed. But when I found my sword could not kill that which was already dead, I did cut off its so abominable hand. I am very clever, my friend. The evil spirit reaped small profits from fighting with me. He made the boastful admission in all seriousness, entirely unaware of its sound for to him it was but a straightforward statement of undisputed fact. I grinned in spite of myself. Then curiosity got the better of amusement. What were those little pellets you threw at the spirit when it was luring young Spence to commit suicide, and later at the corpse of Silas Gregory? I asked. Ah! His elfish smile flickered across his lips, then disappeared as quickly as it came. It is better you do not ask me that, mon cher. Let it suffice when I tell you I convinced the good Père O'Brien that he should let me have what no layman is supposed to touch, that I might use the ammunition of heaven against the forces of hell. But how do we know this elemental, or whatever it was, won't come back again? I persisted. Little fear, he encouraged. The resort to the dead man's body was its last desperate chance. Having elected to fight me physically, it must stand or fall by the result of the fight. Once inside the body, it could not quickly extricate itself. Half an hour at least must elapse before it could withdraw. And before that time had passed, I had fixed it there for all time. The stake through the heart and the severed head makes that body as harmless as any other and the wicked spirit which animated it must remain with the flesh it sought to pervert to its own evil ends, henceforth and forever. But, ah, bah! He dropped his cigarette end into his empty coffee cup and yawned frankly. 
We dally too much, my friend. This night's work has made me heavy with sleep. Let us take a tiny sip of cognac, so the pie may not give us unhappy dreams, and then to bed. Tomorrow is another day, and who knows what new task lies before us. Creeping Shadows Mon Dieu, is it that we are a rest? Jules de Grandin half rose from the dinner-table in mock consternation, as the vigorous ringing of the front door-bell was followed by a heavy tramp in the hall, and Nora, my household factotum, ushered Detective Sergeant Costello and two uniformed policemen into the dining-room. Not a bit of it, Costello negatived with a grin, as he seated himself on the extreme forward edge of the chair I indicated, and motioned the two patrolmen to seats beside him. "'Not a bit of it, Dr. de Grandin, sir. "'But we're after asking a favour of you, if you don't mind. "'This is Officer Callahan,' he indicated the burly, red-headed policeman at his right. "'And this is Officer Shippert. "'Both good boys, sir, and worthy to be believed, for I know em of old.' "'I doubt it not,' de Grandin acknowledged the introduction with one of his quick smiles. "'Those whom you vouch for are surely not to be despised, mon vieux.' But this favour you would have of me, what is it? Detective Sergeant Costello clasped his black derby hat in a vice-like grip between his knees, and stared into its interior as though he expected to find inspiration there. We're after wanting some information in the Craven case, if you don't mind, sir, he replied. Eh, the Craven case, de Grandin echoed. Ah, bleu, old friend, I fear you have come to the wrong bureau of information. I know nothing of the matter except such tags of gossip as I have heard, and that is little enough. Was it not that this Monsieur Craven, who lived alone by himself, was discovered dead in his front yard, after having lain there in that condition for several days, and that there was evidence of neither struggle nor robbery? Am I right? Hmm? Costello mumbled. They didn't tell you nothing about his head being cut off, then? An expression of almost tragic astonishment swept over the little Frenchman's face. What is it that you say? He was beheaded? he exclaimed incredulously. Mon Dieu, why was I not informed of this? I had been told there was no evidence of a struggle. Is it then that lonely gentlemen in America suffer the loss of their heads without struggling? Tell on, my friend, I burn, I am consumed with curiosity. What more of this so remarkable case, where a man dies by decapitation, and there is no sign of foul play? Non d'un raisin, I am very wise, cher sergent, but it seems I have yet much to learn. Well, sir, Costello began half apologetically, I don't know why you never heard about Craven's head being missing unless the coroner's office hustled the body off too soon for the folks to get wise. But that ain't the strangest part of the case, not by a damn sight. Asking your pardon for the expression, sir. You see, these boys here, he indicated the officers, who nodded solemn confirmation of his remark before he uttered it. These boys here have the beat which goes past the Craven house, and they both of them swear they seen him in his front yard the morning of the very day he was found dead, and supposed to have been dead for several days when found. Now, Dr. de Grandin, I'm just a police officer, and Callahan and Shippert's just a pair of harness bulls. We ain't had no education. All the doctors at the coroner's office ought to know what they're talking about when they say the putrefactive state of his body showed Craven had been dead several days. But just the same— he paused, casting a glance at his two blue uniformed confrères. Non d'un bouc, go on, man, go on, de Grandin urged. I starve for further details, and you withhold your story like a naughty little boy teasing a dog with a bit of meat. Proceed, I beseech you. Well, sir, as I was saying, the detective resumed, I ain't setting up to be no medical doctor nor nothing like that, but I'll take me Bible oath. Mr. Craven hadn't been dead no several days when they found him laying in his garden. Twas early in the morning of the very day they found him, I was walking past his house, after being out most all night on a case, 
and I seen him standin' in his front yard with me own two eyes, as plain as I see you this minute, sir. Callahan and Shippard, who was comin' off night duty, come past the house not more'n an hour afterward, and they see him standin' among the flowers too. Eh, are you sure of this? de Grandin demanded, his little blue eyes snapping with interest. Positive, Costello returned. Meself, I might have seen a ghost, and Callahan might have done the same, for we're Irish, sir, and the hidden people show themselves to us when they don't bid the time a day to the rest of yous. But Shippard here, if he's seen a banshee settin' on a murderer's grave, combin' her hair with the shin-bone of a dead gypsy, he'd ne'er give the old girl a tumble unless her screechin' annoyed the neighbours, and then he'd tell her to shut up and move on, or he'd run her in for disturbing the peace. So if Shippert says he's seen Mr. Craven walkin' in his front garden half an hour after sun-up, why, Mr. Craven it were, sir, and no ghost at all, I'll swear to that. Morbleu! And did you not tell the coroner as much at the Inquisition? De Grandin asked, producing a cigarette from his waistcoat pocket like a prestidigitator exhuming a rabbit from his trick hat, but forgetting to light it in his excitement. Did you not inform Monsieur le Coroner of this? No, sir, we wasn't invited to the inquest. I reported what I'd seen to headquarters when I heard they'd found Mr. Craven's body, and Callahan and Shippert done the same at their precinct, but all they said to us was, Applesauce, and that was that, sir. You see, when we all three swore we'd seen the man himself the same morning, and the doctors all swore he must have been dead almost a week before he was found, they thought we was all cuckoo, and paid us no more mind. No, d'un poc, did they so? De Grandin barked. They did tell you, my friend, that you spoke the sauce of the apple. You, who have assisted Jules de Grandin in more cases than one. Mon Dieu, it is the insult. I shall go to these canailles. I shall tell them to their foolish faces that they possess not the brain of a guinea pig. I, Jules de Grandin, shall inform them. Easy, sir. "'Go easy, if you please,' Costello besought. "'Twould do us more harm than good, "'should you cause hard feelings agin us at the coroner's office. "'But you can be a big help to us in another way, if you will.' "'Mobble, speak on, my friend. Enlighten me,' de Grandin agreed. "'If there be a mystery to this case, and a mystery there surely is, "'have no fear that Jules de Grandin will sleep or eat or drink till it shall be explained.' He poured himself another cup of coffee and imbibed it in two huge gulps. Lidon, mon brave, what is it that you would have me do? Well, sir, the Irishman grinned with delight at de Grandin's enthusiastic acceptance of his suggestion. We knew as how you'd had all sorts and kinds of experience with dead folks, and we're wondering if maybe you would go over to the Craven house with us and take a look round the premises, sort of. Maybe you'd be able to find out something that would make the going easier for us, for they're razzing us something awful about saying we seen Mr. Craven several days after the doctor said he was killed, so they are. All the same, no matter what they say at the coroner's office, he added stubbornly, a man that's well enough to be walking around his own front yard at half-past four in the morning ain't going to be dead several days when he's found in the same yard a few minutes after four o'clock the same afternoon. That's what I say, and Callahan and Shippert here says the same. Sure do. Officers Callahan and Shippert nodded solemn agreement. Parbleu, mes amis, de Grandin agreed as he rose from the table. I consider your logic irrefutable. Come, Trowbridge, my friend, he beckoned to me. Let us go to this house where men who died several days before, with their heads off, parbleu, Promenade their front yards. He held the door of my motor's tonneau courteously for the three officers, then vaulted nimbly to the front seat beside me. Trowbridge, my old one, he whispered as I set the car in motion. I damn think we shall have the beautiful adventure this night. Hasten, I would that it begins at once, right away. The Craven Cottage stood in the centre of a quarter-acre tract, a low hedge cutting it off from the old military road on which it faced, an eight-foot brick wall surrounding its other three sides. 
Though the front grounds were planted in a run-down garden, there were no trees near the house. Consequently, we had an unobstructed view of the yard in the brilliant May moonlight. It was right here they found him, Officer Shippert volunteered, directing our attention to a bed of flocks which still bore the impression of some heavy weight. He was standing almost alongside this here flower bed when I seen him that morning, and he must have fallen where he stood. I can't understand what— Ouch! What the devil's that? He drew his hand suddenly back from the mass of flowering plants, grasping his forefinger in pain. Stick yourself, ship, Callahan asked casually. I didn't know them things had thorns on them. I'll say I stuck myself, Officer Shippert replied, displaying a long-pointed sliver of wood adhering to the skin of his finger. This thing was laying right amongst them flowers and— Oh, my God! Callahan! Costello! I'm going blind! I'm dying! With an exclamation which was half grunt, half choke, he slid forward to the earth, his stalwart body crushing the flowers which had bent beneath the weight of Craven's headless corpse some forty-eight hours earlier. "'Holy mother!' Sergeant Costello exclaimed as he bent over the prostrate figure of the policeman. "'Dr. de Grandin? He is dead. See here, sir, his heart stopped beating.' De Grandin and I leaned forward, making a hasty inspection. Costello's diagnosis was all too true. The sturdy patrolman, vibrant with life two minutes before, was lifeless as the man whose body lay in the city morgue, apparently dead for several days when found, according to medical testimony. Costello and I picked our fallen comrade up and bore him into the empty house of death, and while I struck a match and applied it to a gas jet, de Grandin opened the dead policeman's blouse and made a closer examination. "'Look here, Dr. de Grandin,' the sergeant announced, looking up from the dead man's face with the dry-eyed sorrow of a man whose daily duty it is to take desperate risks. "'There's something devilish about this business. Look at his face. He's turning spotty already. Why, you'd think he was dead a couple of days, and we only just carried him in here a minute ago.' De Grandin bent closer, examining the dead man's face, chest, and arms attentively. Pablo, it may be easily so, he murmured to himself, then aloud to Costello. You are right, my friend. Do you and the good Callahan go to the police bureau for an ambulance? Dr. Trowbridge and I will wait until they come for the... for your comrade. Meantime... He broke off, gazing abstractedly about the combination living dining room in which we stood, noting the odd ornaments on the mantel shelf the neatly arranged blue plates in the china closet, the general air of stiff, masculine housekeeping which permeated the apartment. Pablo Trowbridge, my friend, he commented as the policeman tiptoed out. I think this matter will require much thinking over. Me, I do not like the way this poor one died, and I have less liking for the intelligence that Monsieur Craven's head was missing. "'But Craven must have been cut down by some fiend,' I interposed. "'While poor Shippert—' "'Well, how did he die, de Grandin?' "'Who can say?' he queried in his turn, "'tapping his teeth thoughtfully with the polished nail of his forefinger. "'Now, Jules de Grandin, great tête de chou that you are, "'what have you to say to this?' He apostrophized himself as he inspected the splinter of wood which had scratched the dead policeman's hand. "'That is what it is, undoubtedly,' he continued his monologue. "'Yes, pardieu, we do all know that, but why? Such things do not happen without reason, foolish one.' He turned to the chest of drawers beneath the kitchen dresser, and began ransacking it as methodically as though he were a burglar intent on looting the place. "'Ah, uh, what have we here?' he demanded as a heavy package, securely wrapped in muslin, came to light. "'Perhaps it is a plate.' He bore the parcel to the unpainted kitchen table and began undoing the nautical knots with which its wrappings were fastened. "'More bleu,' he laid back the last layer of cloth. "'It is a plate, friend Trowbridge, and such a plate!' 
Men have died for less. Called you, I think, men have died for this, unless I am more mistaken than I think. Under the flickering gaslight, there lay a disk of yellow metal some thirteen or fourteen inches in diameter, its outer edge decorated with a row of small oblong ornaments, like a border of dominoes, an inner circle, three inches or so smaller than the plate's perimeter, serving as a frame for the bas-relief figure of a dancing man crowned with a feather headdress and brandishing a two-headed spear in one hand and a hook-ended war-club in the other. "'It is gold, my friend,' he breathed almost reverently. "'Solid, virgin gold, hammered by hand a thousand years ago, if a day. "'Pure Mayan it is, from Chichen Itza or Ushmal, and worth its weight in diamonds.' "'Um, perhaps,' I agreed doubtfully. "'But nothing you've said means anything to me.' "'No matter.' he retorted shortly. Let us see. Ah, what have we here? In a corner of the small open fireplace, innocent of any trace of ash or cinder, lay a tiny wisp of charred paper. Darting forward, he retrieved the bit of refuse and spread it before him on the table. Hmm? he muttered noncommittally, staring at the relic as though he expected it to speak. The paper had been burned to a crisp and had curled up on itself with the action of the flame, but the metallic content of the ink in which its message had been scribbled had bleached to a dark leaden grey, several shades lighter than the carbonized surface of the note itself. "'Regardez-vous, my friend,' he commanded, taking a pair of laboratory tweezers from his dinner-coat pocket and straightening the paper slightly with a careful pressure. Can you not descry words on this so black background? No, yes, I replied, looking over his shoulder and straining my eyes to the utmost. Bien, we shall read it together, he responded. Now to begin. R. Al, we spelled out laboriously, as he turned the charred note gingerly to and fro beneath the lambent light. Red ills av ot murphy lay low an the rest of the message was lost in the multitude of heat wrinkles on the paper's blackened surface mon dieu but this is too bad he exclaimed when our united efforts to decipher further words proved fruitless there is no date no signature no anything alas we stand no nearer an answer to our puzzle than at first he lighted one of his evil-smelling French cigarettes and took several lung-filling, thoughtful puffs, then threw the half-smoked tube into the fireplace and began re-wrapping the golden plate. "'My friend,' he informed me, his little blue eyes twinkling with sardonic laughter, "'I lie. A moment since I did declare we were still at sea, but now I think we are, like Columbus, in sight of land.' Moreover, again like Columbus, I think it is the coast of Central America which we do sight. Behold, we have established the motive for Monsieur Craven's murder, and we know how it was accomplished. There now remains only to ascertain who this Monsieur Murphy was, and who inscribed this note of warning to the late Monsieur Craven. Well, I exclaimed impatiently, I'm glad you've found out why and how Craven was killed. All I've seen here tonight is a policeman's tragic death and a silly-looking plate from Uxbridge or some other absurd place. He produced another cigarette and felt thoughtfully through his pockets for a match. Those who know not what they see oft-times see nothing, my friend, he returned with a sarcastic smile. Come, let us go out into the air. This place... Ah, it has the reek of death on it. We waited at the front gate until Costello and Callahan arrived with the police ambulance. As the litter-bearers passed us on their grisly errand, de Grandin leaned from my car and whispered to Costello, "'Tomorrow night, cher sergent. Perhaps we shall come to the end of the riddle, then, and apprehend those who slew your friend as well.' "'Can you now, doctor?' the Irishman returned eagerly. By gorry, I'll be present with bells, and a couple of guns on, if you can trace the murder and devil for me. 
Très bien, de Grandin assented. Meet us at Dr. Trowbridge's house about eight o'clock, if you please. Now, what's it all mean? I demanded as I turned the car toward home. You're as mysterious as a magician at the county fair. Come out with it. Listen, my friend, he bade. The wise man, who thinks he knows whereof he speaks, retains silence until his thought becomes a certainty. Me? I have wisdom. Much experience has given it to me. Let us say no more of this matter until we have ascertained light on certain things which are yet most dark, yes. But je suis le roi de ces montagnes. He sang in high good humor nor could all my threats or entreaties make him say one word more concerning the mystery of Craven's death, or Shippert's, or the queer golden plate we found in the deserted house. Bonsoir, Sergent, de Grandin greeted, as Costello entered the study shortly after nine o'clock the following evening. We have awaited you with impatience. Have you now? the Irishman replied. "'Sure, it's too bad entirely that I've delayed the party, "'but I've had the devil's own time getting here this night. "'All sorts of things have been popping up, sir.' "'Eh bien, perhaps we shall pop up something more before the night is ended,' "'the Frenchman returned. "'Come, let us hasten. "'We have much to do before we seek our beds.' "'All right,' Costello agreed as he prepared to follow. "'Where are we going, if I may ask?' Ah, too many questions spoil the party of surprise, my friend, de Grandin answered with a laugh as he led the way to the car. Do you know the Rugby Road, friend Trowbridge? he asked as he climbed into the front seat beside me. Ah, uh, yes, I replied without enthusiasm. The neighborhood he mentioned was in a suburb at the extreme east end of town, not at all noted for its odor of sanctity. Frankly, I had not much stomach for driving out there after dark, even with Sergeant Costello for company. But de Grandin gave me no time for temporizing. Bien, he replied enthusiastically. You will drive us with all celerity, if you please, and pause when I give the signal. Come, my friend, haste, I pray you. Not only may we save another life, we may apprehend those assassins who did Craven and the poor shipper to death. All right, I agreed grudgingly, but I'm not very keen on it. Half an hour's run brought us to the winding tree-shaded trail known as Rugby Road, a thoroughfare of broken pavements, tumble-down houses, and wide spaces of open, uncultivated fields. At a signal from my companion I brought up before the straggling picket fence of a deserted-looking cottage and the three of us swarmed out and advanced along the grass-choked path leading to the ruinous front stoop. "'I'm thinking we've had a ride for our pains, sir,' Costello asserted, as de Grandin's third imperative knock brought no response from beyond the weather-scarred door. "'Not we,' the Frenchman denied, increasing both tempo and volume of his raps. "'There is someone here, of a certainty,' and here we shall stand until we receive an answer. His persistence was rewarded, for a shuffling step finally sounded beyond the panels, and a cautious voice demanded haltingly, Who's there? Pablo, friend, you are overlong in honoring the presence of those who come to aid you, de Grandin complained with testy irrelevancy. Have the kindness to open the door. Who's there? the voice repeated, this time with something like a tremor in it. Non de Omar, the Frenchman ejaculated. What does it matter what names we bear? We are come to help you escape the Red Devils, those same demons who did away with Murphy and Craven. Quick, open, for the time is short. The man inside appeared to be considering de Grandin's statement, for there was a brief period of silence. Then the sound of bolts withdrawing and a chain-lock being undone. "'Quick! Step fast!' the voice admonished, as the door swung inward a scant ten inches without disclosing the person behind it. Next moment we stood in a dimly lighted hallway, surveying a perspiring little man in tattered pajamas and badly worn carpet slippers. He was an odd-looking bit of humanity, 
undersized, thin almost to the point of emaciation, with small deep sunken eyes set close together, a head almost denuded of hair, and a mouth at once weak and vicious. I conceived an instant dislike for him, nor was my regard heightened by his greeting. "'What do you know about the Red Devils?' he demanded truculently, regarding us with something more than suspicion. "'If you're in cahoots with them, he placed his hand against the soiled front of his jacket, displaying the outline of a revolver strapped to his waist. "'Ah, bah, deacons,' de Grandin advised. "'Be not an utter fool. Were we part of their company, you know how much safety the possession of that toy would afford. Murphy was an excellent shot. So was Craven, but—' He waved an expressive hand. "'What good were all their weapons?' "'None, by God!' the other answered with a shudder. "'But what's a little pip-squeak like you going to be able to do to help me?' "'More blue, a pip-squeak, I?' The diminutive Frenchman bristled like a bantam gamecock, then interrupted himself to ask, "'Why do you barricade yourself like this? Think you to escape in that way?' "'What do you want me to do?' the other replied sullenly. "'Go out and let them fill me full of—' Tiens, the chances are nine to one that they will get you in any case, de Grandin cut in cheerfully. We have come to offer you the tenth chance, my friend. Now, attend me carefully. Have you a cellar beneath this detestable ruin of a house, and has it a floor of earth? Huh? Yes, the other replied, looking at the Frenchman as though he expected him to proclaim himself Emperor of China with his next breath. What of it? Pablo, much of it, stupid one. Quick, make haste, repair instantly to the cellar, and bring me a pan full of earth. Be swift. The night is too hot for us to remain long baking in this hell-hole of yours. Looky here, the other began, but de Grandin shut him off. Do as I bid, he thundered, his little eyes blazing fiercely. At once, right away immediately, or we leave you to your fate. Cordieu, am I not Jules de Gondin? I will be obeyed. With surprising meekness, our host descended to the cellar and struggled up the rickety stairs in a few minutes, a dishpan full of clayey soil from the unpaved floor in his hands. Bien! De Gondin carried the earth to the kitchen sink and proceeded to moisten it with water from the tap, then began kneading it gently with his long, tapering fingers. "'Do you seat yourself between me and the light, my friend?' he commanded, looking up from his work to address deacons. "'I would have a clear-cut view of your profile.' "'Say,' the other began protestingly, "'here now you, do what Dr. de Grandin tells you, or I'll mash you to a pulp,' Costello cut in, evidently feeling he had already taken too little part in the proceedings. "'Turn your ugly mug now, like he tells you, or I'll be turning it for you, and turning it so far you'll have to walk backwards to see where you're going, too. Under Costello's chaperonage, Deacons sat sullenly while de Grandin deftly punched and pounded the mass of soggy clay into a rough simulacrum of his nondescript profile. Pablo Trowbridge, my friend, he remarked with a grin. When I was a lad, studying at the Beaux-Arts and learning I should never make an artist, Little did I think I should one day apply such little skill as I absorbed in modelling such a cochon as that. He indicated Deacons with a disdainful nod. In earth scooped from his own cellar floor. Eh bien, he who tracks a mystery does many strange things before he reaches his trail's end, n'est-ce pas? Now then, he gave the clay a final scrape with his thumb. Let us consider the two of you. "'Be so good as to stand beside my masterpiece, monsieur.' He waved an inviting hand to his model, and strode across the room to get a longer perspective on his work. Deacons complied, still muttering complainingly about "'fellows that come to a man's house and orders him about like he was a bloomin' servant.' The Frenchman regarded his handiwork through narrowed eyelids, turning his head first one side, then the other. Finally, he gave a short grunt of satisfaction. Ma foi, 
he looked from Costello to me, then back to Deacon's and the bust. I think I have bettered the work of Le Bon Dieu. Surely my creation from earth does flatter his. Is it not so, my friends? Sure it is, Costello commended. But if it ain't asking too much, I'd like to know what's the idea of all the monkey business. De Grandau wiped the clay from his hands on the none-too-clean towel which hung from a nail in the kitchen door. We are about to demonstrate the superiority of Aryan culture to the heathen in his blindness, he replied. Are we now? Costello answered. Sure, that's fine. When do we start? Now, immediately, right away. Deacons, he turned curtly to our host. Do you smoke a pipe? Habitually, bien. You will put your pipe in that image's mouth, if you please. Careful, I do not wish my work spoiled by your clumsiness. Good. He regarded the image a thoughtful moment, then drawled to himself. And uh, now, ah, par Dieu, the very thing. Seizing a roll of clothesline from the corner of the room, he made it fast to a leg of the table on which the statuette rested, then began dragging it slowly toward him. Once more I would have your so generous criticism, Sergent, he requested of Costello. Will you stand in the doorway there and observe the statue as it passes the light? Does its outline resemble the profile of our handsome friend yonder? It does, the policeman asserted, after a careful inspection through half-closed eyes. If I seen it at fifty foot or so in a bad light, I'd think it were the man himself, maybe. Good, fine, excellent, de Grandin replied. Those are the precise conditions under which I propose exhibiting my work to the audience I doubt not waits to examine it. Pablo, we must hope their sense of artistic appreciation is not too highly developed. Trowbridge, mon vieux, will you assist me with the table? I would have it in the next room, please. When we had placed the table some five feet from the living-room window which overlooked the cottage's shabby side-yard, de Grandin turned to Costello and me, his face tense with excitement. "'Let us steal to the back door, my friends,' he directed. "'And you, Sergent, do you have your pistol ready, for it may be that we shall have quick and straight shooting to do before we age many minutes. Deacons!' He turned at the doorway, speaking with a sharp, rasping note of command in his voice. "'Do you seat yourself on the floor, out of sight from the window, and draw the table toward you slowly with that rope when you hear my command?' "'Slowly, my friend, mind you. About the pace a man might walk if he were in no hurry. Much depends upon your exact compliance with my orders. Now—' Tiptoeing to the window, he seized the sliding blind, ran it up to its full height, then unbarred the shutters, flinging them wide, and dodged nimbly back from the window's opening. Sergeant Trowbridge, he whispered tensely. Attention, let us go, allons. Be ready. He flung the command to Deacons over his shoulder as he slipped from the room. Begin drawing in the rope when you hear the back door open. Silently as a trio of ghosts we stole out into the moonless, humid night, skirted the line of the house wall, and crouched in the shadow of a dilapidated rain-barrel. "'Do you think any one will—' Costello began in a hoarse whisper, but— "'Shh!' de Grandin shut him off. "'Observe, my friends, look yonder!' A clump of scrub maple and poplar grew some forty feet from the house— and as we obeyed the Frenchman's imperative nod, a portion of the dense shadow thrown by the trees appeared to detach itself from the surrounding gloom, and drift slowly toward the lighted window across which the crudely modelled bust of Deacons was being pulled. Careful, my friends, no noise, de Grandin warned, so low the syllables were barely audible above the murmuring night noises. The drifting shadow was joined by another, the two merging into one almost imperceptible blot of blackness. Nearer, still nearer, the creeping patch of gloom approached. Then, with the suddenness of a wind-driven cloud-altering shape, the ebon blotch changed from horizontal to vertical, 
two distinct shapes, squat, crooked-legged human shapes, became visible against the darkness of the night's background, and a wild, eerie, blood-curdling yell rent the heavy, grass-scented air. Two undersized, screaming shapes ran wildly toward the dimly lit window, but Detective Sergeant Costello was quicker than they. "'I've got you, you murdering devils!' he roared, leaping from his ambush and flourishing his revolver. "'Stick up your paws, or I'll make a fly-net out of the pair of yous!' "'Down, down, fool!' de Grandin shrieked despairingly, as he strove futilely to drag the big Irishman back into the shadow. He gave up the attempt, and leaped forward with lithe cat-like grace, interposing himself between the detective and the shadowy forms. Something shone dimly in the night's starless air. Two flashes of intense orange flames spurted through the darkness, and the twin roar of a French army pistol crashed and reverberated against the house wall. The racing shadows halted abruptly in their course, seemed to lean together an instant, to merge like a mass of vapor jostled by the wind, then slumped suddenly downward and lay still. "'Blessed St. Patrick!' Costello murmured, turning the prostrate forms over, inspecting the gaping wounds torn by de Grandin's soft-nosed bullets with a sort of pathetic awe. "'That's what I call some shooting, Dr. de Grandin, sir. I knew you was a clever little devil!' "'Asking your pardon, but... "'Pablo, my friend, when shooting is necessary, I shoot,' "'de Grandin replied complacently. "'But we have other things of more importance to observe, if you please. "'Turn your flashlight here, if you will.' "'Sharply silhouetted against the circle of brilliance cast by the electric torch "'were two slender, thorn-like splinters of wood.' their hard-pointed tips buried to a depth of a quarter inch in the clabbered's crumbling surface. "'It was such as these which killed Craven and Comrade Shippert,' the Frenchman explained shortly. "'Had I not fired when I did, these,' he pointed gingerly to the thorns, "'would have been in you, my friend, and you, I doubt not, would have been in heaven. More bleu as it was, I did despair of drawing you back before they had pierced you with their darts.' and le bon Dieu knows I shot not a moment too soon. But, holy mother, what the devil is it anyway, sir? the big detective demanded in a fever of mystification. De Grandin blew methodically down the barrel of his pistol to clear the smoke fumes away, before restoring the weapon to his shoulder holster. They are darts, my friend, arrows from blow-guns, arrows of sure and certain death, for with them every hit is a fatal one. In South and Central America the Indians use them in blow-guns for certain classes of hunting, and sometimes in war, and when they blow one of them into a jaguar, fierce and tenacious of life as the great cat is, he dies before he can fall from his tree to the earth. Beside the venom in which these darts are steeped, the poison of the cobra or the rattlesnake is harmless as water. But come! He turned again toward the house. Let us go in. Me, I think I have all this sad and sordid story by heart, but there is certain information I would get from the excellent deacons before we write the last chapter. Now, monsieur, de Grandin leveled his unwinking, steel-hard stare at the little man cowering in the cottage's shabby living room. You have spent much time in Central America, I take it. You and your compatriots, Murphy and Craven, were grave robbers, n'est-ce pas? Huh? What's that? Costello interrupted incredulously. Grave robbers, did you say, sir? Stiff stealers? No, no, the Frenchman returned with a quick smile, then turned a stern face toward Deacons. Not stealers of corpses, my friend, but stealers of treasure. More bleu do I not know their ilk. But of course, my friends, I was with de Lesseps when he strove to consummate the wedding of the Atlantic with the Pacific at Panama. I was for a time with the French engineers when Diaz drove the railway across the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. 
and in that time I learnt much of gentry such as these. In all Central America there is great store of gold and silver and turquoise buried in the graveyards and ruined cities of the native peoples, whom the pig-ignorant Spaniards destroyed in their greed for gold and power. Today brave men of science do risk their lives, that these priceless relics of a forgotten people may be brought to light, and fellows such as Deacons and his two dead partners hang about the headquarters of exploring parties, waiting for them to map the course to the ancient ruins, then rush in and steal each scrap of gold on which they can lay their so unclean hands. They are vandals, more vile than the Spaniards who went before them for they steal not only from the dead, but from the treasure-house of science as well. "'We didn't do nothing worse than the highbrows did,' Deacons defended sullenly. "'You never heard of us trying to alibi ourselves by claiming to be working for some university, instead of being just plain thieves. Them scientists are just as bad as we was, only they was gentlemen and could get away with their second-story work. "'About ten years ago,' De Grandin went on as if Deacons had not spoken. This fellow, together with Craven, Murphy, and three others, stumbled on the ruins of an old Mayan city in Yucatan. Only the good God knows how they found it, but find it they did, and with it they found a perfect El Dorado of golden relics. The local Indians, poor, ignorant, oppressed wretches, had lost all knowledge of their once so splendid ancestors and retained nothing of the ancient Mayan culture but a few perverted legends and a deep idolatrous veneration for the ruins of their vanished forebears' sacred cities. When they beheld Deacons and his companions pawing over the bodies in the tombs, kicking the skeletons about as though they were but rubbish, and snatching frantically at anything and everything with a glint of gold upon it, Cordial, how many priceless pieces of copal and obsidian these so ignorant ignoramuses must have thrown away! They swooped down on the camp, and the robbers had to shoot their way to freedom. Three of them were slain, but three of them escaped, and one threw to the coast. They made their way back to this country with their booty, and— Say! Deacons looked at the Frenchman as a bird might regard a serpent. How do you find all this out? Parbleu, my friend, the other smiled tolerantly. Jules de Grandin is not to be fooled by such as you. Sergent, he turned again to Costello. While you and Callahan did seek the ambulance to bear away the body of poor Shippert last night, friend Trowbridge and I investigated the house where Monsieur Craven died. It was not hard for us to see the place was one occupied by a man much used to living alone and being his own servant in all ways, a sailor, perhaps, or a man much accustomed to the out-of-the-way places of the world. That was the first domino with which we had to begin building. Now, when we came to examine his table de cuisine, we did find an ancient Mayan plate— engraved with an effigy of a priest in full sacrificial regalia. This plate was the only thing of its kind among the dead man's effects, and was carefully wrapped in a cotton rag. Evidently he had retained it as a souvenir. Those who knew not the goldsmithing trade in ancient Central America might easily have mistaken the plate for a piece of oriental brass, but I— who know many things, realized it was of solid, unalloyed gold intrinsically worth from five to seven thousand dollars, perhaps, but priceless from the anthropologist's standpoint. Now, I ask me, what would a man like this Monsieur Craven, comfortably off but not rich, be doing with such a relic among his things, unless he himself had brought it from Yucatan? Nothing, I say to me. Quite right, I reply. Jules de Grandin, you do not make mistakes. Also, there was the coroner's report that this monsieur dead man had been dead for several days when he was found, and your piece of intelligence that his head have disappeared. Also, again, we know from you and the other officers that he had not been dead several days, but only several hours when discovered. What is the answer to that? Alas, we found it out— only through your poor friend's death. 
Officer Shippard had pricked himself on what he thought was a thorn. So much like thorns do these accursed darts look that the police and coroner's attachés might have seen that one a thousand times, yet never recognized it for what it was. But our poor friend was wounded by it, and almost at once he died. Now what was such a dart as this doing in the Craven Yard? Why did the poor Shippard have to scratch himself on a thing which should not have been in existence in that latitude and longitude? It is to seek the answer. We carried Shippard into the house, and what do we see? Almost at once he had begun to become livid, discoloured. Yes, I have seen men shot with such arrows while I worked under the tropic sun. I had handled those splinters of death, and had seen the corpses assume the appearance of the long dead, almost as I watched them. When I saw the appearance of the poor Shippert, and beheld the dart by which he died, I say to me, This is the answer. This is why the physicians at the coroner's office declare that my friend, the good Costello, speaks words of foolishness when he insists Craven was not long dead when found. Yes. Also, you have told me of the missing head. I know from experience and hearsay that those Indians do take the heads of their enemies, as your Apaches once took the scalps of theirs, and preserve them as trophies. Everything points one way. You see, we have these parts of our puzzle. He checked the facts off on his fingers. A man who brought a golden plate from Yucatan is found dead in his front yard. He is undoubtedly the victim of an Indian blowgun dart, for his appearance and the dart which we have found too late to save the poor Shippert all say so. Very good. No one knew anything about him, but— he was apparently one of those fortunate ones who can live in some comfort without working. From this, I reason, he might once have possessed other Indian gold which he has sold. Now, while I think on all these things, I notice a piece of burnt paper in his fireplace, and on it I read these fragments of words. Ar al red ils av ot murphy lay low an... What does it mean? I think some more, and decide what was written originally was, Dear pal, the red devils have got Murphy. Lay low, and... Who are these red devils? Because an Indian dart have killed both Craven and Shippert. Must we not assume they are Indians? I think so. Most likely they were natives of Yucatan who had shipped as sailors on some tramp steamer, and come to this land to wreak vengeance on those who despoiled their sacred cities and burying places. I have observed instances of such before. In Paris we have known of it, for there is no sort of crime with which the face of man is blackened, which has not been at least once investigated by the service de sûreté. Now, from all this, it was most apparent the writer of this burnt note had been warning Craven that, one Murphy had been translated to another, though probably not a better, world, and that Craven must lie low, or he would doubtless share the same fate. So much is plain. But who was Murphy, and who had written the warning? I decided to shoot at the only target in sight. Next day I interviewed Dr. Symington of the New York Museum of Natural History asking him if he remembered Mayan relics being bought from a man named Craven or Murphy, or from anyone who mentioned any of those names in his conversation. A desperate chance, you say? But certainly. Yet it was by taking desperate chances that we turned back the Salboche. It was by taking desperate chances that the peerless Wright brothers learned to fly. It was by taking a desperate chance that I, Jules de Grandin, triumphed. Friend Symington had heard such names. Eight years ago, one Michael Murphy had sold the museum a small piece of Mayan jewelry, a little statuette of hammered rose gold. He had boasted of exploits in Central America when he obtained this statue, told how he, 
together with Arthur Craven and Charles Dickens, had a fortune in bullion within their grasp, only to lose it when the outraged Indians attacked their camp and killed three of their companions. And that he spoke truth there was small doubt, for so greatly did he fear the Indian vengeance that he refused an offer of five thousand dollars and expenses to guide a party from the museum to the place where he found the Indian gold. Very good. We have got the answer to our questions. Whom have the Red Devils gotten? And who wrote the warning letter to Craven? But where is this Charles Deacons? In the directory of this city there are three of him listed, but only one of him is labelled as retired, and it was to him I looked for further light. I assume the Deacons I seek lives, as Craven did, on the proceeds of his thefts. I further assume he goes in deadly fear of the Indians' flying vengeance by day and by night. I find his address here, and— he waved his hand in a gesture of finality. Here we come, voila! I started to put a question, but Costello was before me. How did you know the murderin' heathens would be here tonight, Dr. de Grandin? he demanded. Eh bien, by elimination, of course, the Frenchman replied in high good humour. Three men were sought by the Indians, two of them had already been disposed of, Therefore, unless deacons had already fallen to their flying death, they still remained in the vicinity, awaiting a chance to execute him. We found him alive, hence we knew they had still one-third of their task to perform. So I did bait our trap with deacons' dummy, for well I knew they would shoot their poisoned darts at him the moment they saw his shadow pass the lighted open window. More bleu, my friend! How near your own foolish courage came to making you instead their victim. Thanks to you, sir. I'm still alive and kickin', Costello acknowledged. Shall I be ringin' the morgue wagon for the fellies you shot, sir? I care not, de Grandin responded indifferently. Dispose of them as you will. Well, say— Deacons suddenly seemed to emerge from his trance and advanced toward de Grandin, his lean hand extended. I certainly gotta thank you for pulling me out of a mighty tight hole, sir. De Grandin took no notice of the proffered hand. Pardieu, monsieur, he responded coldly. It was from no concern for you that I undertook this night's work. Those Indians had slain a friend of my friend, Sergeant Costello. I came not to save you, but to execute the murderers. You were but the stinking goat with which our tiger trap was baited. The White Lady of the Orphanage Dr. Trowbridge, Dr. de Grandin? Our visitor looked questioningly from one of us to the other. I'm Trowbridge, I answered, and this is Dr. de Grandin. What can we do for you? The gentle-faced, white-haired little man bowed rather nervously to each of us in turn, acknowledging the introduction. "'My name is Gervaise, Howard Gervaise,' he replied. "'I'm superintendent of the Springfield Orphans' Home.' I indicated a chair at the end of the study table and awaited further information. "'I was advised to consult you gentlemen by Mr. Willis Richards of your city,' he continued. Mr. Richards told me you accomplished some really remarkable results for him at the time his jewelry was stolen, and suggested that you could do more to clear up our present trouble than anyone else. He is president of our board of trustees, you know, he added in explanation. Hm? Jules de Grandin murmured, non-committally, as he set fire to a fresh cigarette with the glowing butt of another. I recall that, Monsieur Richards. He figured in the affair of the disembodied hand, friend Trowbridge, you remember. Parbleu, I also recall that he paid the reward for his jewel's return with very bad grace. You come poorly introduced, my friend. He fixed his uncompromising cat stare on our caller. However, say on, we listen. Mr. Gervaise seemed to shrink in upon himself more than ever, 
It took small imaginative powers to vision him utterly cowed before the domineering manner of Willis Richards, our local nabob. The fact is, gentlemen, he began with a soft, deprecating cough, we are greatly troubled at the orphanage. Something mysterious, most mysterious, is taking place there. Unless we can arrive at some solution, we shall be obliged to call in the police, and that would be most unfortunate. Publicity is to be dreaded in this case, yet we are at a total loss to explain the mystery. Hmm. De Grandin inspected the tip of his cigarette carefully, as though it were something entirely novel. Most mysteries cease to be mysterious once they are explained, monsieur. You will be good enough to proceed. Ah, uh, Mr. Gervais glanced about the study as though to take inspiration from the surroundings, then coughed apologetically again. Ah, uh, the fact is, gentlemen, that several of our little charges have, ah, uh, mysteriously disappeared. During the past six months we have missed no less than five of the home's inmates, two boys and three girls, and only day before yesterday a sixth one disappeared, vanished into air, if you can credit my statement. Ah? Uh? Jules de Grandin sat forward a little in his chair, regarding the collar narrowly. They have disappeared? Vanished, do you say? Perhaps they have decamped? No, Gervais denied. I don't think that's possible, sir. Our home is only a semi-public institution, you know, being supported entirely by voluntary gifts and benefits of wealthy patrons, and we do not open our doors to orphan children as a class. There are certain restrictions imposed. For this reason we never entertain a greater number than we are able to care for in a fitting manner, and conditions at Springville are rather different from those obtaining in most institutions of a similar character. The children are well-fed, well-clothed, and excellently housed, and, as far as anyone in their unfortunate situation can be, are perfectly contented and happy. During my tenure of office, more than ten years, we have never had a runaway, and that makes these disappearances all the harder to explain. In each case, the surrounding facts have been essentially the same, too. The child was accounted for at night, before the signal was given to extinguish the lights, and— and next morning he just wasn't there. That's all there is to say. There is nothing further I can tell you. You have searched? de Grandin asked. Naturally. The most careful and painstaking investigations have been made in every case. It was not possible to pursue the little ones with hue and cry, of course, but the home has been to considerable expense in hiring private investigators to obtain some information of the missing children all without result. There is no question of kidnapping either, for in every case the child was known to be safely inside, not only the grounds, but in the dormitories, on the night preceding the disappearance. Several reputable witnesses vouch for that in each instance. Hm? de Grandin commented once more. You say you have been at considerable expense in the matter, monsieur? Yes. Good, very good. You will please be at some more considerable expense. Dr. Trowbridge and I are gens d'affaires, businessmen, as well as scientists, monsieur, and while we shall esteem it an honor to serve the fatherless and motherless orphans of your home, we must receive an adequate consideration from Monsieur Richards. We shall undertake the matter of ascertaining the whereabouts of your missing charges at five hundred dollars apiece. Do you agree? But that would be— Three thousand dollars, the visitor began. Perfectly, de Grandin interrupted. The police will undertake the case for nothing. But we cannot have the police, as I've just explained. You cannot have us for less, the Frenchman cut in. This Monsieur Richards, I know him of old. He desires not the publicity of a search by the gendarme, and though he loves me not, he has confidence in my ability. Otherwise he would not have sent you. Go to him and say, Jules de Grandin will act for him for no less fee than that I have mentioned. Meantime, will you smoke? He passed a box of my cigars to the caller, held a lighted match for him, and refused to listen to another word concerning the business which had brought Gervaise on the twenty-mile jaunt from Springville. Trowbridge, mon vieux? 
he informed me the following morning at breakfast. I assure you, it pays handsomely to be firm with these captains of industry, such as Monsieur Richards. Before you had arisen, my friend, that man of wealth was haggling with me over the telephone, as though we were a pair of dealers in second-hand furniture. Morbleu, it was like an auction. Bid by bid he raised his offer for our services, until he met my figure. Today his attorneys prepare a formal document, agreeing to pay us five hundred dollars for the explanation of the disappearance of each of those six little orphans. A good morning's business, n'est-ce pas? De Grandin, I told him. You're wasting your talents in this work. You should have gone into Wall Street. Eh bien, he twisted the tips of his little blond moustache complacently. I think I do very well as it is. When I return to La Belle France next month, I shall take with me upward of fifty thousand dollars, more than a million francs, as a result of my work here. That sum is not to be sneezed upon, my friend. And what is of even more value to me, I take with me the gratitude of many of your countrymen, whose burdens I have been able to lighten. Oh, dear, yes, this trip has been of great use to me, my old one. And... I began, and to-morrow we shall visit this home of the orphans, where Monsieur Gervais nurses his totally inexplicable mystery. Pablo, that mystery shall be explained, or Jules de Grandin is seven thousand francs poorer. All arrangements have been made, he confided as we drove over to Springville the following morning. It would never do for us to announce ourselves as investigators, my friend. So what surer disguise can we assume than that of being ourselves? You and I, are we not physicians? But certainly. Very well. As physicians, we shall appear at the home, and as physicians, we shall proceed to inspect all the little ones, separately and alone. For are we not to give them the chic test for diphtheria immunity? Most assuredly. And then, I began, but he cut my question in two with a quick gesture and a smile. And then, my friend, we shall be guided by circumstances, and if there are no circumstances, Cordieu, but we shall make them. Along there is much to do before we handle Monsieur Richard's check. However dark the mystery overhanging the Springville Orphans' home might have been, nothing indicating it was apparent as de Grandin and I drove through the imposing stone gateway to the spacious grounds. Wide, smoothly kept lawns, dotted here and there with beds of brightly blooming flowers, clean, tastefully arranged buildings of red brick in the Georgian style, and a general air of prosperity, happiness, and peace, greeted us as we brought our car to a halt before the main building of the home. Within, the youngsters were at chapel, and their clear young voices rose pure and sweet as bird songs in springtime, to the accompaniment of a mellow-toned organ. There's a home for the little children above the bright blue sky, where Jesus reigns in glory, a home of peace and joy. No earthly home is like it, nor can with it compare. We tiptoed into the spacious assembly room, dimly lit through tall painted windows, and waited at the rear of the hall till the morning exercises were concluded. Right and left, de Grandin shot his keen, stock-taking glance, inspecting the rows of neatly clothed little ones in the pews, attractive young female attendants, and the mild-faced, grey-haired lady of matronly appearance who presided at the organ. "'Mon Dieu, friend Trowbridge,' he muttered in my ear, "'truly this is mysterious. Why should any of the pauvres orphelins voluntarily quit such a place as this?' "'Shh!' I cut him off. His habit of talking in and out of season, whether at a funeral, a wedding, or other religious service, had annoyed me more than once. As usual, he took the rebuke in good part and favored me with an elfish grin, then fell to studying an elongated figure representing a female saint in one of the stained-glass windows, winking at the beatified lady in a highly irreverent manner. "'Good morning, gentlemen.' Mr. Gervais greeted us as the home's inmates filed past us two by two. "'Everything is arranged for your inspection. The children will be brought to you in my office as soon as you are ready for them. Mrs. Martin!' He turned with a smile to the white-haired organist who had joined us. 
These are Dr. de Grandin and Dr. Trowbridge. They're going to inspect the children for diphtheria immunity this morning. To us, he added, Mrs. Martin is our matron. Next to myself, she has entire charge of the home. We call her Mother Martin, and all our little ones love her as though she were really their own mother. How do you do? The matron acknowledged the introduction, favoring us with a smile of singular sweetness, and extending her hand to each of us in turn. Madame, de Grandin took her smooth white hand in his, American fashion, then bowed above it, raising it to his lips. Your little charges are indeed more than fortunate to bask in the sunshine of your ministrations. It seemed to me he held the lady's hand longer than necessity required. But, like all his countrymen, my little friend was more than ordinarily susceptible to the influence of a pretty woman, young or elderly. "'And now, monsieur, if you please,' he resigned Mother Martin's plump hand regretfully and turned to the superintendent, his slim black brows arched expectantly. "'Of course,' Gervaise replied. "'This way, if you please.' It would be better if we examined the little ones separately and without any of the attendants being present, de Grandin remarked in a business-like tone, placing his medicine case on the desk and unfolding a white jacket. But surely you cannot hope to glean any information from the children, the superintendent protested. I thought you were simply going to make a pretense of examining them as a blind. Mrs. Martin and I have questioned every one of them most carefully, and I assure you there is absolutely nothing to be gained by going over that ground again. Besides, some of them have become rather nervous, and we don't want to have their little heads filled with disagreeable notions, you know. I think it would be much better if Mother Martin or I were present while the children are examined. It would give them greater confidence, you know, monsieur." De Grandin spoke in the level, toneless voice he assumed before one of his wild outbursts of anger. "'You will please do exactly as I command. Otherwise—' He paused significantly and began removing the clinical smock. "'Oh, by no means, my dear sir,' the superintendent hastened to assure him. "'No, no, I wouldn't for the world have you think I was trying to put difficulties in your way. Oh, no, I only thought—' Monsieur, the little Frenchman repeated, from this time onward, until we dismiss the case, I shall do the thinking. You will kindly have the children brought to me one at a time. To see the spruce little scientist among the children was a revelation to me. Always tart of speech to the verge of bitterness, with a keen mordant wit which cut like a razor or scratched like a briar, De Grandin seemed the last one to glean information from children naturally timid in the presence of a doctor. But his smile grew brighter and brighter, and his humor better and better, as child after child entered the office, answered a few seemingly idle questions, and passed from the room. At length a little girl, some four or five years old, came in, the hem of her blue pinafore twisted between her plump baby fingers in embarrassment. Ah. De Grandin breathed. Here is one from whom we shall obtain something of value, my friend, or I much miss my guess. Hola, ma petite tete de choux, he exclaimed, snapping his fingers at the tot. Come hither and tell Dr. de Grandin all about it. His little cabbage head gave him an answering smile, but one of somewhat doubtful quality. Dr. Grandin not hurt Betsy? she asked half confidently, half fearsomely. Pableu, not I, my pigeon, he replied as he lifted her to the desk. Regardez-vous. From the pocket of his jacket he produced a little box of bonbons and thrust them into her chubby hand. Eat them, my little onion, he commanded. Tete de diable, but they are an excellent medicine for loosening the tongue. Nothing loath, the little girl began munching the sweetmeats, regarding her new friend with wide, wandering eyes. "'They said you would hurt me, cut my tongue out with a knife if I talked to you,' she informed him, then paused to pop another chocolate button into her mouth. "'Mordan Shah, did they indeed?' he demanded. "'And who was the vile, detestable one who so slandered Jules de Grandin? I shall—' Shh! He interrupted himself— 
turning and crossing the office in three long cat-like leaps. At the entrance he paused a moment, then grasped the handle and jerked the door suddenly open. On the sill, looking decidedly surprised, stood Mr. Gervais. Ah, monsieur! De Grandin's voice held an ugly, rasping note as he glared directly into the superintendent's eyes. You are perhaps seeking for something, yes? Uh, yes. Gervaise coughed softly, dropping his gaze before the Frenchman's blazing stare. Uh, that is, you see, I left my pencil here this morning, and I didn't think you'd mind if I came to get it. I was just going to rap when— When I saved you the labor, n'est-ce pas? the other interrupted. Very good, my friend. Here. Hastening to the desk, he grabbed a handful of miscellaneous pencils, pens, and other writing implements, including a stick of marking chalk. Take these, and get gone in the name of the good God. He thrust the utensils into the astonished superintendent's hands, then turned to me, the gleam in his little blue eyes and the heightened color in his usually pale cheeks showing his barely suppressed rage. Trowbridge, mon vieux, he almost hissed. I fear I shall have to impress you into service as a guard. Stand at the outer door, my friend, and should anyone come seeking pens, pencils, paint brushes, or printing presses, have the goodness to boot him away. Me, I do not relish having people looking for pencils through the keyhole of the door while I interrogate the children. Thereafter I remained on guard outside the office, while child after child filed into the room, talked briefly with de Grandin, and left by the farther door. Well, did you find out anything worthwhile? I asked when the examination was finally ended. Um, he responded, stroking his mustache thoughtfully. Yes and no, with children of a tender age, as you know, the line of demarcation between recollection and imagination is none too clearly drawn. The older ones could tell me nothing. The younger ones relate a tale of a white lady who visited the dormitory on each night a little one disappeared. But what does that mean? Some attendant making a nightly round? Perhaps a window curtain blown by the evening breeze? Maybe it had no surer foundation than some childish whim— "'seized and enlarged upon by the other little ones. "'There is little we can go on at this time, I fear. "'Meanwhile,' his manner brightened, "'I think I hear the sound of the dinner gong. "'Pablo, I am as hungry as a carp and empty as a kettle drum. "'Let us hasten to the refectory.' "'Dinner was a silent meal. "'Superintendent Gervais seemed ill at ease under de Grandin's sarcastic stare.' and the other attendants who shared the table with us took their cue from their chief, and conversation languished before the second course was served. Nevertheless, de Grandin seemed to enjoy everything set before him to the uttermost, and made strenuous efforts to entertain Mrs. Martin, who sat immediately to his right. "'But, madame,' he insisted, when the lady refused a serving of the excellent beef which constituted the roast course— "'Surely you will not reject this so excellent roast. "'Remember, it is the best food possible for humanity, "'for not only does it contain the nourishment we need, "'but great quantities of iron are to be found in it as well. "'Come, permit that I help you to that, "'which is at once food and tonic.' "'No, thank you,' the matron replied, "'looking at the juicy roast with a glance almost of repugnance. "'I am a vegetarian.' How terrible, de Grandin commiserated, as though she had confessed some overwhelming calamity. Yes, Mother Martin's been subsisting entirely on vegetables for the last six months, one of the nurses, a plump red-cheeked girl, volunteered. She used to eat as much meat as any of us, but all of a sudden she turned against it, and— Oh, Mrs. Martin! The matron had risen from her chair, leaning halfway across the table and the expression on her countenance was enough to justify the girl's exclamation. Her face had gone pale, absolutely livid. Her lips were drawn back against her teeth like those of a snarling animal, and her eyes seemed to protrude from their sockets as they blazed into the startled girls. 
It seemed to me that not only rage, but something like loathing and fear were expressed in her blazing orbs as she spoke in a low, passionate voice. Miss Bosworth, what I used to do and what I do now are entirely my own business. Please do not meddle with my affairs. For a moment silence reigned at the table, but the Frenchman saved the situation by remarking, Dear madame, the fervor of the convert is ever greater than that of those to the manner born. The Buddhist who eats no meat from his birth is not half so strong in defense of his diet as the lately converted European vegetarian. To me, as we left the dining hall, he confided, A charming meal, most interesting and instructive. Now, my friend, I would that you drive me home at once, immediately. I wish to borrow a dog from Sergeant Costello. What? I responded incredulously. You want to borrow a... Perfectly a dog, a police dog, if you please. I think we shall have use for the animal this night. Oh, all right, I agreed. The workings of his agile mind were beyond me, and I knew it would be useless to question him. Shortly after sundown, we returned to the Springville home. A large and by no means amiable police dog lent us by the local constabulary, sharing the car with us. "'You will engage Monsieur Gervais in conversation, if you please,' my companion commanded, as we stopped before the younger children's dormitory. "'While you do so, I shall assist this so excellent brute into the hall where the little ones sleep, and tether him in such manner that he cannot reach any of his little roommates, yet can easily dispute passage with any one attempting to enter the apartment. "'Tomorrow morning we shall be here early enough to remove him,' before any of the attendants who may enter the dormitory on legitimate business can be bitten. As for others, he shrugged his shoulders and prepared to lead the lumbering brute into the sleeping quarters. His program worked perfectly. Mr. Gervais was nothing loath to talk with me about the case, and I gathered that he had taken de Grandin's evident dislike much to heart. Again and again he assured me, almost with tears in his eyes, that he had not the least intention of eavesdropping when he was discovered at the office door, but that he had really come in search of a pencil. It seemed he used a special indelible lead in making out his reports, and had discovered that the only one he possessed was in the office after we had taken possession. His protestations were so earnest that I left him convinced de Grandin had done him an injustice. Next morning I was at a loss what to think. Arriving at the orphanage well before daylight, de Grandin and I let ourselves into the little children's dormitory, mounted the stairs to the second floor where the youngsters slept, and released the vicious dog which the Frenchman had tethered by a stout nail driven into the floor and a ten-foot length of stout steel chain. Inquiry among the building's attendants elicited the information that no one had visited the sleeping apartment after we left— as there had been no occasion for any one connected with the home to do so. Yet on the floor, beside the dog, there lay a ragged square of white linen, such as might have been ripped from a night-robe or a suit of pajamas, reduced almost to a pulp by the savage brute's worrying, and, when Superintendent Gervais entered the office to greet us, he was wearing his right arm in a sling. "'You are injured, monsieur!' De Grandin asked with mock solicitude, noting the superintendent's bandaged hand with dancing eyes. Yes, the other replied, coughing apologetically. Yes, sir, I, uh, I cut myself rather badly last night on a pane of broken glass in my quarters. The window must have been broken by a shutter being blown against it, and— Quite so, the Frenchman agreed amiably. They bite terrifically. These broken window panes, is it not so? Bite? Gervaise echoed, regarding the other with a surprised, somewhat frightened expression. I hardly understand you. Oh, yes, I see. He smiled rather feebly. You mean cut? Monsieur, de Grandin assured him solemnly as he rose to leave. I did mean exactly what I said. No more, and certainly no less. Now what? 
I queried as we left the office and the gaping superintendent behind us. No, no, he responded irritably. I know not what to think, my friend. One thing he points this way, another he points elsewhere. Me, I am like a mariner in the midst of a fog. Go you to the car, friend Trowbridge, and chaperone our so estimable ally. I shall pay a visit to the laundry meantime. None too pleased with my assignment, I re-entered my car and made myself as agreeable as possible to the dog, devoutly hoping that the hearty breakfast de Grandin had provided him had taken the edge off his appetite. I had no wish to have him stay his hunger on one of my limbs. The animal proved docile enough, however, and besides opening his mouth once or twice in prodigious yawns, which gave me an unpleasantly close view of his excellent dentition, did nothing to cause me alarm. When de Grandin returned, he was fuming with impatience and anger. Sacre nom d'Angrion, he swore. It is beyond me. Undoubtlessly this Monsieur Gervaise is a liar. It was surely no glass which caused the wound in his arm last night. Yet there is no suit of torn pyjamas belonging to him in the laundry. Perhaps he didn't send them to be washed, I ventured with a grin. If I'd been somewhere I was not supposed to be last night, and found someone had posted a man-eating dog in my path, I'd not be in a hurry to send my torn clothing to the laundry where it might betray me. Tiens, you reason excellently, my friend, he complimented. But can you explain how it is that there is no torn night-clothing of Monsieur Gervais at the washrooms to-day, yet two ladies' night-robes, one of Mere Martin's, one of Mademoiselle Bosworth's, display exactly such rents as might have been made by having this bit of cloth torn from them. He exhibited the relic we had found beside the dog that morning, and stared gloomily at it. Hmm. It looks as if you hadn't any facts which will stand the acid test just yet, I replied flippantly, but the seriousness with which he received my commonplace rejoinder startled me. Morbleu, the acid test, you say? he exclaimed. Dieu de Dieu de Dieu de Dieu, it may easily be so. Why did I not think of it before? Perhaps. Possibly. Who knows? It may be so. What in the world? I began, but he cut me short with a frantic gesture. No, no, my friend, not now, he implored. Me? I must think. I must make this empty head of mine do the work for which it is so poorly adapted. Let us see. Let us... Consider, let us ratiocinate. Parbleu, I have it! He drew his hands downward from his forehead with a quick impatient motion and turned to me. Drive me to the nearest pharmacy, my friend. If we do not find what we wish there, we must search elsewhere and elsewhere until we discover it. Mon Dieu, Trowbridge, my friend, I thank you for mentioning that acid test. Many a wholesome truth is contained in words of idle jest, I do assure you. Five miles out of Springville, a gang of workmen were resurfacing the highway, and we were forced to detour over a back road. Half an hour's slow driving along this brought us to a tiny Italian settlement, where a number of laborers originally engaged on the Lackawanna's right-of-way had bought up the swampy, low-lying lands along the creek, and converted them into model-track gardens. At the head of the single street composing the hamlet, was a neatly whitewashed plank building bearing the sign Farmacia Italiana, together with a crudely painted representation of the Italian royal coat of arms. Here, my friend, de Grandin commanded, plucking me by the sleeve. Let us stop here a moment, and inquire of the estimable gentleman who conducts this establishment that which we would know. But what? I began, then stopped, noting the futility of my question. Jules de Grandin had already leaped from the car and entered the little drug store. Without preamble, he addressed a flood of fluent Italian to the druggist, receiving monosyllabic replies which gradually expanded both in verbosity and volume, accompanied by much waving of hands and lifting of shoulders and eyebrows. What they said I had no means of knowing, since I understood no word of Italian but I heard the word acido repeated several times by each of them during the three minutes' heated conversation. 
When de Grandin finally turned to leave the store, with a grateful bow to the proprietor, he wore an expression as near complete mystification and surprise as I had ever seen him display. His little eyes were rounded with mingled thought and amazement, and his narrow red lips were pursed beneath the line of his slim blond moustache, as though he were about to emit a low, soundless whistle. Well? I demanded as we regained the car. Did you find out what you were after? Eh? he answered absently. Did I find... Trowbridge, my friend, I know not what I found out, but this I know. Those who lighted the witch-fires in olden days were not such fools as we believe them. Parbleu, at this moment they are grinning at us from their graves, or I am much mistaken. Tonight, my friend, be ready to accompany me back to that orphan's home, where the devil nods approval to those who perform his business so skilfully. That evening he was like one in a muse, eating sparingly and seemingly without realizing what food he took, answering my questions absent-mindedly or not at all, even forgetting to light his customary cigarette between dinner and dessert. Nom d'un champignon, he muttered, staring abstractedly into his coffee cup. It must be that it is so. But who would believe it? I sighed in vexation. His habit of musing aloud but refusing to tell the trend of his thoughts while he arranged the factors of a case upon his mental chessboard was one which always annoyed me. But nothing I had been able to do had swerved him from his custom of withholding all information until he reached the climax of the mystery. No, no, he replied, when I pressed him to take me into his confidence. The less I speak... The less danger I run of showing myself to be one great fool, my friend. Let me reason this business in my own way, I beseech you. And there the matter rested. Toward midnight he rose impatiently and motioned toward the door. Let us go, he suggested. It will be an hour or more before we reach our destination, and that should be the proper time for us to see what I fear we shall behold, friend Trowbridge. We drove across country to Springville, through the early autumn night, in silence, turned in at the orphanage gates and parked before the administration building, where Superintendent Gervais maintained his living quarters. Monsieur, de Grandin called softly, as he rapped gently on the superintendent's door. It is I, Jules de Grandin. For all the wrong I have done you, I humbly apologize. And now I would that you give me assistance. Blinking with mingled sleep and surprise, the little grey-haired official let us into his rooms, and smiled rather fatuously at us. "'What is it you'd like me to do for you, Dr. de Grandin?' he asked. "'I would that you guide us to the sleeping apartments of Mayor Martin. Are they in this building?' "'No,' Gervais replied wonderingly. "'Mother Martin has a cottage of her own over at the south end of the grounds.' She likes the privacy of a separate house, and we— Précisément, the Frenchman agreed, nodding vigorously. I well understand her love of privacy, I fear. Come, let us go. You will show us the way. Mother Martin's cottage stood by the southern wall of the orphanage compound. It was a neat little building, of the semi-bungalow type, constructed of red brick and furnished with a low, wide porch of white-painted wood. Only the chirping of a cricket in the long grass and the long-drawn melancholy call of a crow in the nearby poplars broke the silence of the starlit night as we walked noiselessly up the brick path leading to the cottage door. Gervaise was about to raise the polished brass knocker which adorned the white panels when de Grandin grasped his arm, enjoining silence. Quietly as a shadow, the little Frenchman crept from one of the wide, shutterless front windows to the other, looking intently into the darkened interior of the house. Then, with upraised finger warning us to caution, he tiptoed from the porch and began making a circuit of the house, pausing to peer through each window as he passed it. At the rear of the cottage was a one-story addition, which evidently housed the kitchen, and here the blinds were tightly drawn— though beneath their lower edges there crept a faint, narrow band of lamplight. Ah, bien, 
the Frenchman breathed, flattening his aquiline nose against the window pane as though he would look through the shrouding curtain by virtue of the very intensity of his gaze. A moment we stood there in the darkness, de Grandin's little waxed moustache twitching at the ends like the whiskers of an alert tomcat, Gervais and I in total bewilderment, when the Frenchman's next move filled us with mingled astonishment and alarm. Reaching into an inner pocket, he produced a small diamond-set glass cutter, moistened it with the tip of his tongue, and applied it to the window, drawing it slowly downward, then horizontally, then upward again to meet the commencement of the first downstroke, thus describing an equilateral triangle on the pane. Before the cutter's circuit was entirely completed, he drew what appeared to be a square of thick paper from another pocket, hastily tore it apart, and placed it face downward against the glass. It was only when the operation was complete that I realized how it was accomplished. The plaster he applied to the window was nothing more nor less than a square of fly-paper, and its sticky surface prevented any tell-tale tinkle from sounding as he finished cutting the triangle from the window-pane and carefully lifted it out by means of the gummed paper. Once he had completed his opening, he drew forth a small sharp-bladed pen-knife, and working very deliberately, lest the slightest sound betray him, proceeded to slit a peephole through the opaque window-blind. For a moment he stood there, gazing through his spy-hole, the expression on his narrow face changing from one of concentrated interest to almost incredulous horror, finally to fierce, implacable rage. A moi, Trowbridge, a moi, Gervais! he shouted in a voice which was almost a shriek as he thrust his shoulder unceremoniously against the pane, bursting it into a dozen pieces, and leaped into the lighted room beyond. I scrambled after him as best I could, and the astounded superintendent followed me, mouthing mild protests against our burglarious entry of Mrs. Martin's house. One glance at the scene before me took all thought of our trespass from my mind. Wheeled about to face us, her back to a fiercely glowing coal-burning kitchen range, stood the once placid Mother Martin, enveloped from throat to knees in a commodious apron. But all semblance of her placidity was gone, as she regarded the trembling little Frenchman who extended an accusing finger at her. Across her florid, smooth-skinned face had come such a look of fiendish rage as no flight of my imagination could have painted. Her lips, seemingly shrunk to half their natural thickness, were drawn back in animal fury against her teeth, and her blue eyes seemed forced forward from her face with the pressure of hatred within her. At the corners of her twisting mouth were little flecks of white foam, and her jaw thrust forward like that of an infuriated ape. Never in my life, on any face, either bestial or human, had I seen such an expression. It was a revolting parody of humanity on which I looked, a thing so horrible, so incomparably cruel and devilish, I would have looked away if I could— yet felt my eyes compelled to turn again to the evil visage as a fascinated bird's gaze may be held by the glitter in the serpent's film-covered eye. But horrid as the sight of the woman's transfigured features was, a greater horror showed behind her, for protruding half its length from the fire-grate of the blazing range was something no medical man could mistake after even a split second's inspection. It was the unfleshed radius and ulna bones of a child's forearm, the wrist process still intact where the flesh and periosteum had not been entirely removed in dissection. On the tile-topped kitchen table beside the stove stood a wide-mouthed glass bowl filled with some liquid about the shade of new vinegar, and in this there lay a score of small, glittering white objects, a child's teeth neatly dressed, wound with cord like a roast, and like a roast placed in a wide, shallow pan ready for cooking, was a piece of pale, veal-like meat. The horror of it fairly nauseated me. The thing in woman's form before us was a cannibal, and the meat she had been preparing to bake was— 
my mind refused to form the words, even in the silence of my inner consciousness. You! You! the woman cried in a queer, throaty voice, so low it was scarcely audible, yet so intense in its vibrations that I was reminded of the rumbling of an infuriated cat's cry. How did you find— eh Bien, madame, de Grandin returned, struggling to speak with his customary cynical flippancy, but failing in the attempt. How I did find out is of small moment— what I found, I think you will agree, is of the great import. For an instant I thought the she-fiend would launch herself at him, but her intention lay elsewhere. Before any of us was aware of her move, she had seized the glass vessel from the table, lifted it to her lips, and all but emptied its contents down her throat into frantic swallows. Next instant, frothing, writhing, contorting herself horribly, she lay on the tiled floor at our feet, her lips thickening and swelling with brownish blisters as the poison she had drunk regurgitated from her esophagus and welled up between her tightly set teeth. "'Good heavens!' I cried, bending forward instinctively to aid her, but the Frenchman drew me back. "'Let be, friend Trowbridge, he remarked. "'It is useless. She has taken enough hydrochloric acid to kill three men.' and those movements of hers are only mechanical. Already she is unconscious, and in another five minutes she will have opportunity to explain her so strange life to one far wiser than we. Meantime, he assumed the cold, matter-of-fact manner of a morgue attendant performing his duties, let us gather up these relics of the poor one, he indicated the partially cremated arm-bones and the meat in the shining aluminum pan, and preserve them for decent interment. I— A choking, gasping sound behind us turned our attention to the orphanage superintendent. Following more slowly through the window in de Grandin's wake, he had not at first grasped the significance of the horrors we had seen. The spectacle of the woman's suicide had unnerved him, but when de Grandin pointed to the relics in the stove and on the table, the full meaning of our discovery had fallen on him. With an inarticulate cry he had dropped to the floor in a dead faint. "'Pardieu!' the Frenchman exclaimed, crossing to the water-tap and filling a tumbler. "'I think we had best bestow our services on the living before we undertake the care of the dead, friend Trowbridge.' As he recrossed the kitchen to minister to the unconscious superintendent, there came an odd muffled noise from the room beyond. Qui vive? he challenged sharply, placing the glass of water on the dresser and darting through the door, his right hand dropping into his jacket pocket where the ready pistol lay. I followed at his heels, and as he stood hesitating at the threshold, felt along the wall, found the electric switch, and pressed it, flooding the room with light. On the couch beneath the window, bound hand and foot with strips torn from a silk scarf, and gagged with another length of silk wound about her face, lay little Betsy, the child who had informed us she feared being hurt when we made our pretended inspection of the home's inmates the previous day. Morbleu, de Grandam muttered, as he liberated the little one from her bonds. Another! "'Mother Martin came for Betsy and tied her up,' the child informed us as she raised herself to a sitting posture. "'She told Betsy she would send her to heaven with her papa and mamma, but Betsy must be good and not make a fuss when her hands and feet were tied.' She smiled vaguely at de Grandin. "'Why doesn't Mother Martin come for Betsy?' she demanded. "'She said she would come and send me to heaven in a few minutes, but I waited and waited and she didn't come.' and the cloth over my face kept tickling my nose, and— Mother Martin has gone away on business, ma petite, the Frenchman interrupted. She said she could not send you to your papa and mamma, but if you are a very good little girl, you may go to them some day. Meantime, he fished in his jacket pocket, finally produced a packet of chocolates. Here is the best substitute I can find for heaven at this time, Cherie. Well, old chap, 
I'll certainly have to admit you went right to the heart of the matter, I congratulated as we drove homeward through the paling dawn. But I can't for the life of me figure out how you did it. His answering smile was a trifle wan. The horrors we had witnessed at the matron's cottage had been almost too great a strain for even his iron nerve. Partly it was luck, he confessed wearily, and partly it was thought. When first we arrived at the home for orphans, I had nothing to guide me, but I was convinced that the little ones had not wandered off voluntarily. The environment seemed too good to make any such hypothesis possible. Everywhere I looked I saw evidences of loving care, and faces which could be trusted. But somewhere, I felt, as an old wound feels the coming changes of the weather, there was something evil, some evil force, working against the welfare of those poor ones. Where could it be, and by whom was it exerted? This is for us to find out, I tell me, as I look over the attendants who were visible in the chapel. Gervais, he is an old woman in trousers. Never would he hurt a living thing. No, not even a fly, unless it bit him first. Mayor Martin, she was of a saintly appearance, but when I was presented to her, I learned something which sets my brain to thinking. On the softness of her white hands are stains and calluses. Why? I hold her hand longer than convention required, and all the time I ask me, what has she done to put these hardnesses on her hands? To this I had no answer, so I bethought me, perhaps my nose could tell what my sense of touch could not. When I raised her hand to my lips I made a most careful examination of it, and also I did smell. Trowbridge, my friend, I made sure those disfigurements were due to HCL, what you call hydrochloric acid in English. Morbleu, but this is extraordinary, I tell me. Why should one who has no need to handle acid have those burns on her skin? That are for you to answer in good time, I reply to me. And then I temporarily forget the lady and her hands, because I am sure that Monsieur Gervais desires to know what we say to the young children. Eh bien, I did do him an injustice there. But the wisest of us makes mistakes, my friend, and he gave me much reason for suspicion. When the little Betsy was answering my questions, she tells me that she has seen a white lady, tall and with flowing robes like an angel, come into the dormitory where she and her companions slept on many occasions, and I have ascertained from previous questions that no one enters those sleeping quarters after the lights are out, unless there is specific need for a visit. What was I to think? Had the little one dreamed it, or has she seen this so mysterious white lady on her midnight visits? It is hard to say where recollection stops and romance begins in children's tales, my friend, as you well know. But the little Betsy was most sure the white lady had come only on those nights when her little companions vanished. Here we had something from which to reason, though the morsel of fact was small. However, when I talk further with the child, she informed me it was Mayor Martin who had warned her against us, saying we would surely cut her tongue with a knife if she talked to us. This again was worthy of thought. But Monsieur Gervais had been smelling at the door while we were interrogating the children, and he had also disapproved of our seeing them alone. My suspicion of him would not die easily, my friend. I was stubborn and refused to let my mind take me where it would. So, as you know, when we had posted the four-footed sentry inside the children's door, I made sure we would catch a fish in our trap, and next morning I was convinced we had, for did not Gervais wear his arm in a sling? Truly he did. But at the laundry they showed me no torn pyjamas of his, while I found the gowns of both Mademoiselle Bosworth and Madame Martin torn, as if the dog had bitten them. More mystery. Which way should I turn, if at all? I find that Gervaise's window really had been broken, but that meant nothing. He might have done it himself in order to construct an alibi. Of the reason for Mademoiselle Bosworth's torn robe I could glean no trace, but behind my brain, at the very back of my head, 
Something was whispering at me, something I could not hear but which I knew was of importance. Then, as we drove away from the home, you mentioned the acid test. My friend, those words of yours let loose the memory which cried aloud to me, but which I could not clearly understand. Of a suddenness I did recall the scene at luncheon, how Mademoiselle Bosworth declared Mayor Martin ate no meat for six months, and how angry Madame Martin was at the mention of it. Parbleu, for six months the little ones had been disappearing. For six months Madame Martin had eaten no meat, yet she were plump and well-nourished. She had the look of a meat-eater. Still, I protested, I don't see how that put you on the track. No, he replied. Remember, my friend, how we stopped to interview the druggist. Why, think you, we did that. Hanged if I know, I confessed. Of course not, he agreed with a nod. But I know. Suppose, I say to me, someone have eaten the flesh of these poor disappeared children. What would that one do with the bones? He would undoubtedly bury or burn them, I reply. Very good, but more likely he would burn them, since buried bones may be dug up, and burned bones are only ashes, but what of the teeth? They would resist fire, such as can be had in the ordinary stove, yet surely they might betray the murderer. But of course, I admit, but why should not the murderer reduce those teeth with acid, hydrochloric acid, for instance? Aha, I tell me, that are the answer. Already you have one whose hands are acid-stained without adequate explanation, also one who eats no meat at table. Find out now who have bought acid from some neighboring drug store, and perhaps you will have the answer to your question. The Italian gentleman who keeps the pharmacy tells me that a lady of very kindly mien comes to him frequently and buys hydrochloric acid, which she calls muriatic acid showing she are not a chemist but knows only the commercial term for this stuff. She is a tall, large lady with white hair and kind blue eyes. It are Mare Martin, I tell me. She are the white lady of the orphanage. Then I consult my memory some more and decide we shall investigate this night. Listen, my friend, in the Paris Sûreté we have the history of many remarkable cases, not only from France but other lands as well. In the year 1849 a miscreant named Sviatek was hauled before the Austrian courts on a charge of cannibalism, and in the same year there was another somewhat similar case where a young English lady, a girl of much refinement and careful education and nurture, was the defendant. Neither of these was naturally fierce or bloodthirsty, yet their crimes were undoubted. In the case of the beggar we have a transcription of his confession. He did say in part, When first driven by dire hunger to eat of human flesh, he became, as the first horrid morsel passed his lips, as if it were a ravening wolf. He did rend and tear the flesh and growl in his throat like a brute beast the while. From that time forth he could stomach no other meat, nor could he abide the sight or smell of it. Beef, pork, or mutton filled him with revulsion. And had not Madame Martin exhibited much the same symptoms at table, truly? Things of a strange nature sometimes occur, my friend. The mind of man is something of which we know but little, no matter how learnedly we prate. Why does one man love to watch a snake creep, while another goes into ecstasies of terror at sight of a reptile? Why do some people hate the sight of a cat, while others fear a tiny harmless mouse as though he were the devil's brother-in-law? None can say, yet these things are. So I think it is with crime. This Madame Martin was not naturally cruel. Though she killed and ate her charges, you will recall how she bound the little Betsy with silk, and did it in such a way as not to injure her, or even to make her uncomfortable. That meant mercy? By no means, my friend. Myself I have seen peasant women in my own land weep upon and fondle the rabbit they were about to kill for déjeuner. They did love and pity the poor little beast which was to die, but 
Que voulez-vous? One must eat. Some thought like this, I doubt not, was in Madame Martin's mind, as she committed murder. Somewhere in her nature was a thing we cannot understand, a thing which made her crave the flesh of her kind for food, and she answered the call of that craving, even as the taker of drugs is helpless against his vice. Tiens, I am convinced that if we searched her house we should have the explanation of the children's disappearance, and you yourself witnessed what we saw. It was well she took the poison when she did. Death, or incarceration in a madhouse, would have been her portion had she lived, and— uh, He shrugged his shoulders. The world is better off without her. Um, I see how you worked it out, I replied. "'But will Mr. Richards be satisfied? "'We've accounted for one of the children "'because we found part of her skeleton in the fire. "'But can we swear the rest disappeared in the same manner? "'Richards will want a statistical table of facts "'before he parts with three thousand dollars, I imagine.' "'Pablo, will he indeed?' de Grandin answered, "'something like his usual elfish grin spreading across his face. "'What think you would be the result?' Were we to notify the authorities of the true facts leading up to Madame Martin's suicide? Would not the newspapers make much of it? Cordieu, I shall say they would. And the home for orphans, over which Monsieur Richards presides so pompously, would receive what you call the black eye. Morbleu, my friend, the very black eye indeed. No, no, me? I think Monsieur Richards will gladly pay us the reward nor haggle over terms. Meanwhile, we are at home once more. Come, let us drink the cognac. Drink cognac? I answered. Why, in heaven's name? Parbleu, we shall imbibe a toast to the magnificent three thousand dollars Monsieur Richards pays us tomorrow morning. The Poltergeist And so, Dr. de Grandin, our visitor concluded, this is really a case for your remarkable powers. Jules de Grandin selected a fresh cigarette from his engine-turned silver case, tapped its end thoughtfully against his well-manicured thumbnail, and regarded the caller with one of his disconcertingly unwinking stares. Am I to understand that all other attempts to effect a cure have failed, monsieur? he asked at length. Utterly. We've tried everything in reason, and out of it. "'Captain Loudon replied. "'We've had some of the best neurologists in consultation. "'We've employed faith healers, spiritualistic mediums, "'even had her given absent treatment, all to no avail. "'All the physicians, all the cultists and quacks have failed us. "'Now, now I do not think I care to be numbered among those quacks, monsieur,' "'the Frenchman returned coldly, "'expelling a double column of smoke from his nostrils.' Had you called me into consultation with an accredited physician— But that's just it, the captain interrupted. Every physician we've had has been confident he could work a cure, but they've all failed. Julia is a lovely girl. I don't say it because she's my daughter, I state it as a fact, and was to have been married this fall. And now this— this disorder has taken complete possession of her, and it's wrecking her life. Robert— Lieutenant Proudfit, her fiancé, and I are almost beside ourselves. And as for my daughter, I fear her mind will give way and she'll destroy herself, unless somebody can do something. Ah? Huh? The little Frenchman arched the narrow black brows, which were such a vivid contrast to his blond hair and moustache. Why did you not say so before, Monsieur le Capitaine? It is not merely the curing of one nervous young lady that you would have me undertake, but the fruition of a romance I should bring about. Bien, good, very well, I accept. If you will also retain my good friend Dr. Trowbridge, so that there shall be a locally licensed and respected physician in the case, my powers, which you have been kind enough to call remarkable, are entirely at your disposal. Splendid, Captain Loudon agreed, rising. "'Then it's all arranged. I can expect you to—' "'One moment, if you please,' de Grandin interrupted, "'raising his slender, womanishly small hand for silence. 
Suppose we make a précis of the case before we go further. He drew a pad of notepaper and a pencil toward him as he continued. Your daughter, Mademoiselle Julie, how old is she? Twenty-nine. A most charming age, the little Frenchman commented, scribbling a note. And she is your only child? Yes. Now these manifestations of the outre, these so unusual happenings, they began to take place about six months ago. Just about. I can't place the time exactly. No matter. They have assumed various mystifying forms. She has refused food. She has had visions. She shouts. She sings uncontrollably. She speaks in a voice which is strange to her. At times she goes into a death-like trance, and from her throat issue strange voices, voices of men, or rather women, even of little children? Yes. And other apparently inexplicable things occur. Chairs, books, tables, even such heavy pieces of furniture as a piano, move from their accustomed places when she is near, and bits of jewellery and other small objects are hurled through the air? Yes, and worse than that. I've seen pins and needles fly from her work-basket and bury themselves in her cheeks and arms, the captain interrupted. And lately she's been persecuted by scars, scars from some invisible source. Great wheels, like the claw marks from some beast, have appeared on her arms and face, right while I looked on, and I've been wakened at night by her screams, and when I rush into her room... I find the marks of long, thin fingers on her throat. It's maddening, sir. Terrifying. I'd say it was a case of demoniacal possession, if I didn't disbelieve all that sort of supernaturalism. Hmm. De Grandin looked up from the pad on which he had been industriously scribbling. There is nothing in the world or out of it which is supernatural, my friend. The wisest man today cannot say where the powers and possibilities of nature begin or end. We say, thus and so is beyond the bounds of our experience. But does that therefore put it beyond the bounds of nature? I think not. Myself, I have seen such things as no man can hear me relate without calling me a liar, and my good unimaginative friend, Trowbridge, has witnessed such wonders as no writer of fiction would dare set down on paper. Yet I do declare, we have never yet seen that which I would call supernatural. But come, let us go, let us hasten to your house, monsieur. I would interview Mademoiselle Julie and see for myself some of these so remarkable afflictions of hers. Remember, he turned his fixed, unwinking stare on our patron as we paused for our outdoor things in the hall. Remember, if you please, monsieur, I am not like those quacks, or even those other physicians who have failed you. I do not say I can work a cure. I can but promise to try. Good, we shall see what we shall see. Let us go. Robert Beauregard Loudon was a retired Navy captain, a widower with more than sufficient means to gratify his rather epicurean tastes, and possessed one of the finest houses in the fashionable new West Side suburb. The furnishings spoke of something more than wealth as we surveyed them. They proclaimed that vague but nevertheless tangible thing known as background, which is only to be had from generations of ancestors to the manor born. Original pieces of mahogany by Sheraton and Chippendale and the brothers Adam, family portraits from the brush of Benjamin West, silver in the best tradition of the early eighteenth-century smiths. Even the dignifiedly aloof, elderly-colored butler announced that our patient's father was in every way an officer and a gentleman in the best sense of the term. "'If you will give Hezekiah your things,' Captain Loudon indicated the solemn old negro with a nod. I'll go up and tell my daughter you're here. I know she'll be glad to— A clanking, banging noise, like a tin can bumping over the cobbles at the tail of some luckless terrier, interrupted his remarks, and we turned in amazement toward the wide, curving staircase at the further end of the long central hall. The noise grew louder, almost deafening, then ceased as abruptly as it began— and a young girl rounded the curve of the staircase, coming slowly toward us. 
She was more than middle height, slender and supple as a willow with, and carried herself with the bearing of a young princess. A lovely, though almost unfashionably long gown of white satin and chiffon draped its uneven hem almost to her ankles, and about her slender bare shoulders and over her arms hung a richly embroidered shawl of Chinese silk. One hand rested lightly on the mahogany rail of the balustrade, as though partly for support, partly for guidance as she slowly descended the red-carpeted steps. This much we saw at first glance, but our second look remained riveted on her sweet, pale face. Almost unbeautifully long it was, pale with the rich, creamy pallor which is some women's birthright and not the result of poor health, and her vivid scarlet lips showed in contrast to her ivory cheeks like a rose fallen in the snow. Brows as delicate as those of a French doll, narrow, curving brows which needed no plucking to accentuate their patrician lines, dipped sharply together above the bridge of her small nose, and lashes, which even at the distance we stood from her, showed their vivid blackness, veiled her eyes. At first I thought her gaze was on the steps before her, and that she made each forward movement with slow care, lest she fall from weakness or nervous exhaustion. But a second scrutiny of her face told me the truth. The girl walked with lowered lids. Whether in natural sleep or in some supernatural trance, she was descending the stairs with tightly closed eyes. La pauvre petite, de Grandin exclaimed under his breath, his gaze fixed on her. Grand Dieu, friend Trowbridge, but she is beautiful. Why did I not come here before? Out of the empty air, apparently some six feet above the girl's proudly poised head, a burst of mocking maniacal laughter answered him, and from the thick-piled carpet suddenly rose again the clang-bang racket we had heard before she came into view. Alas! de Grandin turned a pitying glance on the girl's father. Then, Nom de Dieu! he cried, ducking his head suddenly and looking over his shoulder with rounded eyes. Against the wall of the apartment, some twenty feet distant, there hung a stand of arms, one or two swords, a spear, and several bolos, trophies of the captain's service in the Philippines. As though seized by an invisible hand, one of the bolos had detached itself from the wall, hurtled whistling through the air, and embedded itself nearly an inch deep in the white wainscoting behind the little Frenchman, missing his cheek by the barest fraction of a centimeter as it flew whirring past. The clanking tumult beneath the girl's feet subsided as quickly as it commenced. She took an uncertain step forward and opened her eyes. They were unusually long, purple rather than blue in color, and held such an expression of changeless melancholy as I had never seen in one so young. It was the look of one foredoomed to inescapable death by an incurable disease. Why, she began with the bewildered look of one suddenly roused from sleep. Why, father, what am I doing here? I was in my room lying down when I thought I heard Robert's voice. I tried to get up, but it held me down, and I think I fell asleep. I— Daughter, Captain Loudon spoke gently, the sobs very near the surface for all his iron self-control. These gentlemen are Dr. de Gronda and Dr. Trowbridge. They've come to— Oh! The girl made an impatient gesture which yet seemed somewhat languid, as though even remonstrance were useless. More doctors? Why did you bring them, father? You know they'll be just like all the rest. Nothing can help me. Nothing seems any good. Pardonnez-moi, mademoiselle. De Grandin bent forward in a formal European bow, heels together, elbows stiffly at sides. But I think you will find us most different from the rest. To begin, we come to cure you and give you back to the man you love, and in the second place, I have a personal interest in this case. A personal interest? she inquired, acknowledging his bow with a negligent nod. More blue, but I have. Did not the... The thing which troubles you hurl a bolo knife at me. Sacre non, no fantôme, no lutin shall throw knives at Jules de Grandin, then boast of the exploit to his ghostly fellows. 
Nom de petit chinois. I think we shall show them something before we are finished. Now, mademoiselle, we must ask your pardon for these questions, he began when he had reached the drawing room. To you it is an old and much told tale, but we are ignorant of your case, save for such information as your father has imparted. Tell us, if you please, when did these so strange manifestations begin? The girl regarded him silently a moment, her brooding plum-colored eyes staring almost resentfully into his agate blue ones. It was about six months ago, she began in a lifeless monotone, like a child reciting a rote-learned but distasteful lesson. I had come home from a dance in New York with Lieutenant Proudfit, and it must have been about three o'clock in the morning, for we had not left New York until midnight, and our train was delayed by a heavy sleet storm. Lieutenant Proudfit was stopping overnight with us, for we are—we were—engaged, and I had said good night to him and gone to my room, when it seemed I heard something fluttering and tapping at my window like a bird attracted by the light, or— I don't know what made me think so, but I got the impression somehow a bat beating its wings against the panes. I remember being startled by the noise at first. Then I was overcome with pity for the poor thing, for it was bitter cold outside and the sleet was driving down like whiplashes with the force of the east wind. I went over to the window and opened it to see what was outside. I... She hesitated a moment, then went forward with her narrative. I was partly undressed by this time, and the cold wind blowing through the open window cut like a knife, but I looked out into the storm to see if I could find the bird or whatever it was. Ah? Uh, de Grandin's little eyes were sparkling with suppressed excitement, but there was neither humor nor warmth in their flash. Rather, they were like two tiny pools of clear, adamant-hard ice reflecting a cloudless winter's sky and bright, cold winter sunshine. "'Proceed, if you please,' he commanded, his voice utterly toneless. "'You did open your window to the tapping which was outside. And what did you next?' I looked out and said, "'Come in, you poor creature,' the girl replied. "'Even though I thought it was a bat at the pane, my reason told me it couldn't be, for bats aren't about in the dead of winter, and if it had been one—' Much as I hate the things, I couldn't have slept with the thought of its being outside in my mind. Ah, de Grandin repeated, his voice raised slightly in interrogation. And so you did invite what was outside to come in. Level as his tone was, there was a certain pointedness in the way he spoke the words, almost as though they were uttered in faintly shocked protest. Of course, she returned. I know it was silly for me to speak to a bird that way, as if it could understand, but, you know, we often address animals in that way. At any rate, I might have saved myself the chilling I got, for there was nothing there. I waited several minutes till the cold wind almost set my teeth to chattering, but nothing was visible outside, and there were no further flutterings at the window. Probably not, the Frenchman commented dryly. What then, please? Why, nothing right away. It seemed as though the room had become permanently chilled, though, for even after I'd closed the window, the air was icy cold, and I had to wrap my dressing gown about me while I made ready for bed. Then— She stopped with an involuntary shudder. Yes, and then? He prompted, regarding her narrowly while his lean white fingers tapped a devil's tattoo on his chair arm. Then the first strange thing happened. As I was slipping my gown off, I distinctly felt a hand grasp me about the upper arm, a long, thin, deathly cold hand. She looked up defiantly, as though expecting some skeptical protest, but— Yes, he nodded shortly. And after that? The girl regarded him with a sort of wonder. You believe me? "'Believe I actually felt something grasp me?' she asked incredulously. "'Have you not said so, mademoiselle?' he returned, a thought irritably. "'Proceed, please. 
But every other doctor I've talked to has tried to tell me I didn't, couldn't have actually felt such a thing, she persisted. Mademoiselle! The little man's annoyance cut through the habitual courtesy with which he treated members of the gentler sex as a flame cuts through wax. We do waste time. We are discussing you and your case, not the other physicians or their methods. They have failed. We shall give them none of our valuable time. Bien, you were saying. That I felt a long, cold hand grasp me about the arm, and a moment later, before I had a chance to cry out or even shrink away, something began scratching my skin. It was like a long, blunt fingernail, a human nail, not the claw of an animal, you understand, but it had considerable force behind it, and I could see the skin turning white in its wake. Dr. de Grandin, she leaned forward, staring with wide, frightened eyes into his face. The welts formed letters. Hmm? He nodded unexcitedly. You do recall what they spelled? They didn't spell anything. It was like the ramblings of a Ouija board when the little table seems wandering about from letter to letter without spelling any actual words. I made out a crude printed D, then a smaller R, then an A, and finally a C and U. D-R-A-C-U, that was all. You see, it wasn't a word at all. De Grandin was sitting forward on the extreme edge of his chair, his hands grasping its arms as though he were about to leap from his seat. Dracu, he repeated softly to himself, then still lower. Dieu de Dieu, it is possible, but why? Why, what is it? the girl demanded, his tense attitude reflecting itself in her widened eyes and apprehensive expression. He shook himself like a spaniel emerging from the water. "'It is nothing, mademoiselle,' he assured her with a resumption of his professionally impersonal manner. "'I did think I recognized the word, but I fear I must have been mistaken. You are sure there were no other letters?' "'Positive, that was all. Just those five, no more.' "'Quite, yes. And after that?' "'After that, all sorts of terrible things began happening to me.' Father has told you how chairs and tables rise up when I come near them, and how little objects fly through the air? He nodded, smiling. But of course, he returned. And I myself did see one little thing fly through the air. Parbleu, it did fly unpleasantly close to my head. And these so strange sleeps you have. They come on me almost any time, mostly when I'm least expecting them. One time I was seized with one while on the train, and— Her face flushed bright coral at the recollection. And the conductor thought I was drunk. Bet, de Grandin murmured. And you have not heard the voices, the noises which sometimes accompany you, mademoiselle? No, I've been told of them, but I know nothing of what occurs while I'm in one of these trances. I don't even dream. At least I have no dreams I can remember when I wake up. I only know that I am apt to fall asleep at any time, and frequently wander about while unconscious, waking up in some totally different place. Once I walked halfway to the city while asleep, and narrowly escaped being run down by a taxicab when I came to in the middle of the street. But this is villainous, he burst out. This is infamous. This must not be allowed. Mordieu, I shall not permit it. Something of the girl's weary manner returned as she asked, "'How are you going to stop it?' The others all said, "'Shit, the others! We shall not discuss them, if you please, mademoiselle. Me, I am not as the others. I am Jules de Grandin. First, my friend,' he turned to me, "'I would that you obtain a competent nurse, one whose discretion is matched only by her ability. You know one such.' Très bien. Hasten, rush, fly, to procure her at once. Bid her to come to us with all celerity and be prepared to serve until relieved. Next? He seized a pad and scribbled a prescription. I would that Monsieur le Capitaine has this filled and administers one dose dissolved in hot water at once. It is somno, a harmless mixture of drugs, 
pleasant to the taste, and of undoubted efficacy in this case. It will act better than chloral. But I don't want to take chloral, the girl protested. I have enough trouble with sleep as it is. I want something to ward off sleep, not to induce it. Mademoiselle, he replied with something like a twinkle in his keen little eyes. Have you never heard of combating the devil with flames? Take the medicine as directed. Dr. Trowbridge and I shall return soon, and we shall not rest until we have produced a cure. Never doubt it. This is the strangest case I ever saw, I confided as we drove toward town. The girl's symptoms all point to hysteria of the most violent sort, but I'm hanged if I can account for those diabolical noises which accompanied her down the stairs, or that laugh we heard when she reached the hall, or or the knife which nearly split the head of Jules de Grandin, he supplied. No, my friend, I fear medical science cannot account for those things. Me, I see part of it, but not all, probably not near enough. Do you recall the ancient medical theory concerning Icterus? Jaundice? But of course. You mean it used to be considered a disease rather than a symptom? Precisely. One hundred, two hundred years ago, the craft knew the yellow color of the patient's skin was due to diffused bile in the system. But what caused the diffusion? Ah, uh, that was a question left long unanswered. So it is with this poor girl's case. Me, I recognize the symptoms, and some of their cause is plain to me, but ten thousand little red devils, why? Why should she be the object of this persecution? One does not open a window in the winter time to bid a non-existent bat or bird enter one's house, only to fall victim to such tricks as have plagued Mademoiselle Loudon since that winter's night. No, Morbleu, there was a reason for it, the thing which tapped at her pain being outside that night, friend Trowbridge, and the writing on her arm, that too came not without cause. I listened in amazement to his tirade, but one of his statements struck a responsive chord in my memory. You spoke of writing on her arm, de Grandin, I interposed. When she described it, I thought you seemed to recognize some connection between the incomplete word and her symptoms. Is Dakbu a complete word or the beginning of one? Draku, he corrected shortly. Yes, my friend, it is a word. It is Romanian for devil, or more properly, demon. You begin to see the connection. No, I'm hanged if I do, I retorted. So am I, he replied laconically, and lapsed into moody silence from which my best attempts at conversation failed to rouse him. Lulled into counterfeit rest by the drug de Grandin prescribed, Julia Loudon passed the night comfortably enough, and seemed brighter and happier when we called to interview her next morning. Mademoiselle, de Grandin announced, after the usual medical mummery of taking temperature and pulse had been completed. The day is fine. I prescribe that you go for a drive this morning. Indeed, I strongly urge that you accompany Dr. Trowbridge and me forthwith. He has a number of calls to make, and I would observe what effect the fresh air has upon you. I venture to say, you have had little enough of it lately. I haven't, the girl confessed. You see, since that time when I wandered off in my sleep, I've been afraid to go anywhere by myself, and I've even shrunk from going out with father or Rob, Lieutenant Proudfit. I've been afraid of embarrassing them by one of my seizures. But it will be all right for me to go if you and Dr. Trowbridge are along, I know. She smiled wistfully at him. Of a surety, he agreed, twisting the ends of his trim little blonde mustache. Have no fear, dear lady. I shall see no harm comes to you. Make haste, we would be off. Miss Loudon turned to mount the stairs, a suggestion of freedom and returning health in the spring of her walk, and de Grandin turned a puzzled countenance to Captain Loudon and me. Your daughter's case is far simpler than I had supposed, Monsieur le Capitaine, he announced. 
So much have I been accustomed to encountering what unthinking persons call the supernatural, that I fear I have become what you Americans call hipped on the subject. Now, when first Mademoiselle detailed her experiences to me, I was led to certain conclusions which, happily, have not seemed justified by what we have since observed. Medicine is helpful in most cases of the kind, but I had feared a perfect pandemonium of cacophonous dissonances, like the braying of half a dozen jazz bands suddenly gone crazy, interrupted his speech. Clattering tin cans, jangling cowbells, the wailings of tortured fiddles and discordant shrieks of woodwind instruments all seemed mingled with shouts of wild, demoniac laughter, as a bizarre figure emerged in view at the turn of the stairs, and half leaped, half fell to the hall. For an instant I failed to recognize patrician Julia Loudon in the grotesque thing before us. Her luxuriant black hair had escaped from the Grecian coronel in which she habitually wore it, and hung fantastically about her breast and shoulders, half veiling, half disclosing a face from which every vestige of serenity had disappeared, and on which a leer, no other word expresses it, of mingled craft and cunning and idiotic stupidity, sat like a toad enthroned upon a fungus. She was bare-armed and bare-legged. Indeed, the only garment covering her supple white body was a Spanish shawl, wound tightly about bust and torso, its fringed ends dragging over the floor behind her flying feet, as she capered like a female satyr across the hall drugget to the bedlam accompaniment of infernal noises, which seemed to hover over her like a swarm of poisonous flies above a wounded animal struggling through the mire of a swamp. Ay, ay, ay! she cried in a raucous voice, bending this way and that in time to the devilish racket. Behold my work, foolish man! Behold my mastery! Fool that you are to try to take mine from me! Today I shall make this woman a scandal and disgrace, and tonight I shall require her life. Ay, ay, ay! For a fleeting instant, de Grandin turned an appalled face to me, and I met his flying glance with one no less surprised, for the voice issuing from the girl's slender throat was not her own. No tone or inflection of it was reminiscent of Julia Loudon. Every shrilling syllable spoke of a different individual, a personality instinct with evil vivacity as hers seemed instinct with sweetness and melancholy. Cordieu! De Grandin exclaimed between set teeth, springing toward the girl, then halting in horrified amazement as though congealed to ice in his tracks. From every side of the room, like flickering beams of light, tiny bits of metal flew toward the girl's swaying body, and in an instant her arms, legs, throat, even her cheeks, were encrusted with glittering pins and needles buried point-deep in her creamy skin, like the torture implements driven into the bodies of the pain-defying fakirs of India. Almost it seemed as though the girl had suddenly become a powerful electromagnet to which every particle of movable metal in the apartment had leaped. For an instant she stood swaying there, the cruel points embedded in her flesh, yet seemingly causing no pain. Then a wild, heart-rending shriek broke from her lips, and her eyes opened wide in sudden terror and consternation. Instantly it was apparent she had regained consciousness, realized her position, her almost complete nudity, and the biting, stinging points of the countless needles all at once. "'Quick, Trowbridge, my friend,' de Grandin urged, leaping forward. "'Take her, my old one. Do not permit her to fall. Those pins, they will surely impale her if she drops.' Even as I seized the fainting girl in my arms, the Frenchman was furiously garnering the pins from her flesh, cursing volubly in mingled French and English as he worked. Pable, he swore. It is the devil's work of a surety. By damn, I shall have words to say to this accursed Dracou, who sticks pins in young ladies and throws knives at Jules de Grandin. 
Following him, I bore the swooning girl up the stairs, placed her on her bed, and turned furiously in search of the nurse. What could the woman have been thinking of to let her patient leave her room in such a costume? "'Miss Stanton!' I called angrily. "'Where are you?' A muffled sound, halfway between a scream and an articulate cry, and a faint ineffectual tap-tap on the door of the closet answered me. Snatching the door of the clothes-press open, I found her lying on the floor half-smothered by fallen dresses, her mouth gagged by a Turkish towel, wrists tied behind her, and ankles lashed together with knotted silk stockings. Ah! Uh, oh! she gasped as I relieved her of her fetters and helped her, half-fainting, to her feet. It took me, Dr. Trowbridge. I was helpless as a baby in its hands. De Grandin looked up from his ministrations to Julia Loudon. "'What was the it which took you, mademoiselle?' he inquired, folding back the shawl from the girl's injured limbs and deftly shoving her beneath the bedclothes. "'Was it mademoiselle Loudon?' "'No!' the nurse gasped, her hands still trembling with fright and nervousness. "'Oh, no, not Miss Loudon, sir. It was—I uh, don't know what.' Miss Loudon came upstairs a few moments ago, and said you and Dr. Trowbridge were taking her motoring, and she must change her clothes. She began removing her house-dress, but kept taking off her garments until she was—she was—she was, she hesitated a moment, catching her breath in long, laboring gasps. "'Mon Dieu, yes!' de Grandin cut in testily. "'We do waste time, mademoiselle. She did remove her clothing until she was what? Completely nude?' Yes, the nurse replied with a shudder. I was about to ask her if she needed to change all her clothes when she turned and looked at me, and her face was like the face of a devil, sir. Then something seemed to come down on me like a wet blanket. No, not like a blanket, either. It clung to me and bore me down and smothered me all at once. But it was transparent, sir. I could feel it, but I couldn't see it. It was like a like a terrible big jellyfish, sir. It was cold and slimy and strong, strong as a hundred giants. I tried to call out, and it oozed into my mouth, choked me. Ugh. She shuddered at the recollection. Then I must have fainted, for the next thing I knew everything was dark, and I heard Dr. Trowbridge calling me. So I tried to call out and kicked as hard as I could, and— And voila, here you are. De Grandin interrupted. I marvel not you are nervous, mademoiselle. Cordieu, are we not also? Attend me, Trowbridge, my friend, he commanded. Do you remain with mademoiselle Stanton and the patient? Me, I shall go below and procure three drinks of brandy for us. Yes, morbleu, four I shall obtain. For one I shall drink myself immediately, right away at once, before I return. Meantime watch well, mademoiselle Julie for I think she will require much watching before all is done. A moment later the clatter of his heels sounded on the polished boards of the hall floor as he hastened below stairs in search of stimulant. It is damnable, damnable, my friends, the little Frenchman cried a few moments later as he, Captain Loudon, and I conferred in the lower hall. This poltergeist. It has complete possession of the poor Mademoiselle Julie, and it has manifested itself to Mademoiselle Stanton as well. Pardieu, if we but knew whence it comes, and why, we might better be able to combat it. But all, all, is a mystery. It comes, it wreaks havoc, and it remains. Dieu de Dieu de Dieu de Dieu. He strode fiercely back and forth across the rug, twisting first one, then the other end of his diminutive moustache, until I thought he would surely drag the hairs from his lip. "'If only we could—' he began again, striding across the hall and bringing up before a boule cabinet which stood between two low windows. "'If only we could—' "'Ah, what? Who is this, monsieur le capitaine, if you please?' His slender, carefully manicured forefinger pointed to an exquisite little miniature which stood in a gold easel frame on the cabinet's top. Looking over his shoulder, I saw the picture of a young girl, 
black-haired, oval-faced, purple-eyed, her red lips showing against the pallor of her face, almost like a wound in healthy flesh. There was a subtle something of difference, more in expression than in feature, from the original. Nevertheless, I recognized the likeness as a well-executed portrait of Julia Loudon, though it had been made, I imagined, several years earlier. Why, I exclaimed in astonishment at his question, why, it's Miss Loudon, de Grandin. Ignoring my remark, he kept his fixed, unwinking stare upon the captain, repeating, This lady, monsieur, she is who? It's a picture of my niece, Julia's cousin, Captain Loudon returned shortly. Then, Don't you think we could occupy our time better than with trifles like that? My daughter, trifles, monsieur, de Grandin cut in. There are no trifles in a case such as this. All, all is of the importance. Tell me of this young lady, if you please. There is a so remarkable resemblance, yet a look in the eyes which is not the look of your daughter. I would know much of her, if you please. She was my niece, Anna Vasilko, the captain replied. That picture was made in St. Petersburg, Petrograd, or Leningrad, as it is called now, before the World War. Ah? De Grandin stroked his moustache gently, as though making amends for the furious pulling to which he had subjected it a moment before. You did say was, monsieur. May I take it, then, that she is no more? He cast a speculative glance at the portrait again, then continued. And her name, so different from yours, yet her appearance so like your daughter's, will you not explain? Captain Loudon looked as though he would like to wring the inquisitive little Frenchman's neck, but complied with his request instead. "'My wife was a Romanian lady,' he began, speaking with evident annoyance. "'I was stationed for duty at our legation at Bucharest in 1895, and there I met my wife, who was a Mademoiselle Seraki. I was married before returning to floating service,' and my wife's twin sister, Zoe, married Leonidas Vasilko, a young officer attached to the Russian embassy, about the same time. Things were beginning to move a little, even in those days. One or two near quarrels with European nations over the Monroe Doctrine had warned even the lunkheads at Washington that we'd best be getting some sort of navy in the water, and there was no time for a protracted honeymoon after our marriage. I had to leave my bride of two months and report for duty to the flagship of the Mediterranean Squadron. Anna, my wife, stayed on at Bucharest for a time, then moved from one port to another along the European coast, so as to be fairly near me when I could get infrequent furloughs. Finally I was moved to the China Station, and she went to live with her sister and brother-in-law at St. Petersburg. Her baby, Julia, and their little girl, Anna, were born on the same day, and resembled each other even more than their mothers did. Following the Spanish War and my transfer to home service, my wife divided her time between America and Europe, spending almost as much time in Russia as she did in Washington. Julia and Anna were educated together in a French convent, and later went to the Smolny Institute in St. Petersburg. Anna joined up as a nurse in the Russian Red Cross at the outbreak of the World War and was in France when the revolution broke. That probably saved her life. Both her parents were shot by the Bolshevists as reactionaries, and she came to live with us after the armistice. Somehow she didn't take very well to American ways, and when Robert, Lieutenant Proudfit, came along and began paying court to Julia, Anna seemed to take it as a sort of personal affront. Seems she had some sort of fool idea she and Julia were more than cousins— and ought to remain celibate to devote their lives to each other. To tell the truth, though, I rather fancy she was more than a little taken by Proudfit herself, and when he preferred Julia to her, well, it didn't please her any too much. Ah, de Grandin breathed, a trace of the heat-lightning flash which betokened excitement showing in his cool eyes. And Mademoiselle Anna, she is... she died, poor child. Loudon responded. She did commit suicide. The Frenchman's words were so low we could scarcely hear them. I didn't say that, 
the captain returned coldly. Pardonnez-moi, monsieur le capitaine, the other shot back. But you did not say otherwise, and the pause before you mentioned her death. Surely that was something more than a tribute of momentary regret. Uh, yes, you're right. The poor youngster committed suicide by drowning herself about six months ago. Six months, did you say? The little Frenchman's face was so near his host's that I feared the spike of his waxed moustache would scratch the captain's cheek. Six months ago she did drown herself, in the ocean, and Mademoiselle Julie's engagement to Lieutenant Proudfit it was announced when? It had just been announced. But look here, I say, see here! Captain Loudon began violent protest, but de Grandin was grinning mirthlessly at him. I look there, monsieur, he replied, and I see there. Parbleu, I see far past. Six months, six months, everything it dates from six months of yore. The death of Mademoiselle Anna, the engagement of Mademoiselle Julie, the tapping at her window, the beginning of these so strange signs and wonders, all are six months old. Grâce adieu, my friend, I begin to see the light at last. Come, Trowbridge, my friend. First for the information, then the action. Turning on his heel, he mounted the stairs three at a time, beckoning me violently as he did so. Mademoiselle! Mademoiselle Julie! he cried, bursting into the patient's room with hardly a perceptible pause between his knock and the nurse's summons to enter. You have not told me all, Mademoiselle, no, nor near all. This Mademoiselle Anna, who was she, and what relation was there between you and her? Of haste, speak quickly. It is important that I should know all. Why, Miss Loudon looked at him with startled eyes. She was my cousin. But yes, that much I know. What I desire to learn is if there was some close bond, some secret understanding between you. The girl regarded him fixedly a moment, then, Yes, there was. Both of us were in love with Lieutenant Proudfit, but he seemed to prefer me, for some reason. When Anna saw he was proof against all her wiles, and she was an accomplished coquette, she became very morose, and talked constantly of suicide. I tried to laugh her out of the idea, but she persisted. Finally— I began to believe she was serious, and I told her, If you kill yourself, so will I. Then there will be two of us dead, and nobody any the happier. Ah, de Grandin regarded her intently. And then? She gave me one of those queer, long looks of hers, and said, Maybe I hold you to that promise, cousin. Gisen kopeki. Life is but a kopeck. Maybe we spend him, you and I. And that was all she said at the time. But two months later, just before Lieutenant Proudfit and I announced our engagement, she left me a note. Have gone to spend my kopeck. Remember your promise and do likewise. Next morning— Yes, de Grandin prompted. Next morning they took her from the bay, drowned. Ah. Uh. He let the single syllable out slowly through his teeth with a sort of hissing finality. Ah, at last, mademoiselle, I do understand. You mean, parbleu, I mean nothing less. Tonight, she did say, morbleu, tonight we shall see what we shall see. Stay you here, friend Trowbridge, he ordered. Me, I go to procure that which is necessary for our work this night. He was through the door like a shot, rushing down the stairs three steps at a stride, banging the front door behind him without a word of farewell or explanation to his astounded host. Darkness had fallen when he returned, a small black bag in his hand, and an expression of unbridled excitement on his face. "'Any change in our patient?' he demanded as he entered the house. "'Any further manifestations of that accursed poltergeist?' "'No,' I reported. "'Everything has been singularly calm this afternoon.' "'Ah, so? "'Then we shall have the harder fight tonight. 
the enemy he does marshal his forces. He tiptoed to the sick room, entered quietly, and took a seat beside the bed, detailing his experiences in the city with lively interest. Once or twice it seemed to me the patient's attention wandered as he continued his recital, but his conversation never faltered. He had seen the beautiful flowers in Fifth Avenue. The furs in the shops were of the exquisiteness. Never was there such a parade of beauty, culture, and refinement as could be found in that so wonderful street. I listened open-mouthed with wonder. Time given to extraneous matters when he was engaged in a case was time wasted, according to his ideas, I knew. Yet here he sat and chattered like a gossiping magpie to a girl who plainly took small interest in his talk. Eight o'clock struck on the tall clock in the hall below. Still he related humorous incidents in his life, and described the chestnut trees and the whistling blackbirds at St. Clou, or the students' masked balls in the Latin Quarter. "'What ails the man?' I muttered to myself. "'He rambles on like a wound-up phonograph.' It must have been about a quarter of nine when the change began to show itself in our patient. From polite inattention, her attitude toward the Frenchman became something like open hostility. In another five minutes she seemed to have lost all remembrance of his presence, and lay with her eyes turned toward the ceiling. Then, gradually but surely, there came into her already too thin face a pinched, drawn look, the sure sign of physical and nervous exhaustion. "'Aha! We do begin to commence!' de Grandin exclaimed exultantly, reaching beneath his chair and opening the little black bag he had deposited there. From the satchel he produced an odd-looking contrivance, something like the toy rotary fans to be bought at novelty shops, the sort of fan which consists of three twisted blades, like reversed propeller wings, and which is made to whirl by the pressure of the thumb against a trigger fitted in the handle. But this fan— instead of having blades of colored metal, was supplied with brightly nickeled arms which shone in the lamplight like a trio of new mirrors. "'Observe, mademoiselle, behold!' de Grandin cried sharply, signing to me to turn the electric bulbs on full strength at the same time. The girl's languid gaze lowered from the ceiling a moment and rested on the little Frenchman. Instantly he advanced the mirror fan to within six inches of her face, and began spinning it violently with quick, sharp jerks at the rotating loop. "'Regardez, s'il vous plaît,' he ordered, spinning the whirling mirrors faster and faster. The three bright pieces of metal seemed to merge into a single disc, but from their flying it seemed that countless tiny rays of light fell away like water scattered from a swiftly turning paddle-wheel. For an instant the girl regarded the bright, whirling mirrors without interest. Then her eyes seemed gradually to converge toward the bridge of her nose as they sought to follow the fan's rotations, and a fixed, rapt expression began to steal over her features. Sleep, sleep, and rest. Sleep and hear no orders from those who wish you ill. Sleep, 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 de Grandin commanded in low, earnest tones. Slowly, peacefully, her lids lowered over her fascinated eyes. Her breast rose and fell convulsively once or twice. Then her gentle breathing told us she had obeyed his command and lay fast in quiet sleep. "'What?' I began, but he waved me back impatiently. "'Another time, my friend,' he promised, with a quick gesture of warning. "'At present we must not talk. There is too much at stake.' All through the night he sat beside the bed, raising his whirling mirrors and commanding sleep in tones of suppressed fury each time the girl stirred on her pillow, and each time his order was implicitly obeyed. The patient slept continuously until the first streaks of dawn began to show against the eastern sky. "'Now, then,' he cried, springing from his chair, reopening his black bag, and bringing forth, of all things, a hyssop of mistletoe bough. Around and around the room he dashed with a sort of skipping step, 
for all the world like a country woman fanning flies from the house in summertime. Anna Vasilko, Anna Vasilko, who has wandered beyond the bounds of the tomb, he ordered as he waved his little brush broom. I command that you return whence you came. To death you have said, Thou art my lord and my master, and to the grave, Thou art my lover and my betrothed. Your business in this world is done, Anna Vasilko. Get you to the world you chose for your dwelling place when you cast your body into the sea. Near the window, where the dimming electric bulb's light mingled with the beams of the waning moon and the flushing rays of the coming morning, he repeated his command three times, waving his brush forward and outward toward the ocean, which surged and boomed on the beach a quarter mile away. Something seemed to brush by him, something invisible but tangible enough to stir the white scrim curtains trailing lazily in the still air, and for a moment I thought I caught the faint penumbra of a shadow cast against the ivory wall. A monstrous thing it was, large as a lion, yet like nothing I had ever seen or imagined, for it seemed to resemble both a bat and fox, with long-pointed snout, claw-armed forepaws, and great spike-edged wings extending to each side from close behind the head. "'Get you gone, unfortunate one!' de Grandin cried, striking directly at the shadow with his sprigs of mistletoe. "'Poor soul who would collect the wager of a thoughtless promise! Hie you back to your own place, and leave the ordering of other lives to God!' The terrible shadow rested against the pale wall another fraction of a second. Then, like smoke borne away in a rising breeze, it was gone. "'Gone!' de Grandin repeated softly closing the window and shutting off the lights. Call the nurse, I pray you, friend Trowbridge. Her duties will be simpler hereafter. A little medicine, a little tonic, and much rest and food will see Mademoiselle Julie as well as ever. Together we tiptoed into the hall, roused the sleeping nurse, and turned the patient over to her care. "'And now the other time you spoke of last night has come, I suppose?' I said, rather huffily, as we drove home. "'You were close-mouthed enough about it all while it was happening. Will you explain now?' "'Most certainly,' he returned, in high good humour, lighting a cigarette, breathing in a great lungful of smoke, then discharging the vapour with a sigh of gusty content. "'It was most simple, like everything else, when once I knew the answer.' To begin, when first Captain Loudon explained his daughter's case, it seemed like one of simple hysteria to me, and one which any capable physician could cure. Why, then, I ask me, does Monsieur le Capitaine seek the services of Jules de Grandin? I am not a great physician. I have no answer, and at first I decline the case, as you know. But when we go to his house, and behold Mademoiselle Julie all unconscious as she wandered about, I was of another mind, and when I hear the noises which accompanied her, I was of still a third mind. But when that evil one hurled a knife at my head, I said to me, Parbleu, it is the challenge. Shall Jules de Grandin fly from such a contest? Now, across the Rhine from France, those Bosch have some words which are most expressive. Among them is Poltergeist, which signifies a pelting ghost, a ghost which flings things around the house. But more often he is not a ghost at all. He is some evil entity which plagues a man, or more frequently a woman. Not for nothing, my friend, did the ancients refer to Satan as the prince of the powers of the air, for there are many very evil things in the air which we can no more see than we can behold the germs of disease. Yes, he nodded solemn affirmation. But when Mademoiselle Julie tells me of the mark which came on her arm, and I recognized the Romanian word for demon, I think some more. And when she tells me of the bird or bat which fluttered at her window, and yet was not there, I recognize many things in common with other cases I have observed. Foolish people, my friend, sometimes say, Come in, when they think the wind has blown their door ajar. It is not well to do so.
Who knows what invisible terror awaits without, needing only the spoken invitation unthinkingly made to enter? For attend me, my friend, very rarely can the evil ones come in unless they are first invited, and very rarely can they be gotten out once they have been bidden to enter. So all these things fit together in my mind, and I say to me, Morbleu, we have here a poltergeist, and nothing else, certainly. But why should a poltergeist attach his evil self to that sweet Mademoiselle Julie? True, she are very pretty, but there are other pretty women in the world of whom the poltergeister do not seek shelter. Then, when the demon tell us he hold her completely in his power, and makes her to dance almost nude in her father's house, and sticks pins and needles in her, I hear something else. I hear him promise to take her life. Why? What have she done that she must die? Then I see the picture of Anna Vasilko. Very like Mademoiselle Julie she was, but there was a subtle something in her face which makes me know she was not the same. And what story does Monsieur le Capitaine tell when I ask about her? Ah, now we begin to see the light. She were Romanian by birth and partly by ancestry. Very good. She had gone to school with her cousin, Mademoiselle Julie. Again, good. She had lived in the same house here, she had loved the same man, and she had committed suicide. Best of all. I need now only a little reassuring as to the reason why. The result I already know. You know what Mademoiselle Julie told us. It all fitted in well with the theory I had formed, but there was work to be done that night. The demon which made Julie do all kinds of things she knew not of had promised to take her life. How to circumvent her, that were the question. I think this young woman goes off into trances, and does all manner of queer things without knowing them, I inform me. Would she not do much the same in a state of hypnosis? Assuredly, very well, then. I procure me a set of whirling mirrors, not because there is any magic in them, but because they are the easiest thing to focus the subject's attention. Last night I used them and hypnotized Mademoiselle Julie before the poltergeist has a chance to conquer her consciousness. Hypnotism, when all is said and done is the rendering of a subject's objective mind passive, while the mind of the operator is substituted for that of the subject. The poltergeist, which was really the revenant of Anna, had substituted her mind for Julie's on former occasions. Now I get there first, and place my mind in her brain. There is no room for the other, and Mademoiselle Julie cannot take suggestions or brain hints from the ghost and destroy herself. No, Jules de Grandin is already in possession of her brain house, and he says, no admission to all others who try to come in. Mademoiselle Julie slept peacefully through the night, as you did observe. But what was all that monkey business with the mistletoe? I demanded. Tiens, my friend, the monkey's business had nothing to do with that, he assured me. Do you perhaps remember what the mistletoe stands for at Noel? You mean a kiss? What else? It is the plant held sacred to lovers in this day. But in the elder times it was the holy bush of the Druids. With it they cast many spells, and with it they cast out many evil workers. Not by mistake is it the lover's tree today, for it is a powerful charm against evil, and will assuredly lay the unhappy ghost of one who dies because of unfortunate love. Voila! You do catch the connection? I never heard that before, I began, but he cut me short with a chuckle. <laughs> Much you have never heard, Trowbridge, my friend, he accused. Yet all of it is true, none the less. And that hideous shadow? He sobered instantly. Who can say? In life, Mademoiselle Anna was beautiful, but she went forth from the world uncalled and in an evil way, my friend. Who knows what evil shape she is doomed to wear in the next life? The less we think on that subject, the better for our sleep hereafter. Come, we are at your house once more. Let us drink one glass of brandy for luck's sake, then to sleep. Mon dear me, 
I feel as though I had been stranger to my bed since my fifth birthday. The Gods of East and West Tiens, friend Trowbridge, you work late tonight. Jules de Grandin, debonair in faultlessly pressed dinner clothes, a white gardenia sharing his lapel buttonhole with the red ribbon of the Légion d'honneur, paused at the door of my consulting room, glimpsed the box of coronas lying open on the table, and straightway entered, seating himself opposite me and selecting a long black cigar, with all the delighted precision of a child choosing a bonbon from a box of sweets. I laid aside the copy of Bering's Diagnosis in Diseases of the Blood I had been studying, and helped myself to a fresh cigar. "'Have a pleasant time at the Medical Society dinner?' I asked, somewhat sourly. "'But yes,' he agreed, nodding vigorously while his little blue eyes shone with enthusiasm. "'They are a delectable crowd of fellows, those New York physicians. I regret you would not accompany me. There was one gentleman in particular, a full-blooded Indian, who—' "'But you do not listen, my friend. You are distrait. What is the trouble?' "'Trouble enough,' I returned ungraciously. "'A patient's dying for no earthly reason that I can see, except that she is. "'Ah, you interest me. Have you made a tentative diagnosis?' half a dozen, and none of them checks up. I've examined her and re-examined her, and the only thing I'm absolutely certain of is that she's fading away right before my eyes, and nothing I can do seems an earthly bit of good. Hmm. Thysis, perhaps. Not a bit of it. I've tested her sputum numerous times. Every result is negative. There isn't a thing wrong with her organically, and her temperature is almost always normal. "'fluctuating slightly at times, one way or the other, "'but hardly ever more than one or two degrees. "'I've made several blood counts, "'and while she runs slightly under the million mark, "'the deficiency isn't enough to cause alarm. "'About the only objective symptoms she displays "'are a steady falling off in weight and a progressive pallor, "'while subjectively she complains of loss of appetite, "'slight headaches, and profound lassitude in the morning. Mm. He repeated thoughtfully, expelling a twin cloud of smoke from his narrow nostrils, and regarding the ash of his cigar as though it were something of intense interest. And how long has this condition of affairs obtained? About three months. She's a Mrs. Chetwind, wife of a likable young chap who's superintending a piece of railway construction for an English company in Burma. He's been away about six months or so, and while she would naturally be expected to pine for him to some extent, they've been married only a couple of years, this illness has been going on only since about the middle of August. Mmm! He knocked the ash from his cigar with a deft motion of his little finger and inhaled a great lungful of strong, fragrant smoke with careful deliberation. This case interests me, friend Trowbridge. These diseases which defy diagnosis are the things which make the doctor's trade exciting. With your permission, I will accompany you when next you visit Madame Chetwind. Who knows? Together we may find the doormat under which the key of her so mysterious malady lies hidden. Meantime, I famish for sleep. I'm with you, I agreed as I closed my book, shut off the light, and accompanied him upstairs to bed. The Chetwind Cottage was one of the smallest and newest of the lovely little dwellings in the Rookwood section of town. Although it contained but seven rooms, it was as completely a piece of art as any miniature painted on ivory, and the appointments and furnishings comported perfectly with the exquisite architectural artistry of the house. Jules de Grandin's round little eyes danced delightedly as he took in the perfect harmony existing inside and out, when we parked my car before the rose-trellised porch and entered the charming reception hall. Eh bien, my friend, he whispered, as we followed the black-and-white uniformed maid toward the stairs. Whatever her disease may be, she has the bon goût. How do you say good taste, this Madame Chetwind? Lovely as a piece of Chinese porcelain, and as frail, Idoline Chetwind lay on the scented pillows of her Louis XIII bed, a negligee of knife-plaited crepe de chine, trimmed with fluffy black marabou, 
shrouding her lissom form from slender neck to slenderer ankles, but permitting occasional highlights of ivory body to be glimpsed through its sable folds. Little French-heeled mules of scarlet satin trimmed with black fur were on her stockingless feet, and the network of veins showed pale violet against the dead white of her high-arched insteps. Her long, sharp-chinned face was a rich olive hue in the days of her health, but now her cheeks had faded to the color of old ivory, and her fine high forehead was as pale and well-nigh as translucent as candle-wax. The long, beautifully molded lips of her expressive mouth were more an old rose than a coral red, and her large gray eyes, lifted toward the temples like those of an oriental, shone with a sort of patient resignation beneath the flying gull curve of her intensely black brows. Her hair, cut short as a boy's at the back, had been combed across her forehead from right to left and plastered down with some perfumed unguent, so that it surmounted her white face like a close-wrapped turban of gleaming ebon silk. Diamond studs, small but very brilliant, flickered lambently in the lobes of her low-set ears. Some women cast the aura of their feminine allure about them as a bouquet of roses exudes its perfume. Idoline Chetwind was one of those. "'Not so well this morning, thank you, doctor,' she replied to my inquiry. "'The weakness seems greater than usual, and I had a dreadful nightmare last night.' Huh, "'Nightmare, eh?' I answered gruffly. "'We'll soon attend to that. What did you dream?' "'I... I don't know,' she replied languidly, as though the effort of speaking were almost too much for her. I just remember that I dreamed something awful, but what it was I haven't the slightest notion. It really doesn't matter, anyway. Pardonnez-moi, madame, but it matters extremely much, de Grandin contradicted. These things we call dreams, they are sometimes the expression of our most secret thoughts. Through them we sometimes learn things concerning ourselves which we should not otherwise suspect. Will you try to recall this unpleasant dream for us? As he spoke, he busied himself with a minute examination of the patient, tapping her patellar tendons, feeling along her wrists and forearms with quick, practiced fingers, lifting her lids and examining the pupils of both her luminous eyes, searching on her throat, neck, and cardiac region for signs of abrasions. Eh bien, and, mon bleu, c'est étrange, I heard him mutter to himself once or twice, but no further comment did he make until he had completed his examination. "'Do you know, Dr. Trowbridge,' Mrs. Chetwind remarked, as de Grandin rolled down his cuffs and scribbled a memorandum in his notebook, "'I've been gone over so many times, I've begun to feel like an entry at the dog-show. It's really not a bit of use, either. You might just as well save yourselves and me the trouble, and let me die comfortably. I've a feeling I shan't be here much longer, anyway, and it might be better for all concerned if— Zit! De Grandin snapped the elastic about his pocket-book with a sharp report, and leveled a shrewd, unwinking stare at her. "'Say not so, madame. It is your duty to live. Parbleu, the garden of the world is full to suffocation with weeds. Flowers like yourself should be most sedulously cultivated, for the joying of all mankind.' "'Thank you, doctor.' Mrs. Chetwin smiled slowly in acknowledgment of the compliment, and pressed the ebony and silver bell which hung over the ornamental head of her bed. "'Madame has called.' The swart-visaged maid-servant appeared at the door of the chamber, with a promptitude which led me to suspect her ear had never been far from the keyhole. "'Yes. Dr. Trowbridge and Dr. de Grandin are leaving,' her mistress replied in a tired voice. "'Adieu, madame.' de Grandin murmured in farewell, leaning forward and possessing himself of the slender hand our hostess had not troubled to lift as we turned to go. "'We go, but we shall return, Anon, and with us, unless I greatly mistake, we shall bring you a message of good cheer. No case is hopeless until—' "'Until the undertaker's been called?' Mrs. Chetwind interrupted, with another of her slow, tired smiles, as the little Frenchman pressed his lips to her pale fingers, and turned to accompany the maid and me from the room. "'Be careful!' 
Sir, the maid cautioned with just enough space between the command and the title of courtesy to rob her utterance of all semblance of respect. De Grandin, turning from the stairs into the hall, had almost collided with a statuette, which stood on a pedestal in a niche between the staircase and the wall. To me it seemed the woman bent a look of almost venomous hate on him, as he regained his footing on the highly polished floor, and wheeled about to stare meditatively at the figurine into which he had nearly stumbled. "'This way, if you please, sir,' the servant admonished, standing by the front door and offering his hat in a most suggestive manner. "'Ah, yes, just so,' he agreed, turning from the statue to her, then back again. "'And do you suffer from the mosquitoes here at this time of year, mademoiselle?' Mosquitoes! The woman's reply was half word, half scornful sniff at the little foreigner's irrelevant remark. Precisely, the mosquito, the gnat, the musquit, he rejoined with a humorous lift of his brows. The little buzzing pests, you know. No, sir. The answer served notice there was no more to be said on the subject. Ah? Perhaps it is then that Madame your mistress delights in the incense which annoys the moths, yes? No, sir. Parbleu, ma vierge, there are many strange things in the world, are there not? He returned with one of his impish grins. But the strangest of all are those who attempt to hold information from me. The servant's only reply was a look which indicated clearly that murder was the least favor she cared to bestow on him. La, la, he chuckled as we descended the steps to my car. I did her in the eye, as the Englishmen say, that time, did I not, my friend? You certainly had the last word, I admitted wonderingly. But you'll have to grant her the last look, and it was no very pleasant one, either. Ah, bah, he returned with another grin. Who cares how old Pickleface looks, so long as her looks reveal that which I seek? Did not you notice how she stiffened when I hinted at the odor of incense in the house? There is no reason why they should not burn incense there, but for some cause this scent is a matter of utmost privacy, with the maid at least. Hm? I commented. Quite right, my friend, your objection is well taken, he responded with a chuckle. Now tell me something of our fair patient. Who is she? Who were her forebears? How long has she resided here? She's the wife of Richard Chetwynd, a naturalized Englishman who's been working on an engineering job in India, as I told you last night, I replied. As to her family, she was a Miss Millitone before her marriage, and the Millitones have been here since the Indians. In fact, some of them have been here quite as long, since an ancestress of hers was a member of one of the aboriginal tribes. But that was in the days when the Swedes and Dutch were contending for this part of the country. "'Her family are rather more than well-to-do, and—' "'No more, my friend, you have told me enough, I think,' he interrupted. "'That strain of Indian ancestry may account for something which has caused me much wonderment. "'Madame Chetwynd is a rarely beautiful woman, my friend, "'but there is that indefinable something about her which tells the careful observer "'her blood is not entirely Caucasian. "'No disgrace, that!' Parbleu, a mixture of strain is often an improvement of the breed. But there was a certain, how shall I say it, foreignness about her, which told me she might be descended from Orientals, perhaps, perhaps from the Turk, the Hindu, the— No, I cut in with a chuckle. She's what you might call a hundred and ten percent American. Hmm, he commented dryly and therefore ten per cent nearer the bare verities of nature than the thinner-blooded European. Yes, I think we may win this case, my friend, but I also think we shall have much study to do. Oh! I looked at him in surprise. So you've arrived at a hypothesis? Hardly that, my friend. There are certain possibilities, but as yet Jules de Grandin has not the courage to call them probabilities. Let us say no more for the time being. I would think, I would cogitate, I would meditate upon the matter. Nor could all my urging extract a single hint concerning the theory, which I knew was humming like a gyroscope inside his active little brain, as we drove home through the rows of brilliant maple trees, 
lining the wide streets of our pretty little city. A spirited altercation was under way when we arrived at my house. Taking advantage of the fact that office hours were over and no patients within earshot, Nora McGuinness, my household factotum, was engaged in the pleasing pastime of expressing her unvarnished opinion with all the native eloquence of a born Irish woman. "'Take shame to yourself, Katie Rooney,' she was advising her niece, as de Grandin and I opened the front door. "'Sure tis yourself as ought to be ashamed as to set foot in me kitchen and tell me such nonsense. "'After all the doctor's been after doing for yous too. "'Desertin' the poor lady while she's sick and in distress ye are, "'and without so much as saying by your leave to the doctor. "'Worra, tis Nora McGuinness that's strainin' every nerve in her body "'to keep from taking her hand off the side of your face. "'Take shame to her meself, indeed,' an equally belligerent voice responded. "'Tis little enough, you know, of the goings-on in that there house. "'Sposin' t'was you as had to live under the same roof with a heathen statue, "'and see the mistress you was taking your wages from "'a crawlin' on her hands and knees before the thing, "'as if she was a heathen or a Protestant or something, instead of a Christian woman. "'When first I come to Mrs. Chitwin's house the thing was no larger nor the span of me hand.' and every day it's growed and growed until it's as long as me arm this minute, so it is. And no longer ago than yesterday, it wonk its heathen eye at me as I was passing through the hall. I tell you, Nora, darling, what with that black statue a standin' in the hall, and getting bigger and bigger day by day, and the missus a crawlin' to it on her all fours, and that slinky, sneaky English maid o' hern actin' as if I— whose ancestors was kings in Ireland, was no better than the dirt beneath her feet, and belike not as good, I'd not be answerable for me actions another day. The saints hear me when I say it. I was striding toward the kitchen with intent to bring the argument to an abrupt close, when de Grandin's fingers suddenly bit into my arm so sharply that I winced from the pressure. No, no, friend Trowbridge, he whispered fiercely in my ear. "'Let us hear what else she has to say. "'This information is a gift from heaven, no less.' "'Next moment he was in the kitchen, "'smiling ingratiatingly at the two angry women. "'Dr. de Grandin, sir,' began Nora, "'anxious to refer the dispute to his arbitration, "'tis meself that's ashamed to have to own this girl as kin o' mine. "'When Mrs. Chitwind was taken sick, "'Dr. Trowbridge got her to go over and cook for the poor lady, "'for all our family's good cooks, though I do say it as I shouldn't. "'And now, bad cess to her, "'she fur up and lavin' the poor lady in the midst of her trouble, "'like as if she were a Scandinavian, or a Italian, "'or some kind of stinking foreigner. I "'Begging your pardon, sir.' "'Faith, doctor,' the accused Kathleen answered in defence, I'm never the one to run out from a good situation without warning. But that Chetwind house is no Christian place at all. At all. Tis some kind of heathen madhouse, no less. De Grandin regarded her narrowly a moment, then broke into one of his quick smiles. What was it you did say concerning a certain statue and Madame Chetwind? he asked. Sure, and there's enough to say, she replied. "'but the best part of it's better left unsaid, I'm thinking. "'Mrs. Chitwin's husband, as belike you know, sir, "'is an engineer in India, "'and he's forever sending home all sorts of fur and knick-knacks for souvenirs. "'Some of the things is real pretty, and some of them ain't so good. "'It were about three months ago, just before I came with her, "'he sent home the statue of some old heathen goddess from the foreign land. "'She set it up on a pedestal, like as if it were the image of some blessed saint. And there it stands to this day, a poison in the pure air of the entire house. I never liked the looks of the thing from the first moment I clapped my two eyes on it. But I didn't have to pass through the front end of the house much. And when I did, I turned my eyes away. But one day, as I was passing through the hall, I looked at it. And you can believe me or not, doctor, but the thing had growed half a foot since last time I had seen it. Indeed, de Grandin responded politely. And then? Then I says to myself, says I, I'll just fix you, my beauty, that I will. And next evening, when no one was looking, 
I sneaked into the hall and doused the thing with holy water from the church font. Ah? And then? De Grandin prompted gently, his little eyes gleaming with interest. Ouch, Dr. Darlin, if I hadn't seen it, I wouldn't have believed it. May I never move off on this spot if the blessed water didn't boil and stew as if I'd poured it onto a red-hot stove. Pableu, the Frenchman murmured. The next time I went past the think, so help me heaven, if it didn't grin at me. Mon Dieu, do you say so? And then? And no longer ago than yesterday, it wonk its eye at me as I went by. And you did say something concerning Madame Chetwind praying to this... Doctor. The woman sidled nearer and took his lapel between her thumb and forefinger. Doctor, tis meself as knows better than to bear tales concerning me betters, but I seen something last week that give me the cold shivers from me big toes to me eye teeth. I'd been schlapin as paceful as a lamb that hadn't been born yet, when all of a sudden I heard something downstairs that sounded like burglars. Bad cess to the murderin' scoundrels says I, coming up here to kill poor defenceless women in their beds. And with that I picks up a piece of iron pipe I found handy-like beside me door, and starts to creep downstairs to lane it agin the side of their heads. Dr. de Grandin, sir, tis the blessed truth and no lie I'm telling you. When I come to the head of the steps, there was Mrs. Chitwind all barefooty, with some sort of funny-looking thing on her head. A lightin' heathen punk sticks before that black heathen image, and a goin' down on her two knees to it. Katie Rooney, says I to myself, this is no fittin' proper house for you, a Christian woman and a good Catholic, to be livin' in so it's not, and as soon as ever I could, I give me notice to Mrs. Chetwind, and all the money and the mint couldn't hire me to go back to that place again, sir. Just so, the little Frenchman agreed nodding his sleek blond head vigorously. I understand your reluctance to return, but could you not be induced by some consideration greater than money? Sure, and I'd not go back there for— Katie began, but he cut her short with a sudden gesture. Attend me, if you please, he commanded. You are a Christian woman, are you not? To be sure I am. Very good. If I told you you're going back to Madame Chetwin's service until I give you word to leave, might be instrumental in saving a Christian soul, a Christian body, certainly. Would you undertake the duty? I'd do most anything you told me to, sir, the woman replied soberly. But the blessed saints know I'm afeard to sleep under the same roof with that there black thing another night. Hmm. De Grandin took his narrow chin in his hand, and bowed his head in thought a moment, then turned abruptly toward the door. "'Await me here,' he commanded. "'I shall return.' Less than two minutes later he re-entered the kitchen, a tiny package of tissue paper bound with red ribbon in his hand. "'Have you ever been by the Killarney Lakes?' he demanded of Katie, fixing his level, unwinking stare on her. "'Sure, and I have that.' she replied fervently. More than once I've stood beside the blue waters, and— And who is it comes out of the lake once each year, and rides across the water on a great white horse, attended by— He began, but she interrupted with a cry that was almost a scream of ecstasy. "'Tis the O'Donoghue himself! The brave O'Donoghue a-ridin' his great white horse, and a-hidden his band o' noble Fanians, all ridin' and prancin' to set old Ireland free!' "'Precisely,' de Grandin replied. "'I, too, have stood beside the lake, "'and with me have stood certain good friends "'who were born and bred in Ireland. "'One of those once secured a certain souvenir "'of the O'Donoghue's yearly ride, behold.' "'Undoing the tissue-paper parcel, "'he exhibited a tiny ring composed "'of two or three strands of white horse-hairs "'loosely plaited together.' "'Suppose I told you these were from the tail of the O'Donoghue's horse?' he demanded. "'Would you take them with you as a safeguard, and re-enter Madame Chetwin's service until I gave you leave to quit?' "'Glory be I would that, sir,' she replied. "'Faith, with three hairs from the O'Donoghue's horse, 
I'd take service in the devil's own kitchen and brew him as fine a broth of brimstone as ever he drank, that I would. Sure, though Donahue is more than a match for any murder in heathen that ever came out of India, I'm thinking, sir. Quite right, he agreed with a smile. It is understood, then, that you will return to Madame Chetwin's this afternoon and remain there until you hear further from me. Very good. To me, as we returned to the front of the house, he confided, A pious fraud is its own excuse, friend Trowbridge. What we believe a thing is, it is, as far as we are concerned. Those hairs, now, I did extract them from the mattress of my bed. But our superstitious Katie is brave as a lion in the belief that they came from the O'Donoghue's horse. Do you mean to tell me you actually take any stock in that crazy Irish woman's story to Grandin? I demanded incredulously. Eh bien, he answered with a shrug of his narrow shoulders. Who knows what he believes, my friend? Much she may have imagined, much more she may have made up from the activity of her superstitious mind. But if all she said is truth, I shall not be so greatly surprised as I expect to be before we have finished this case. Well, I returned, too amazed to think of any adequate reply. Trowbridge, my friend, he informed me at breakfast the following morning. I have thought deeply upon the case of Madame Chetwind, and it is my suggestion that we call upon the unfortunate lady without further delay. There are several things I should very much like to inspect in her so charming house, for what the estimable Katie told us yesterday has thrown much light on things which before were entirely dark. All right, I assented. It seems to me you're taking a fantastic view of the case, but everything I've done thus far has been useless, so I dare say you'll do no harm by your tricks. More blue I warrant I shall not, he agreed with a short nod. Come, let us go. The dark-skinned maid who had conducted us to and from her mistress the previous day met us at the door in answer to my ring, and favoured de Grandin with an even deeper scowl than she had shown before. But she might as well have been a graven image for all the attention he bestowed on her. However, Mon Dieu, I faint, I am ill. I shall collapse, friend Trowbridge, he cried in a choking voice as we approached the stairs. Water! I pray you a glass of water, if you please. I turned to the domestic and demanded a tumbler of water and as she left to procure it, de Grandin leaped forward with a quick cat-like movement and pointed to the statuette standing at the foot of the stairs. "'Observe it well, friend Trowbridge,' he commanded in a low, excited voice. "'Look upon its hideousness, and take particular notice of its height and width. See, place yourself here, and draw a visual line from the top of its head to the woodwork behind. Then make a mark on the wood to record its stature.' Quick, she will return in a moment, and we have no time to lose. Wonderingly, I obeyed his commands, and had scarcely completed my task when the woman came with a goblet of ice water. De Grandin pretended to swallow a pill and wash it down with copious draughts of the chilled liquid, then followed me up the stairs to Mrs. Chetwin's room. Madame, he began without preliminary when the maid had left us. "'There are certain things I should like to ask you. "'Be so good as to reply, if you please. First, do you know anything about the statue which stands in your hallway below?' "'A troubled look flitted across our patient's pale face. "'No, I can't say I do,' she replied slowly. "'My husband sent it back to me from India several months ago, "'together with some other curios. "'I felt a sort of aversion to it from the moment I first saw it, but somehow it fascinated me as well. After I'd set it up in the hall, I made up my mind to take it down, and I've been on the point of having it taken out half a dozen times, but somehow I've never been able to make up my mind about it. I really wish I had now, for the thing seems to be growing on me, if you understand what I mean. I find myself thinking about it. It's so adorably ugly, you know. More and more during the day— and somehow, though I can't quite explain, I think I dream about it at night, too. I wake up every morning with the recollection of having had a terrible nightmare the night before, but I'm never able to recall any of the incidents of my dream, 
except that the statue figures in it somehow. Hmm, de Grandin murmured noncommittally. This is of interest, madame. Another question, if you please, and I pray you, do not be offended if it seems unduly personal. I notice you have a penchant for attar of rose. Do you employ any other perfume? No, she said wonderingly. No incense, perhaps, to render the air more fragrant. No, I dislike incense. It makes my head ache. And yet— She wrinkled her smooth brow in a puzzled manner. And yet— I've thought I smelled a faint odor of some sort of incense, almost like Chinese punk, in the house more than once. Strangely enough, the odor seems strongest on the mornings following one of my unremembered nightmares. Hmm, de Grandin muttered. I think perhaps we begin to see a fine, a small ray of light. Thank you, madame, that is all. The moon is almost at the full, friend Trowbridge he remarked, apropos of nothing, about eleven o'clock that night. Would it not be an ideal evening for a little drive? Yes, it would not, I replied. I'm tired, and I'd a lot rather go to bed than be gallivanting all over town with you. But I suppose you have something up your sleeve as usual. Mais oui, he responded with one of his impish smiles. An elbow in each, my friend, and other things as well. Suppose we drive to Madame Chetwin's. I grumbled, but complied. Well, here we are, I growled as we passed the Chetwin cottage. What do we do next? Go in, of course, he responded. Go in at this hour of night? But certainly, unless I am more mistaken than I think, there is that to be seen within which we should do well not to miss. But it's preposterous, I objected. "'Who ever heard of disturbing a sick woman by a call at this hour?' "'We shall not disturb her, my friend,' he replied. "'See, I have here the key to her house. "'We shall let ourselves in like a pair of wholly disreputable burglars, "'and dispose ourselves as comfortably as may be to see what we shall see, if anything.' "'The key to her house,' I echoed in amazement. "'How the deuce did you get it?' Simply. While this sour-faced maid fetched me the glass of water this morning, I took an impression of the key in a cake of soap I had brought for that very purpose. This afternoon I had a locksmith prepare me a duplicate from the stamp I had made. Parbleu, my friend, Jules de Grandin has not served these many years with the Sûreté, and failed to learn more ways than one of entering other people's houses. Quietly, treading softly, we mounted the veranda steps, slipped the Judas key into the front door lock, and let ourselves into Mrs. Chetwin's hall. This way, if you please, friend Trowbridge, de Grandin ordered, plucking me by the sleeve. If we sit ourselves in the drawing room, we shall have an uninterrupted view of both stairs and hall, yet remain ourselves in shadow. That is well, for we have come to see, not to be seen. I feel like a malefactor, I began in a nervous whisper, but he cut me off sharply. Quiet, he ordered in a low breath. Observe the moon, if you please, my friend. Is it not already almost peering through yonder window? I glanced toward the hall window before which the black statuette stood, and noticed that the edge of the lunar disk was beginning to show through the opening and long silver beams were commencing to stream across the polished floor, illuminating the figure and surrounding it with a sort of cold effulgence. The statue represented a female figure, gnarled and knotted and articulated in a manner suggesting a horrible deformity. It was some kind of black stone or composition which glistened as though freshly anointed with oil, and from the shoulder sockets three arms sprang out to right and left. A sort of pointed cap adorned the thing's head, and about the pendulous breasts and twisting arms serpents twined and writhed, while a girdle of skulls, carved from gleaming white bone, encircled its waist. Otherwise it was nude, and nude with a nakedness which was obscene even to me, a medical practitioner for whom the human body held no secrets. As I watched the slowly growing patch of moonlight on the floor, 
It seemed the black figure grew slowly in size, then shrunk again, and again increased in stature, while its twisting arms and garlands of contorting serpents appeared to squirm, with a horrifying suggestion of waking into life. I blinked my eyes several times, sure I was the victim of some optical illusion due to the moon rays against the silhouette of the statue's blackness. But a sound from the stairhead brought my gaze upward with a quick, startled jerk. Light and faltering, but unquestionably approaching, a soft step sounded on the uncarpeted stairs. Nearer, nearer, until a tall, slow-moving figure came into view at the staircase turn. Swathed from breast to insteps in a diaphanous black silk nightrobe, a pair of golden-strapped boudoir sandals on her little naked feet, and a veil of black tulle shrouding her face, Edoline Chetwind slowly descended the stairs, feeling her way carefully, as though the covering on her face obscured her vision. One hand was outstretched before her, palm up, fingers close together. In the other she bore a cluster of seven sticks of glowing, smoking Chinese punk spread fanwise between her fingers, and the heavy, cloyingly sweet fumes from the joss sticks spiraled slowly upward, surrounding her veiled head in a sort of nimbus, and trailing behind her like an evil-omened cloud. Straight for the black image of the Indian goddess she trod, feeling each slow, careful step with faltering deliberation, halted a moment and inclined her head, then thrust the punk sticks into a tiny bowl of sand which stood on the floor at the statue's feet. This done, she stepped back five slow paces, slipped the gilded sandals off, and placed her bared feet parallel and close together, then with a sudden forward movement dropped to her knees. Oddly, with that sense for noting trifles in the midst of more important sights which we all have, I noticed that when she knelt, Instead of straightening her feet out behind her with her insteps to the floor, she bent her toes forward beneath her weight. For an instant she remained kneeling upright before the black image, which was already surrounded by a heavy cloud of pink smoke. Then, with a convulsive gesture, she tore the veil from before her face and rent the robe from her bosom, raised her hands and crossed them, palms forward, in front of her brow, and bent forward and downward till crossed hands and forehead rested on the waxed boards of the floor. For a moment she remained thus, in utter self-abasement, then rose upright, flinging her hands high above her head, recrossed them before her face, and dropped forward in complete prostration once more. Again and again she repeated this genuflection. Faster and faster, until it seemed her body swayed forward and back thirty or forty times a minute, and the soft pat-pat of her hands against the floor assumed a rhythmic, drum-like cadence, as she began a faltering chant in eager, short-breathed syllables. Ho, oh, Devi, consort of Siva and daughter of Himavat! Ho, oh, Sakti, fructifying principle of the universe! Ho, oh, Devi, the goddess! Ho! Oh, Gori the yellow, Ho Uma the bright, Ho Durga the inaccessible, Ho Chandi the fierce, listen thou to my mantra, Ho Kali the black, Ho Kali the six-armed one of horrid form, Ho thou about whose waist hangs a girdle of human skulls, as if it were a precious pendant. Ho, oh, malign image of destructiveness! She paused an instant, seeming to swallow rising trepidation, gasped for breath a moment, like a timid but determined bather about to plunge into a pool of icy water. Then, Take thou the soul and the body of this woman prostrate before thee. Take thou her body and her spirit, freely and voluntarily offered. Incorporate her body, soul, and spirit into thy Godhead to strengthen thee in thine undertakings. Freely is she given thee, divine destroyer, freely of her own accord and without reservation, asking naught but to become a part of thee and of thy supreme wickedness. 
Ho, oh, Kali of horrid form! Ho, oh, malign image of destructiveness! He, eater up of all that is good! Ho, oh, disseminator of all which is wicked! Listen thou to my mantra! Grandia, forgive her invincible ignorance. She knows not what she says, de Grandam muttered beside me, but made no movement to stop her in her sacrilegious rite. I half rose from my chair to seize the frenzied woman and drag her from her knees, but he grasped my elbow in a vice-like grip and drew me back savagely. Not now, foolish one, he commanded in a sibilant whisper. And so we watched the horrid ceremony to its close. For upward of a quarter hour, Edeline Chetwind continued her prostrations before the heathen idol, and either because the clouds drifting across the moon's face played tricks with the light streaming through the hall window, or because my eyes grew undependable from the strain of watching the spectacle before me, it seemed as though some hovering, shifting pall of darkness took form in the corners of the room, and wavered forward like a sheet of wind-blown sable cloth until it almost enveloped the crouching woman, then fluttered back again. Three or four times I noted this phenomenon. Then, as I was almost sure it was no trick of lighting or imagination, the moon, sailing serenely in the autumn sky, passed beyond the line of the window, an even tone of shadow once more filled the hall, and Mrs. Chetwind sank forward on her face for the final time uttered a weak, protesting little sound, halfway between a moan and a whimper, and lay there, a lifeless, huddled heap at the foot of the graven image, her white arms and feet protruding from the black folds of her robe, and showing like spots of pale light against the darkness of the floor. Once more I made to rise and take her up, but again de Grandin restrained me. Not yet, my friend. We must see the tragic farce played to its conclusion. For a few minutes we sat there in absolute silence. Then, with a shuddering movement, Mrs. Chetwind regained consciousness, rose slowly and dazedly to her feet, resumed her sandals, and walked falteringly toward the stairs. Quick and silent as a cat, de Grandin leaped across the room, passed within three feet of her, and seized a light chair, thrusting it forward so that one of its spindle legs barred her path. Never altering her course, neither quickening nor reducing her shuffling walk, the young woman proceeded, collided with the obstruction, and would have stumbled had not de Grandin snatched away the chair as quickly as he had thrust it forward. With never a backward look, with no exclamation of pain, although the contact must have hurt her cruelly, without even a glance at the little Frenchman, who stood half an arm's length from her. She walked to the stairs, felt for the bottommost tread a second, then began a slow ascent. Taibon, de Grandam muttered, as he restored the chair to its place and took my elbow in a firm grip, guiding me down the hall and through the front door. What in heaven's name does it all mean? I demanded as we regained my car. From what I've just seen, I'd have no hesitancy in signing commitment papers to incarcerate Mrs. Chetwind in an institution for the insane. The woman's suffering from a masochistic mania, no doubt of it. But why the deuce did you try to trip her up with a chair? Softly, my friend, he replied, touching fire to a vile-smelling French cigarette and puffing furiously at it. Did you help commit that poor girl to an insane asylum, you would be committing a terrible crime, no less. Normal she is not, but her abnormality is entirely subjective. As for the chair, it was the test of her condition. Like you, I had a faint fear her actions were due to some mental breakdown. But did you notice her walk? Parbleu, was it the walk of a person in possession of his faculties? I say no, and the chair proved it. When she did stumble against it, though it must have caused her tender body much pain, she neither faltered nor cried out. The machinery which telegraphed the sensation of hurt from her leg to her brain did suffer a short circuit. My friend, she was in a state of complete anesthesia as regarded the outside world. She was, uh, how do you say, hypnotized, I suggested. Um, perhaps, something like that. 
although the controlling agent was one far, far different than any you have seen in the psychological laboratory, my friend. Then... Then we would do well not to speculate too deeply until we have more pieces of evidence to fit into the picture puzzle of this case. Tomorrow morning we shall call on Madame Chetwind, if you please. We did. The patient was markedly worse. Great lavender circles showed under her eyes, and her face, which I had thought as pale as any countenance could be in life, was even a shade paler than theretofore. She was so weak she could hardly lift her hand in greeting, and her voice was barely more than a whisper. On her left leg, immediately over the fibula, a great patch of violet bruise showed plainly the effects of her collision with the chair. Throughout the pretty, cosy little cottage, there hung the faint aroma of burnt joss sticks. "'Look well, my friend,' de Grandin ordered in a whisper as we descended the stairs. "'Observe the mark you made behind the statue's head no later than yesterday.' I paused before the horrid thing, closed one eye and sighted from the tip of its pointed cap to the scratch I had made on the woodwork behind it. Then I turned in amazement to my companion. Either my eye was inaccurate, or I had made incorrect measurements the previous day. According to yesterday's marks on the woodwork, the statue had grown fully two inches in height. De Grandin met my puzzled look with an unwavering stare as he replied to my unspoken question. Your eye does not deceive you, my friend. The hell-hag's effigy has enhanced. But, but, I stammered, that can't be. Nevertheless, it is. But good heavens, man, if this keeps up. This will not keep up, my friend. Either the devil's dam takes her prey, or Jules de Grandin triumphs. The first may come to pass, but my wager is that the second occurs. But... For the Lord's sake, what can we do? We can do much for the Lord's sake, my friend, and he can do much for ours, if it be his will. What we can do, we will. No more, and certainly no less. Do you make your rounds of mercy, friend Trowbridge, and beseech the so excellent Nora to prepare an extra-large apple tart for dinner, as I shall undoubtedly bring home a guest. Me, I hasten, I rush, I fly to New York to consult a gentleman I met at the Medical Society dinner the other night. I shall get back when I return. But if that be not in time for an early dinner, it will be no fault of Jules de Grandin's. Adieu, my friend, and may good luck attend me in my errand. Cordieu, but I shall need it. Dr. Trowbridge, may I present Dr. Wolfe? De Grandin requested that evening, standing aside to permit a tall, magnificently built young man to precede him through the doorway of my consulting room. I have brought him from New York to take dinner with us, and perhaps to aid us in that which we must do tonight without fail. How do you do, Dr. Wolfe? I responded formally, taking the visitor's hand in mine, but staring curiously at him the while. Somehow the name given by de Grandin did not seem at all appropriate. He was tall, several inches over six feet, with an enormous breadth of shoulder and extraordinary depth of chest. His face, disproportionately large for even his great body, was high-cheeked and unusually broad, with a jaw of implacable squareness, and the deep-set burning eyes beneath his overhanging brows were of a peculiarly piercing quality. There was something in the impassive nobility and steadfastness of purpose in that face, which reminded me of the features of the central allegorical figure in Franz Stuck's masterpiece, War. Something of my thought must have been expressed in my glance, for the young man noticed it, and a smile passed swiftly across his rugged countenance, leaving it calm again in an instant. "'The name is a concession to civilization, doctor,' he informed me. I began life under the somewhat unconventional sobriquet of Johnny Curly Wolf, but that hardly seemed appropriate to my manhood's environment, so I have shortened the name to its greatest common divisor. I'm a full-blooded Dakota, you know. Indeed, I replied lamely. Yes, I've been a citizen for a number of years, for there are certain limitations on the men of my people who retain their tribal allegiance which would hamper me greatly in my life work. My father became wealthy by grace of the white man's bounty, 
and the demands of a growing civilization for fuel oil, and he had the good judgment to have me educated in an eastern university instead of one of the Indian training schools. An uncle of mine was a tribal medicine man, and I was slated to follow in his footsteps, but I determined to graft the white man's scientific medicine onto my primitive instruction. Medical work has appealed to me ever since I was a little shaver and was permitted to help the post-surgeon at the agency office. I received my license to practice in fourteen, and was settling down to a study of pulmonary diseases when the big unpleasantness broke out in Europe. He smiled again, somewhat grimly this time. My people have been noted for rather bloody work in the old days, you know, and I suppose the call of my lineage was too strong for me. At any rate, I was inside a Canadian uniform and overseas within two months of the call for Dominion troops, and for three solid years I was in the thick of it with the British. When we came in, I was transferred to the AEF and finished my military career in a burst of shrapnel in the Argonne. I have three silver bones in each leg now, and I'm drawing half compensation from the government every month. I endorse the check over to the fund to relieve invalid Indian veterans of the army who aren't as well provided with worldly goods by standard oil as I am. But are you practicing in New York now, doctor? I asked. Only as a student. I've been taking some special postgraduate work in diseases of the lungs and posterior poliomyelitis. As soon as my studies are completed, I'm going west to devote my life and fortune to fighting those twin scourges of my people. Just so, de Grandin cut in, unable longer to refrain from taking part in the conversation. Dr. Wolfe and I have had many interesting things to speak of during our trip from New York, friend Trowbridge. And now, if all is prepared, shall we eat? The young Indian proved a charming dinner companion. Finely educated and highly cultured, he was endued with extraordinary skill as a raconteur, and his matter-of-fact stories of the old contempt's titanic struggle from the Marne and back, night raids in the trenches, and desperate hand-to-hand -hand fights in the blackness of no man's land, of the mud and blood and silent heroism of the dressing stations, and of the phantom armies which rallied to the assistance of the British at Mons, were colorful as the scenes of some old Spanish tapestry. Dinner was long since over, and eleven o'clock had struck. Still we lingered over our cigars, liqueurs, and coffee in the drawing-room. It was de Grandin who dragged us back from the days of fifteen, with a hasty glance at the watch strapped to his wrist. Pablo, my friends,' he exclaimed, "'it grows late, and we have a desperate experiment to try before the moon passes the meridian. Come, let us be about our work.' I looked at him in amazement, but the young Indian evidently understood his meaning, for he rose with a shrug of his broad shoulders and followed my diminutive companion out into the hall, where a great leather kit-bag, which bore evidence of having accompanied its owner through Flanders and Picardy, rested beside the hall rack. "'What's on the program? I demanded, trailing in the wake of the other two. But de Grandin thrust hat and coat into my hands, exclaiming, "'We go to Madame Chetwin's again, my friend.' Remember what you saw about this time last night. Cordieu, you shall see that which has been vouchsafed to few men before another hour has passed, or Jules de Grandin is wretchedly mistaken. Piling my companions into the back seat, I took the wheel and drove through the still, moonlit night toward the Chetwind cottage. Half an hour later we let ourselves quietly into the house with de Grandin's duplicate key and took our station in the darkened parlour once more. A quick word from de Grandin gave Dr. Wolfe his cue, and, taking up his travel-beaten bag, the young Indian let himself out of the house and paused on the porch. For a moment I saw his silhouette against the glass panel of the door, then a sudden movement carried him out of my line of vision, and I turned to watch the stairs down which I knew Idoline Chetwind would presently come to perform her unholy rites of secret worship. The ticking pulse-beats of the little ormolu clock on the mantelpiece sounded thunderous in the absolute quiet of the house. Here and there a board squeaked and cracked in the gradually lowering temperature. Somewhere outside, a motor-horn tooted with a dismal, wailing note. 
I felt my nerves gradually tightening like the strings of a violin as the musician keys them up before playing, and tiny shivers of horripilation pursued each other down my spine and up my forearms as I sat waiting in the shadowy room. The little French clock struck twelve sharp, silvery chimes. It had arrived, that hideous hour which belongs neither to the day which is dead, nor to the new day stirring in the womb of time, and which we call midnight for want of a better term. The moon's pale visage slipped slowly into view through the panes of the window behind the Indian statue, and a light faltering step sounded on the stairs above us. Mon Dieu, de Grandin whispered fervently, grant that I shall not have made a mistake in my calculations. He half rose from his chair, gazing fixedly at the lovely, unconscious woman walking her tranced march toward the repellent idol, then stepped softly to the front window and tapped lightly on its pane with his fingertips. Once again we saw Idoline Chetwind prostrate herself at the feet of the black statue. Once more her fluttering, breathless voice besought the evil thing to take her soul and destroy her body. Then, so faint I scarcely heard it through the droning of the praying woman's words, the front door gave a soft click as it swung open on its hinges. Young Dr. Wolf, once Johnny Curly Wolf, medicine man of the Dakotas, stepped into the moonlit hall. Now I understood why he had hidden himself in the shadows of the porch when he left the house. Gone were his stylishly cut American clothes, gone was his air of well-bred sophistication. It was not the highly educated, cultured physician and student who entered the Chetwind home, but a medicine man of America's primeval race in all the panoply of his traditional office. Naked to the waist he was, his bronze torso gleaming like newly molded metal from the furnace. Long, tight-fitting trousers of beaded buckskin encased his legs, and on his feet were the moccasins of his forefathers. Upon his head was the war bonnet of eagle feathers, and his face was smeared with alternate streaks of white, yellow, and black paint. In one hand he bore a bull-hide tom-tom, and in his deep-set, smoldering eyes there burned the awful, deadly earnestness of his people. Majestically he strode down the hall, paused some three or four paces behind the prostrate woman, then, raising his tom-tom above his head, struck it sharply with his knuckles. Doom! 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 The mellow, booming notes sounded, again and still again. Bending slightly at the knees, he straightened himself, repeated the movement, quickened the cadence until he was rising and sinking a distance of six inches or so in a sort of stationary, bobbing dance. Manitou, great spirit of my fathers, he called in a strong, resonant voice. Great spirit of the forest dwellers and of the people of the plains, hear the call of the last of thy worshippers. Hear my prayer, O mighty spirit, as I do the dance before thee. Do the dance my fathers taught me. Dance it as they danced before me. As they danced it in their lodges, as they danced it at their councils, when of old they sought thy succor. Look upon this prostrate woman. See her bow in supplication to an alien wicked spirit. Thine she is by right of lineage, thine by right of blood and forebears. In the cleanly air of heaven she should make her supplication, not before the obscene statue of God of alien people. Hear my prayer, O mighty spirit. Hear, great spirit of my fathers. Save this woman of thy people. Smite and strike and make impotent demons from across the water, demons vile and wholly filthy, and not seemly for devotion from a woman of thy people. The solemn, monotonous intoning ceased, but the dance continued. But now it was no longer a stationary dance, for with shuffling tread and half-bent body, Johnny Curly Wolf was circling slowly about the Hindu idol and its lone worshipper. Something, a cloud perhaps, drifted slowly across the moon's face, obscuring the light which streamed into the hall. 
an oddly shaped cloud it was, something like a giant man astride a giant horse, and on his brow there seemed to be the feathered war bonnet of the Dakotas. The cloud grew in density. The moon rays became fainter and fainter, and finally the hull was in total darkness. In the west there sounded the whistling bellow of a rising wind, shaking the casements of the house and making the very walls tremble. Deep and rumbling, growing louder and louder as it seemed to roll across the heavens on iron wheels, a distant peal of thunder sounded, increased in volume, finally burst in a mighty clap directly over our heads, and a fork of blinding, jagged lightning shot out of the angry sky. A shivering ring of shattered glass, and of some heavy object toppling to a fall, a woman's wild, despairing shriek, and another rumbling, crashing peal of thunder deafened me. By the momentary glare of a second lightning flash, I beheld a scene stranger than any painted by Dante in his vision of the underworld. Seemingly, a great female figure crouched with all the ferocity of a tigress above the prostrate form of Idoline Chetwind, its writhing, sextuple arms grasping at the woman's prone body, or raised as though to ward off a blow, while from the window looking toward the west there leaped the mighty figure of an Indian brave armed with shield and war-club. Johnny Curly Wolf? No, for Johnny Curly Wolf circled and gyrated in the measures of his tribal ghost dance, and in one hand he held his tom-tom, while with the other he beat out the rhythm of his dance music. It was but an instant that the lightning showed me this fantastic tableau. Then all was darkness blacker than before, and a crashing of some stone thing shattered into half a thousand fragments broke through the rumble of the thunder. Lights! Gold dear lights, friend Trowbridge! de Grandin screamed in a voice gone high and thin with hysteria. I pressed the electric switch in the hall and beheld Johnny Curly Wolf, still in tribal costume, great beads of sweat dewing his brow, standing over the body of Idoline Chetwind, the hall window panes blown from their frame and scattered over the floor, like tiny slivers of frozen moonlight, and toppled from its pedestal and broken into bits almost as fine as powder, the black statue of Kali, goddess of the East. Take her up, my friend. De Grandin ordered me, pointing to Mrs. Chetwin's lifeless body. Pick her up and restore her to her bed. Morbleu, but we shall have to attend her like a newborn infant this night, for I fear me her nerves have had a shock from which they will not soon recover. All night and far past daylight we sat beside Idoline Chetwin's bed, watching the faint color ebb and flow in her sunken cheeks, taking heedful count of her feebly beating pulse, administering stimulants when the tiny spark of waning life seemed about to flicker to extinction. About ten o'clock in the morning de Grandin rose from his seat beside the bed and stretched himself like a cat rising from prolonged sleep. "'Bon! Très bon!' he exclaimed. "'She sleeps. Her pulse, it is normal. Her temperature, it is right. We can safely leave her now, my friends. Anon we shall call on her.' but I doubt me if we shall have more to do than wish her felicitations on her so miraculous cure. Meantime, let us go. My poor forgotten stomach cries aloud reproaches on my so neglected mouth. I starve, I famish, I faint of inanition. Behold, I am already become but a wraith and a shadow. Jules de Grandin drained his third cup of coffee at a gulp and passed the empty vessel back for replenishment. Pablo, my friends, he exclaimed, turning his quick elfin smile from Dr. Wolfe to me. It was the beautiful adventure, was it not? It might have been a beautiful adventure, I agreed grudgingly. But just what the deuce was it? The whole thing's a mystery to me, from beginning to end. What caused Mrs. Chetwin's illness in the first place? What was the cause of her insane actions? And what was it I saw last night? Was there really a thunderstorm that broke the black image? And did I really see— But certainly, my excellent one, he cut in with a smile, as he emptied his cup and lighted a cigarette. You did behold all that you thought you saw, no less. 
but no buts, if you please, good friend. I well know you will tease for an explanation as a pussycat begs for food while the family dines, and so I shall enlighten you as best I can. To begin, when first you told me of Madame Chetwin's illness, I knew not what to think, nor did I think anything in particular. Some of her symptoms made me fear she might have been the victim of a revenant, but there were no signs of bloodletting upon her, and so I dismissed that diagnosis. But as we descended the stairs after our first visit, I did behold the abominable statue in the hall. Aha! I say to me, what does this evil thing do here? Perhaps it makes the trouble with Madame Idoline, and so I look at it most carefully. My friend Jules de Grandin has covered much land with his little feet. In the Arctic snows and in the equatorial heat, he has seen the sins and follies and superstitions of men and learned to know the gods they worship. So he recognized that image for what it was. It is of the goddess Kali, tutelary deity of the Thags of India, whose worship is murder and whose service is bloodshed. She goes by many names, my friends. Sometimes she is known as Devi, consort of Siva and daughter of Himavat, the Himalaya mountains. She is the Sakti, or female energy of Siva, and is worshipped in a variety of forms under two main classes, according as she is conceived as a mild and beneficent or as a malignant deity. In her milder shapes, besides Devi, the goddess, she is called also Gori, the yellow, or Uma, the bright. In her malignant forms she is Durga, the inaccessible, represented as a yellow woman mounted on a tiger, Chandi, the fierce, and worst of all, Kali, the black, in which guise she is portrayed as dripping with blood, encircled with snakes and adorned with human skulls. In the latter form she is worshipped with obscene and bloody rites, oftener than not with human sacrifice. Her special votaries are the Thags, and at her dreadful name all India trembles, for the law of the English has not yet wiped out the horrid practice of Thagi. Now when I beheld this filthy image standing in Madame Chetwin's home, I wondered much. Still I little suspected what we later came to know for truth, for it is a strange thing that the gods of the East have little power over the people of the West. Behold, three hundred thousand Englishmen hold in complete subjection as many million Hindus, though the subject people curse their masters daily by all the gods whom they hold sacred. It seems, I think, that only those who stand closer to the bare verities of nature are liable to be affected by gods and goddesses which are personifications of nature's forces. I know not whether this be so. It is but a theory of mine. At any rate, I saw but small connection between the idol and our sick lady's illness until friend Trowbridge told me of her strain of Indian ancestry. Then I say to me, might not she, who holds a mixture of aboriginal blood in her veins, become affected by the strength of this heathen goddess? Or perhaps it is that fused blood is weaker than the pure strain, and the evil influence of the black one may have found some loophole in her defence. One thing was most sure. In Madame Chetwin's house there was clearly the odour of eastern incense, yet nowhere was there visible evidence of perfume— save such as a dainty woman of the West might use. Me, I sniffed like a hound while examining her, and kissed her fingers twice in farewell to make sure. This incense, which was so all unaccounted for, did puzzle me. You recall, friend Trowbridge, how I questioned her maid about the punk smell, and how little satisfaction I got of her. There is going on here the business of monkeys, I tell me as we leave the house and so I make a print of the front-door key that we may enter again at our convenience and see what is what. Eh bien, my friends, did we not see a sufficiency the following night, when we beheld Madame Idoline fall forward on her face and make a voluntary offer of her soul and body to the black one? I shall say so. How to overcome this eastern fury, I ask me. The excellent Katie Rooney have bathed her in holy water, and the blessed fluid have burned and sizzled on her so infamous head. Clearly the force of western churches is of little value in this case. 
Ah, perhaps she have attacked Madame Chetwind through her strain of primitive blood. Then what? Mordant Chat, all suddenly I have it. At the dinner in New York I have met the young Dr. Wolf. He is a full-blood Indian, and he have told me a medicine man of his people as well. Now, if this woman's weakness is her Indian blood, may not that same blood be her strength and her protection as well? I hope so. So I persuade Monsieur Wolfe to come with me and pit the strength of his great spirit against the evil force of Kali of the Thags. Who will win? Le bon Dieu alone knows, but I have hopes. For a moment he regarded us with a quizzical smile, then resumed. The Indian of America, my friends, was truly un sauvage noble. The Spaniard saw in him only something like a beast to be enslaved and despoiled. The Englishman saw in him only a barrier to possession of the new country, and as such to be swept back or exterminated. But to the Frenchman he was a noble character. Ha, did not my illustrious countrymen, the Sieur La Salle and Fontenac, accord him his just dues? Certainly. His friendship was true, his courage undoubted, his religion a clean one. Why then could we not invoke the Indian's great spirit? We know, my friends, or at least we think we know, that there is but one true God, almighty and everlasting, without body, parts, or passions. But does that same God appear in the same manner to all peoples? Mais non. To the Arab he is Allah. To many so-called Christians, he is but a sort of celestial Santa Claus. I greatly fear, friend Trowbridge, that too many of your most earnest preachers, he is little more than a disagreeable old man with the words, Thou shalt not, engraved upon his forehead. But for all these different conceptions, he is still God. And what are these deities of heathendom? He paused looking expectantly from one of us to the other, but as we made no reply, proceeded to answer his own question. They are nothing, and yet they are something too. They are the concentrated power of thought, of mistaken belief, of misconception. Yet because thoughts are truly things, they have a certain power, parbleu, I think a power which is not to be sneezed upon. For years, for centuries perhaps, that evil statue of Kali has been invoked in bloody and unseemly rites, and before her misshapen feet has been poured out the concentrated hate and wickedness of countless monkey-faced heathens. That did endue her with an evil power, which might easily overcome the resistance of a sensitive nature, and all primitive peoples are more sensitive to such influences than are those whose ancestors have long been agnostic, however much and loudly they have prated of their piety. Very good. The great spirit of the Indian of America, on the other hand, being a clean and noble conception, is one of the manifestations of God himself. For countless generations the noble red man had clothed him with all the attributes of nobility. Shall this pure conception of the Godhead go to waste? No, my friends, ten thousand times, no! You cannot kill a noble thought any more than you can slay a noble soul. Both are immortal. And so I did prevail upon the good wolf to come with us and summon the massed thought and belief of his great people to combat the massed thought of those despicable ones who have made them a goddess in the image of their own uncleanness of mind. Non du non guille, but the struggle was magnificent. You mean to tell me that I actually saw the great spirit then? I demanded incredulously. Ah, bah, my friend, he replied. Have I not been at pains to tell you it was the mast, the concentrated thought and belief of all the Indians, of today and for countless generations before today, which our good wolf invoked? Mon Dieu, can I never convince you that thought though it be immaterial, is as much a thing as, as, for example, the skull in your sulphic head? But what about Mrs. Chetwin's maid? I asked, for deep in my mind there lurked a suspicion that the woman might know more of the unholy sights we had seen than she cared to tell. Quite right, he replied, nodding gravely. I too suspected her once. 
It was because of that I induced the excellent Katie to return to Madame Idoline's service and spy upon her. I discovered much, for Katie, like all her race, is shrewd, and when she knows what is wanted she knows how to get it. It appears the maid was fully aware of her mistress's subjection to the black one, but though she understood it not, so deep was her devotion to Madame her mistress, that she took it on herself to cast obstacles in our way, lest we prevent a continuance of Madame's secret worship. Loyalty is a great, a wonderful thing, my friends. That poor woman was shocked by the spectacle of her beloved mistress casting herself before the thing of stone, but the bare fact that her mistress did it was justification enough for her. Had she been asked to do so by Madame Chetwind, I firmly believe she would have joined in the obscene devotions, and given her own body and soul to the black one, along with that of her deluded mistress, whom she adored. Well, I'll be— But, but look here! I began again, but— No more, friend Trowbridge, de Grandin commanded, rising and motioning to Dr. Wolfe and me. It is long since we have slept. Come, let us retire. Me, parbleu, I shall sleep until your learned societies shall issue profound treatises on the discovery of a twin brother to that Monsieur Rip Van Winkle. 